Well, thank you everybody for joining the five areas of Wealth Summit today, February 3rd, 2024. I am so excited. We have myself and nine other amazing experts in their field to tap all areas of the five types of wealth in financial, physical, time, mental, and social. I'm so excited to have you guys here. And for those of us, I would love to see your shining, smiling faces. Yeah. <laughs> please smile I love love that because uh we want to see you and interact and and definitely ask questions in the chat so I am here opening up we are going to have our first speaker at 9 30 tomorrow North and to give you a little bit of insight what this is about so our overall goal here all of the experts in this panel focus a lot on these five areas of wealth and it's why I asked them to join us or to join today to speak on, on your behalf. And what I hope you get from this summit is some aha moments, some insights, some, oh, I need to look into that. And all those things that are gonna really improve your physical and professional life, personally, professionally, physical, financial, social, mental, and time. Now, a lot of people, uh, you know, don't know that there's five areas of wealth. When you hear the word wealth, everyone draws it right to financial. Well, that's not the only area. So this area is to educate and show you how these five all link to make you the better person. That's what this is about. So we hope everybody that's joining us takes that information and has a phenomenal experience with all of us. And again, please use the chat. We will definitely be using that. Janet right now is co-hosting, so she will jump in with that. And I thank you, Janet, for co-hosting today. Thank you. So I will get started. So why I chose this subject. So I um, pretty much have been the wizard behind the camera for over 20 years in the financial world. But I've been in the professional corporate world for 35 years. I started when I was 17 and I just advanced further and learned and learned. I learned that knowledge was always very interesting for me. Learning built knowledge, knowledge built expansion, and I just kept growing and growing into different areas. I've been very fortunate to, to be in an experience of multiple industries and multiple career paths that have led me here today. Well, why am I here? Well, I'll tell you a little bit of story of how this started. Believe it or not, it involves these five types of wealth. When I was a child, I was a unique child. I was different and I knew I was bullied. My brother used to beat the crap out of me. I have a twin and I had a bully from the age of four to the age of 16. In a odd situation, her sister, was brutally murdered from a gang initiation. She was shot in the face with a sawed off shotgun. She was deaf. It's why one of the reasons I had the closed captions. My husband, unfortunately, five years ago became deaf from a brain fungus that he got from a previous condition, and he is now permanently deaf. So it's very important for me to also make sure that everybody can, if they can't hear us, they can, they can read. And that's just so important. So getting back to my story about Michelle, she was my bully. It was tough. If anybody's been bullied, you know how that feels. And so after Blanche was murdered, Michelle and I patched up ironically the universe put me there at that moment, that day when it happened. I happened to be up there getting my son from a visitation with his father. And we patched things up at that moment. Right after that, she was diagnosed with cancer. It was confirmed. She told me that she had a pathology done. She was 19 years old and she battled cancer. Now she battled cancer five times. And I'm telling you, by the end, it was so horrific there wasn't much left of her. We were, we stayed friends. We talked, we chatted. She was an inspiration. She was my cheerleader. We solved a lot of issues during those last several years that we developed a friendship. 
and we got stronger. And you think I'm funny, y'all. <laughs> she was so funny, so loud. And she we called her Action News because she knew everything that was going on. And so we patched things up. We would talk and talk and talk. And each time she battled the cancer again, she would have me make promises to continue and tell our story. And she always looked up to me. She told me about things I never knew about the time I graduated from high school. And she was standing over there cheering me on. That's my best friend. She's my best friend. She's graduating fifth of the class. She's so smart. I never knew she said that. So the last time she was battling, we got on the phone. And we were three hours in the car and I'm sitting in Piggly Wiggly parking lot. And she said, teen, how do I know there's a heaven? I said, Michelle, girl, you may leave this physical body, but your spirit and soul and energy is too strong for you to go anywhere. You're going to be right here. She goes, how can you promise me that? And again, talking about time, the physical body, the mental state. So we had this conversation and she told me, well, we need to make a promise. If there is a heaven, I need to come back and tell you. And I said, yes, you do. You sure do. You need to find a way. I said, you know, people leave symbols. They have uh, people see birds, symbols, signs, and things like that. So I'm going to tell you, this is very funny. So back in the day, she would use marijuana. Well, she would get marijuana and she would fight because she would swear up and down that the local drug, local dealer was ripping her off. So I happened to be walking back from the store and she said, this is it. I'm done. He, I bought a dime bag and he gave me a nickel. I know it's a nickel. I'm not that stupid. And I said, well, Michelle, your action news, you go get them. And so we made that promise. I said, all right, here we go. Now, I don't want you leaving me a, a, a dime bag of marijuana, <laughs> but why don't you leave me a dime back to represent our financial path? Michelle got into real estate um, in between her sickness, and she did really well for herself. I was in corporate world financial property management before I started SCORE. And worked in that. So we had a lot of a lot of similarities in our path in the real estate world. So it was interesting that we would talk. And in the end, she started sharing me, sharing with me her vision, what she wanted for herself. And she passed it on to me. She said, I want you to keep going. I want you to do this for you. I want you to get out there. And I want you to help as many people as you can. You are too smart. You are so funny. And of course, you know, beautiful and all that other stuff, right? And I said, no, I want you to do this with me. She said, I know. But no matter what, as you said, if there's a heaven, I'm with you. So we made that pact that no matter what, I would continue the path that, of the promise that we made for each other, that I would get out here and help as many companies and as many people as I can with the knowledge that I've grown in 35 years. And so here I am today. And I bring all the amazing experts here today to share all of their knowledge with you because it takes a village to do what we do. And I cannot do this alone. So I am so excited to have every one of them here with us to give you some inspiration, some insight, some knowledge, to make you the better person as much as Michelle has done for me. Now, I will tell you, she lived up to her promise. Before I even started this, I was still working at the job and I was working my way to, to, to grow, eventually come out and get into the consulting business as an independent. The very first time she left me was on the floor of my office. I walk in. I see the dime. Okay, here's me. What the heck's that doing on the floor? I didn't even pick up on it. Second dime, get in my car. There's a dime on the passenger seat, on the passenger floorboard. Like, what the heck? Again, 
we'll say the blonde hair. I did not pick up on it. And during this time, I'm having this transitional period with myself that went on for about a year and a half. The most unbelievable moment was about the fourth or fifth dime. I'm in my Charlotte office and I'm with my former daughter-in-law and we're getting ready for the Christmas party. And I had to copy something at the copier and I had a pen in my hand. And in that, in that moment, Sada E walks up to me and she goes, hey, can I borrow that pen? And I said, sure. And as she takes the pen out of my hand, the dime falls out of my hand. I went, uh, Sada E? I went, oh, it hit. I remembered. I remembered at that moment and broke down in that office, realizing that all the dimes that she had been leaving me, that was her sign. So after I finished breaking down, me and Sada E are hugging, and I'm telling her the story because I really did not share this with anybody. We laugh. And I am laughing because Michelle laughed. Michelle was so funny. And I'm laughing and laughing and laughing. And now at this point, my makeup's a mess. I have to go to this Christmas party. And Sada E, she's, she's a makeup person. And she's like, I'm going to fix you up. Don't worry. I got a bag in the car. And it was the most unbelievable gift of assurance and knowing that time has no boundaries in other parts, but it does in our part. I am excited. Kim Groshak is here. She will be talking a lot about time. Time is so important in our world here that it helps us grow who we are, what we need to do to stay healthy mentally, physically, financially. Time is important to pause. I always would call it when my kids call it, I got to go put myself in time out. I can't do this right now. I got, I need time out. <sighs> my kids will go, okay, mom, bye. <laughs> <laughs> then my daughter would say, mom, you need some water. I'm like, no, nope, just give me a minute. I need time out. So I called it that for the longest time. And then I would tell people, look, when they would be really stressed out as I was in a leadership role and team lead, I was like, look, go take a moment and smell the roses. Just go smell the roses and then come back and you'll be better. But Kim taught me about pause. And that there is awesome. Because now it makes a lot more sense in our world of time. Pausing. Pausing puts reflection in everything that we do in life. Reduce the stress. Reduce the, is the problems. And have that moment for yourself. We all need time. Time to reflect. Life goes so fast nowadays. Everybody knows that. You know, technology has made things quicker, better. You know, some people say, no, we're wet now in the world of AI, chat GPT. Things are evolving much faster than ever. But that time is so important. Time with your loved ones, time with the family, your friends, your pets, your people, your inner circle. Give yourself the time that you need because it is very short. And I want to let you know that. So I'm excited to continue to share. We are about to start in just a few minutes. And I wanted to share in my story. And she continues to send me dimes. So anytime I have just a smidgen of trying to, you know, think of, of things, there's a dime. So we she's up to about, I think, 10 or 10 or 11 dimes. I take a picture each time now of the dimes that she leaves me. And it gives me that moment to pause sit down, think, and get back on my path because that is what you do when you set yourself goals and you get into that moment of your life. So I want to, from the heavens and above and from here with my group of expert speakers, I am excited to share this experience with you and I hope you enjoyed my story about my dimes from heaven. Thank you, Michelle. And to share who she is, I did have a picture. So this is Michelle. She died on October 19th of 2022. I did make it to her in time. And unfortunately, she was so drugged up 
we could not tell our story. She wanted to spread the awareness about being a bully. Being a bully, as she says, it's not, it was never a you problem. It was a me problem. And until I learned to love myself and know that I am different from you, and I look up to you, and I became who I am, could I stop? And Blanche's death made me realize what I did to you for all those years. And, and I'm sorry. I will remember that day forever. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Let's rock today. Let's give it all we got. I've got a lot of stories, a lot of jokes, and I'll just talk numbers. And I'm so glad I have Janet here with me today, my other financial cohort, <laughs> to help share the knowledge that we have in our financial world. So thank you so much. We're about to kick off. And thank you for joining us. Are you guys ready? I keep thinking, Laura, when you start, the word that's going through my head is, let's get physical, physical. I want to get physical. Sorry. <laughs> that's what's going through my head. So Laura, she is funny in herself. She's got the hat, the glasses. And you have to have a sense of humor, right? You have to have a sense of humor to do what we do. And I'm just excited. Ali, I can't get out of my head about your French vanilla conversation. Uh, French vanilla conversation. Let me unmute you guys. Uh, let's see. Give me just a second. Okay, Janet, where do I unmute everybody? You got me. Did you get me? Unmute everybody. We can unmute. What's the, uh, uh, good. It's not restricted. Okay. <laughs> Ali? Yeah. What's the What's the French vanilla conversation? Remember the conversation when you were telling us about what changed in your life when you decided you went into the path that you're in right now and you were talking about the conversation I think it was at Starbucks and the French vanilla coffee guy oh the guy oh yeah the guy that got me fired yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that that always comes to my mind it's just interesting how when we're on this path that we're on you know, the impact and the stories that we have that kind of put us where we know we're meant to be. So that's just the one story that you told that remind that reminds me of, you know, I always take a little bit of a nugget from everyone's story and just remember you from that. But that was so funny. <laughs> Very good story. If anybody hasn't had a chance, check out Ali's, uh, I think you have it on your, a lot of your social media and it's a very good story, impactful. Um, it definitely has stuck in my head. And um, thanks, Ali, for sharing that with the world. Yeah, yeah, no problem. It was part of the uh, the Finish Strong Challenge. I think it's uh, probably like nine or ten uh, towards the towards the end of that challenge. Yeah, it was good. It was very, very good. Appreciate that. All right, we're six minutes about to start. And does anyone have any questions why we are here? All right, good. It's most of my speakers. I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. And let's see. Maybe. Okay, I'll share one funny story. It's kind of kick off and, and start your morning. If anybody's not a morning person, I apologize. Very, very much so. So what, uh, this was very funny. So I, years ago, of course, I've done a lot of different uh, career things, but one of the volunteer things that I did was helping, um, I was in transition of, of a job and I helped a, a friend of mine who ran a nursing home. She was a nurse and I ran, um, you know, operated that and she, let me go into view guys. And there you go. Gallery. Wants to go into gallery view. And she, um, so I was like, I've never taken care of an elderly person before. And, R and Rhonda's like, don't you worry about it. I've got you. I'll, you know, you, you're, you're a caregiver now. At that time, my husband was disabled. So I did care for somebody, but not at that level. At that point, she had just developed dementia from a UTI, the whole nine yards. So I walk in one day 
here's me still learning, right? I call myself an embryo in that world, in the caregiving world. And Muriel is there brushing her teeth. And I look and I'm like, Muriel, you don't have any toothpaste on that toothbrush. She goes, oh, yes, I do. And she points to this tube that's sitting down there. Well, I'm like, well, we got to put toothpaste on it. So I go and wet the brush, come back. I grab, I said, give me the tube. So she gives me the tube. I put the toothpaste, quote, on the toothbrush and I'm brushing her teeth. And the toothpaste didn't foam and her teeth were white. Like it was what gel. I'm like, this is weird. This, what kind of toothpaste are we using, Muriel? Are you on a special toothpaste? Because here's me being the thought thinker. Like, is she on a special toothpaste? Does she have dentures? Is this what people with dentures wear? Well, I, I said, where's the tube? And she gives me the tube and I look at the tube and it's butt cream, y'all. Butt cream. I was brushing her teeth with butt cream. <laughs> so as I'm laughing hysterically crying, she goes, what are you doing? I rush over, I grab a, a washcloth, a cup, and I'm getting her to spit, rinse and spit, right? Now you gotta do that with people with dementia because sometimes they forget their ability to swallow, you know, swallow or whatever. So I'm like, please be sure to spit. And I'm wiping her mouth out and everything. And I'm laughing hysterically. She's like, what happened? What's wrong? So as I compose myself, I said, Muriel, I was brushing your teeth with this. And she goes, oh, and she's laughing hysterically. Now we're both hysterically laughing. I said, well, let's properly brush your teeth. <laughs> to this day at her funeral. So I tell the family, I tell her daughter and, and she tells his, her, his, her son, which was late. And at her funeral, they wanted me to tell that story. But I was so devastated over her death because I developed such a strong relationship with her over the months that I was there. It was very hard for me to tell that story. So you all are the first ones. Publicly, I told that story too. So I think of her all the time and I still have her blanket because she wanted me to make sure I have her blanket and I have that with me all the time. So it's always, again, back to time. Time with your loved ones, very important. And I am going to go ahead and let's see if Dem Demera is here. Oh my God, thank you, girl. <laughs> So Demara, she is our spiritual strategic results coach. I have been so excited to hear her speak and I invited her to open up the panel today and she is amazing. She will touch on topics of enhancing decision-making, personal growth and your self-discovery and stress reduction and emotional balance. Just kind of hit on a few of those topics, did I not? <laughs> So yeah, you did. <laughs> I am excited. If you haven't gotten her freebie, I will be get, sending out a, another mm -hmm. summary with everyone's freebie after this. I also will put it in the chat for you if anyone has not grabbed it. And anyone that is not here today will also get it in their email. Let's put that out there. All right. And Demara, I thank you so much. And I look forward to all the information you are going to teach us. So <laughs> you can, I am going to ping you and you can have the floor. Thank sure. you so much. Thank you, Tina. Thanks for sharing all your heart stories. Um, I understand about caregiving. I was my mother's caregiver for six years. So I do resonate with you in, in what that takes and humor. Uh, being able to laugh in those tough times, I think is probably the best medicine. So I thank you for sharing that too. And I was listening to you about time. And, and for me, that's actually the strate strategic results strategy has all to do about time. So uh, you hit on some things that are near and dear to me as well. So thank you for, for sharing those stories with me and what this I really wanted to speak to um, this morning is you also talked about messages and how much information we are receiving on a daily basis. And I was actually trying to look up a percentage and there's there's not really it's like it's very um, it's dependent on you, your choices. Right. And I've raised four kids. 
around my career. So time and efficiency and being able to shut out those messages was very important to me because I found myself time poor at, at times I was time poor. And um, so I developed strategies so that um, as an empath, so I'm very, I feel everything. So there's a whole bunch of energy and messages that we are receiving that we don't even have the time we don't even recognize they're coming at us. So um, I, I really needed to find a way in, to manage what's happening in this world. <clears throat> and so what I began to do was really rely on cultivating that self-trust within me so that I could rely on my intuition and my intelligence so that I was listening to the stories that other people were telling me and I was then taking that in and discerning for myself. Um, early on, um, I was a massage therapist and so I had a lot of experience working with people and so I was, it's a very intimate place to be where people are on your table and you are touching their body. So for me, it was a place of, of honor and a sacred place too. Um, but I had to learn how to manage that, that messaging too, because there's messages coming off of our bodies. And I was seeing this play out in people and how they, the things would show up in their body as well. And so I began to tune into that information and little synchronicities started happening for me. Um, for instance, I went to sell a truck and I thought, oh, I need, I need $7,000 for that truck. And somebody sold it for me. They sold it for 7,200, but they took $200 commission just because they sent it and it was $7,000. And little synchronicities kept showing up for me. And it was when I listened to those little whispers inside that really, um, when I started to notice that I could create some flow in my life. <clears throat> so the decision-making process for me became one that I kind of played with for a while. I was wondering how can I take all of these feelings and emotions and set them aside, but yet still tune into what I really, really wanted. So that's when I started, you know, thinking, okay, so I'm going to tune in and I'm going to, I'm going to really ask myself what I want. And this is like a daily practice um, for me. And as, as you grow into it, um, you can, you can use your intuition and your intelligence to make decisions. And I injured my arm um, <clears throat> working in a hockey rink. My kids were very competitive in sports and I injured my arm and I was no longer able to massage. And so I was like, I had two more kids at that time. So four kids. And I was like, so what am I going to do with what I've been given? Right? Like I could no longer massage. So what was I going to do? So I was looking around, what, what can I do here? And I thought, okay, why don't I learn about real estate? So I, I started, I started reading books and I took in a conference and I just started. And because I had cultivated some, my intuition and I had started to really trust myself and have conversations and I was willing to make mistakes, you know, it, it, uh, it was, it was a process of mistakes and what I recognize is that there's freedom in failure because then you get to experience and you get to learn from that. So, oh, you spotlighted me. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, as I entered real estate, because I was looking for something where um, I could work, I'm a hard worker, I could work hard, um, but still be there for my children in the morning when they got on the bus and at, at the end of the day and take them to all their all their sporting activities. So I was a bit um, on my own and trying to figure out, you know, what is what is the best way for me to buy real estate? H how do how do I do this? So I, I was I joined a real estate network. And so I started with my first property. I saw this house and nobody had been living in it. And I knew that that um, that I could probably get this for a pretty good deal and I could maybe flip it. It was my first flip and I, and I had never done, I'd done renovations in a home, but I had never done something like this. 
And so at the time I sat down and I did the flow formula that I use to this day. And I, it's a step-by-step -step process where you just, you, you use um, your body, actually you tune into your body and it's in the PDF, the five steps. And um, I use different things like muscle testing, sway testing. And um, I, I made an offer. So they, I made an offer for $40,000 less than what, but that's what I, that's what I had tuned into. I was like, this is, this is the offer. This is the offer. And I mean, like $40,000, that's a big jump. Right. And they accepted it. And I was like, Woohoo! okay, so here we go. And it was my first time hiring a contractor. That is when I did not use my intuition. Not at all. I went on he talked a good game. He came in at a good budget, you know, and I, so I like circumvented my intuition because I was like, oh gosh, you know, bottom line, I could be so much better. And he's promising me the world. Yay. Yeah, no, <laughs> that wasn't great. Um, he pr I probably lost at least $15,000 in two months of behind of delays. And I was like, ooh, big learning. Um, and that's okay, right? Like, that's okay. I ended up doing okay at the end of it. Um, again, I used the formula to um, get my number and that's the number I got. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, the belief that I have about that. So a lot of times I'm finding that we're not even taking time to think, we're just doing, and I didn't think in that moment, right? It cost me $15,000 and two extra months of my time. Plus I had to find a new contractor so I didn't use my intuition and my intelligence so lesson learned you would think mm, not so much <laughs> not always a lesson learned right like I was like no can't, can't quite get that one yet right um why do we not go back to the things that work for us right because I don't know I'm a little rogue I'm like nah this is great no it's really not great. And, and, and that whole, like, I'm going to make a decision right now, but it's not necessarily an informed decision, or I'm not going to make any decision. So I'm just going to stay here and play it safe. Um, so I was like, where is the balance here where I can take almost like art and science and, and create a system where I feel confident that I can make a decision. So it all led to that. <laughs> like, this is all that's like real estate really has been a fine tuner for me, even though um, it's been kind of a side gig for me. Um, but what I what I really recognize, too, is that it has contributed in a weight that I've been allowed to take the emotion out of the decision making process. Like how many how many things have you bought based on emotion? You know, like, right? Like, oh my God, I got like, I got so many things over here. Yeah, emotions. I'm like, oh, I need it, I need it, I need it. Like, you didn't actually need it. You have like two of those over there, right? And it's like, ah, you know, when, when are we gonna learn that what we really need? And, uh, you know, I even have a great process that's proven to work to me for me so many times. And yet I still find myself defaulting to oh that's I need that right so it's like we we need to like take a step back and really start tuning in and 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 I'm gonna tell you you can just take 10 steps back from what is presented to you and ask yourself some real questions and I think the quality of the questions really matters too and you know in muscle testing you ask questions and I'm, a, I'm like a questioner. Uh, I went to school for journalism. That's where I started. So I'm like a questioner. So the quality of the questions, I think, really reflects the quality of your answers, right? So in muscle testing, it's very simple. And lots of people know about muscle testing. But a lot of people say, is it in my highest good, let's say? Or if you can feel the difference, it is in my highest good. So one is like, somebody tell me, tell me, is it in my highest good? And the other one is like, in my power, as I stand in this statement, it is or it isn't. So right there, you cut through any any of the noise. that, And it takes some time to cultivate that, but you know, it is what it is. So another, 
another time in real estate, <clears throat> like I listened to experts and I was listening to my broker and she was, I was selling my family home because we were moving um, during the pandemic. I pulled my last two kids out and we homeschooled and we moved to the lake. And so, you know how emotional that is when you look everywhere and your kid took their first step, you know, their birthday parties, you know, snuggling with them on the couch, you know, sitting by the fire or reading books or just like you've seen everything, playing with our animals. You just watch them grow up. And, and that was what I was sort of going through. I was like, I don't know. We loved our home, but it was just time to go. And so I was really emotionally invested in it, right? And we can either hang on too tight and think we want, we want so much. It's so much value. There's so much, there's so much. Or we can like go into indecision, like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So I sought out my broker and her and I had a huge discrepancy on where the price should be, like thousands, like 70,000, we were apart. And um, I had used the formula where I had, I had tapped out what I thought the numbers should be. And so we couldn't come to an agreement. So I said to her, well, um, I think we need to be on the same page and we have to be in the same alignment, same energy flow. We need to believe in the same number or there's going to be incongruency here. <clears throat> she agreed. So we parted ways. So I listed it myself and I sold it in three weeks and I made $70,000 more. Yeah. And it, that was based on tuning in. Right. So, I mean, and, and this is what I found, too, is that money needs a vision. Money needs a vision. So for me, because my family is so very important to me, they're at the top of my list. Anytime there is a opportunity or there becomes a need for there's something for my family, I find that it comes much easier. It's like. Right, because my money knows what it's going to. So then my belief stands behind it with love and my heart is in it. So that makes all the difference in my results. <clears throat> Amazing. I did not know that you were in real estate. How ironic. I was in property management, real estate, single multifamily and did real estate law. Interesting. I, I heard you say <laughs> that you used to do property management. God bless you, because uh, there, there's no part of me that want. I did not love the property management part of it, but you know it's a necessity. So the trauma center. You mean trauma center, right? Because that's what came <laughs> for it was was trauma. Yeah, yeah. I think my husband has more trauma than me. I was a little more forgiving. He was a little less. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> we don't talk about it too much anymore because we've kind of like scaled things away from it. So, um, yeah. Kudos, kudos for, for sticking it out. And, and I know being in real estate, how hard that can be. And you did an amazing job on, on yourself to get that much money. You harnessed it, you did it and you maximized your income. Yeah. There you go. That's Thank awesome. You. awesome. Yeah. I, and you know, the, the other part of that too, thank you, Tina. I appreciate that very much. Um, the other part of that is that I was willing to be 100% responsible for whatever the outcome was. Like, it was, a, it was a little bit like I'm doing this on my own then. I guess that's responsibility. And if if it was less, it was less. If it was more, it was more. But I was going to do it according to what I felt not and what I believed and what I thought. And I had taken the time to really, you know, like lots of times we just accept things. We just like, oh, okay, that's the number. Is that the number? I don't know that that's the number you you should probably take like a moment. It's your life, right? Huh. It's your life. And people are sometimes afraid to make decisions. Well, the lack of decision-making, this is where that stress and emotional burnout can come in. <clears throat> the, the reality of it is it's procrastination. And we know that that just like, because I work in energy too, that just funnels your energy out. You just, it just spirals right out of you as you stay in a state of non, non-decision. Yeah, you're right. Dead on. So true. So true, y'all. So true. <clears throat> Great. Yeah. So what, how did you go from real estate to your passion and what you do and your gift in, in now where, where you are? So tell me that. Sure. Um, 
Well, um, I started out in, um, like I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I, I think I'm actually unemployable. Um, I'm just a little too rogue. <laughs> you know, I embrace it. I mean, it's challenging, but I must love a challenge because here I am. Right. So, um, I started, I started actually, uh, a catering company with my sister when I, when I was like 17 and she's five years older than me. So we start, I started a cleaning business when I was like 15. I started working when I was uh, like 11. I went and I went and bus tables and like, I've just always been like, I'm going to create whatever I want to create. Right. And so I've been in the service industry. And so when I got injured, I really was looking at what can I do? And along the way, I had been in personal growth. Um, I, funnily enough, I started really exploring because I'm in Saskatchewan, Canada. We have a big Indigenous culture here, so I started exploring um, that as well. So I went on a on like a four day fast, and I was just on this mission to really know myself deeper. And so, out of necessity, and like I'm not a nurse and I'm not a school teacher and I come from, and I'm nobody's secretary cause like I'm unemployable cause I'm too bossy. And uh, so you know, I was like- and Too bossy too, too bossy. What's, and what's that? You're too bossy and unemployable. We're, no, we're, we're noting that. <laughs> I'm a ton of fun and I get shit done. Um, <laughs> so, uh, right. So then I, um, um, so I've been in the service industry, like people really matter to me. They always have. And I really loved being a massage therapist. I really loved that experience of, of helping people and, and them feeling better. And then I, uh, <clears throat> I started like going to conferences and, and doing different modalities. And, and so that never left me that, that whole energy, personal growth, it never left me. And real estate really became an out of necessity and I wanted to work hard and I wanted pass, it, passive income. Um, and so my passion has always been people. So even when I was, was developing real estate and doing single and redoing single family homes, because I, I, I was also still, I was renting as well as, in, as um, flipping. Um, I was always very cognizant of that. When I looked at this home, would I want to live here? So for me, I, I'm always considering what what do what do people really need? It's just a part of who I am. And and as an empath, I can see that <clears throat> energetically what's going on and you know help them, lead them, guide them to a path in that. And so after um my 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 dad passed very suddenly, and we went on this 10-year epic story of I lost my dad and my mom got sick with cancer. Um, I lost both my grandparents within six months. Um, my husband got PTSD because he found my dad and it just started this. My youngest was two at the time, three. Um, and so my mom had lost her husband and both her parents within six months and was going through cancer. So <clears throat> my life really turned into empowering and supporting her through her health journey. And after my dad passed, I had really started needing a community, a community of women that was outside of all the caregiving. I was, cause I still had small kids and like I had two to 15. So I, I still had a lot of that. Plus I was running two, two businesses and so I was like, well, where am I going with this? And I, it was really out of like almost desperation. It was like, I, I'm, I, I'm like losing myself here. I, I really require something bigger here. And so I went to, by myself, I went to uh, a conference. I saw this woman on, and I don't know how I got there. Lots of times I don't. I'm like, where? How did I? And it's, you know, I think it's divinely guided. And um, I just got there. And it was what I needed. And it was a community of women. And that started the journey again. So then I worked in hosting retreats and doing things like that. And, uh, but then my mom got sick and just other things and the traveling stopped. So I stopped working with that, that company that was empowering women. It was really about empowering women. And um, 
I kind of just focused on my family and my mom passed in 2018 and being an empath, I knew 2017 that she wasn't, I I had already seen that. So I started grieving in about a year before she passed. And, um, in 2019, I thought, I'm going to go for it. I, I'm I'm going to get back out there. So I started hosting retreats and I, I started reading again for people and I started coaching one-on-one and I had clients again and I was growing my business. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I pulled my kids in <clears throat> and I pulled them home and my husband lost his job. Like he, he lost his job at that time. My husband has never been empl- unemployed in our entire life. Not ever. And um, he got a job again fairly quickly. But that's a stressful point anyway. When, you know, and especially because I was just getting back into working after taking care of my mom for so long. And the stress of that, what it does to you. I was still, reco- I was still in recovery. I've still been in, re- you know, that's a long recovery. You're recovering from going through every step with every person and um so then I pulled my kids out and the pandemic happened and then in that June that June of 21 um I I um got Lyme disease I got bit by a tick I was out planting trees which I love trees they're my favorite I live up north at a lake with trees all around me and within um, three days, I spent three days in bed, which is not like me. I'm, I'm not somebody who likes to just, you know, do nothing. I've always got something on the go. And um, within three weeks, I was bedridden. I couldn't move. I couldn't get out of bed. I could barely pull the covers off. My husband commuted, so my two youngest daughters were, like, looking after me. And, um, yeah, I, I was... For two months, I probably didn't, like, I barely got out of bed. I stopped doing everything. And then I just decided I wasn't doing this anymore. And so I just, I asked, I talked to myself, asked my intuition, where am I going with this? And how do I really want to live? And so um, I looked, I never looked up, what's the symptom? What should I look for? Oh, I didn't look for the laundry list that told me who and what I was going to be now that I had bit contracted Lyme disease, right? I looked for solutions. I looked everywhere for solutions. So I had been doctoring alternative for a very long time um, from some past experience. So I'm not against Western medicine. I'm against what works for the person or I'm for what works for the person. And um, so I just decided that I wasn't doing this anymore. And I did some... So I would say people would maybe say radical stuff, but not for me. It, it worked. It helped me. And in that time, my husband and I just felt like um, we are not congruent with the things that are going on I'm in Canada. So we, I, I look at it and I'm thinking like, girl, what are you doing? I um, We packed up our girls and I have a lot of real estate here and we left everything and, and left to the States for a while. We drove through Mexico. Those stories are for another time. I, I'm telling you, you you can't make it up. That's how much stuff happened. Um, <laughs> but really, um, the 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 Lyme disease was a catalyst for me to really um, tune into my intuition and to really have a desire. And through the pandemic, when everybody like we don't know what what's true, what's not true, we we don't even know how to discern. It's like what's true, what's not true. And, and you know what, what's true for you? What is true for you? And I think, you know, we're like taught to look for somebody else, somebody else telling me what to do. So um, I'm very passionate that people take charge of their own life and have autonomy and that they really get to make decisions. So that's really where the flow formula has really been something I really haven't shared it as much as you know I probably should have over the years there's no shoulds but in retrospect I I would have loved to share it sooner so I believe like you never know time is what it is and you don't know how much you get and so I'm on a mission to have people feel more empowered in who they are and that's in every aspect of their life I have a particular 
um, fondness towards health because there's been a lot of problems in, I've faced a lot of things too. And I have some medical intuitive uh, abilities too that can support people. Um, so I'm really here for people to feel empowered in who they are and know how to do that. So I'm not saying that the flow formula is the be all end all. It's like, here's what I used. This works for me. Take it, whatever works for you, take it, whatever doesn't leave it, but make the decision for yourself. Right. You know, own your life. And so I'm passionate about that. And I think we need that more and more every day. You can see people are just like, I don't know where to go. And without hope, there really is nowhere to go. So I feel like it's a starting point. It's also an advanced technique. So that's kind of how I came to where I am now. That is awesome. And yeah, and just in your, you know, your story, your physical part got affected, right? So through yeah. our life cycle, uh, something is always that those five areas of wealth will always be an impact for us, but we strengthen in other areas to compensate. Like you really got into the, your, your mental spiritual side, uh, you know, to enhance your physical and you made decisions that enhanced your financial and then your, your time, you've realized how important your time was. So it yeah. just shows you that we will all have some strengths and weaknesses throughout our course of this time in our in our existence today and then we just pull where we are the strongest and hold on to it until we gain that full circle of energy back and that's just what's so empowering in your story and your your flow formula is amazing and you're right take what resonates with you and be the best person that you can be personally professionally because the end game here is to be the legacy person that you strive to be and however you get there. But just always remember, and you're right, Damara, always remember you with those five pieces, those five pieces of the flow of the flow of wealth is going to be affected. But that's okay. Get back on, get back on and refocus and do what you got to do and be the be better person of yourself. So I I am awesome. If anyone have any questions, please put in a chat or Raise your hand and we'll grab you. Thank you for sharing. Amazing. Okay, I don't need crickets, y'all. Come on, come on. <laughs> come on. She's, this, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, Janet. <laughs> Yeah, definitely empowering. Um, it's funny. I, and again, guys, I did not know. I knew I, you know, there's a thing that you find in yourself in your professional and personal life. Thank you, Ali. Ali, uh, Ali has given us a good clap. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's definitely, oh, there's Kim. Let's grab Kim. Let me grab Kim. So I love, I love that you shared about decisions because that is actually right. The, the first step making, stopping and making the decision, right? When did you like, do you remember the, a pivotal time when it just said, I got to start, I got to stop this, right? Like stop what not deciding or yeah. what, what do yep. you mean? Stop. Um, pretty early on, um, I mean, my mom and dad say, say I came out, you know, kicking and screaming and like, you're not going to tell me what to do. Um, my grandfather tried to tame me a little bit. And at three, he tried to put me to bed and I was not going to bed. And I scratched his face up. Like, I mean, I was a little bit of a wildcat. I was shy, but I was a wildcat. And um, so I think that part of my personality is to, is to like push up against um, the boundaries and to like step outside of that. Um, but I can tell you that um, my first marriage, um, we were high school sweethearts. I was 14 when we became uh, boyfriend and girlfriend and, and I have two children that I'm super grateful for. Um, but we, we never grew up. We like stayed in high school. And when and I would have stayed forever if I thought, and I was raised that way. I was raised that you, you don't get a divorce. Um, I would have stayed forever for my kids if I thought it was good for my kids. But I noticed that my kids were suffering and it was two sick parents. 
and I couldn't, I couldn't get healthy. I, I, I couldn't get healthy in a sick, toxic marriage. And, you know, I, I own my own stuff. I'm not saying it was all him. I'm not saying it was all me. Um, but at that point, I really thought, you know what, you need to take responsibility for your life here. And what's this going to look like to you? And you're list so I was listening to my parents telling me, don't you dare get a divorce. You can't leave your children. You made your bed. You better lie in it. You know, all the messages that you hear. I grew up in a religious family, so you don't divorce. And I was listening to that. And then I was listening to one dear friend who was like, you, you get to decide for yourself. You get to be happy. Like, you don't have to stay in something like this. Like, you don't. And um, so I was having this conflicting. And I was like, so, it's so emotional. I had children involved. We had been together since I was a, a very young woman. And at that point, I thought, you know what? You're, you're going to have to take responsibility for this. Because no matter what, your decision is going to have a consequence. No matter what you do, your choice always has a result. So do you want to make these choices based on, you know, your parents are telling you to lie in your bed and, 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 you know, just suck it up, girlfriend. And I was like, my, you know, at that time I was like, my children are worth more. I, at that time I didn't, I wasn't thinking that I was worth more. I was thinking that my children were worth more. And so I, I actually hit the gym. I started getting physically strong. And then when I was there, I was asking myself questions and I was thinking, I was taking that space to really get physically strong and it was helping my emotional state. And then I was doing some self-reflection, a lot of self-reflection. And that was a pivotal point for me when I decided I, I couldn't live in this marriage anymore. And I think that's really when I took a hundred percent responsibility for my life. That's awesome. Thank you, Tamara. And I do have a question. You know, one thing, um, if anyone else has a question, definitely raise your hand or jump right in. Uh, no, no, definitely don't want crickets. But one question I have, it's amazing how with what you're doing now and your success and what you're doing, we all have to have those experiences to be able to offer that to others and, and help them become the better version. You become the vessel to, to bring them to their higher self and, and what they need. It's just amazing. Let's grab Julia right quick. I was really curious because you talked about you were physically sick in your first marriage and then you got Lyme's disease and that you have some medical intuitive abilities. So are you helping people in their medical um, health, you know, in their health journey as well? <clears throat> okay. You know, I know we yeah. do a lot of decision making, you know, with their intuition, but also using intuition for getting well. Yes. So I, um, I have in the past and I got to tell you that I, I've been skirting around it a little bit, like really fully stepping into that. Um, I needed to do some healing because there was this perception, for instance, like my mom passed away, um, so being an intuitive and also being energetically empathic and, having some healing modalities behind me, it was devastating because there's a part of you that's like, I, I can't save her. I couldn't save her. What, what kind of, what kind of healer am I? What kind of intuitive am I? Like you're a fraud. You couldn't save your mom. Who the hell are you? Right. And so I had to work through that. I had to really work through that. And, um, I just had some real, really deep experiences where I've seen what I have relate to somebody has absolutely changed their life and has absolutely changed their life and so I have decided that I, like because I didn't want to I didn't want to hang out with sick people like I was like I like to have fun you know like I I like to have fun um I can be super serious but like every day I don't want to be burdened by feeling somebody else's sickness and I'm like you can change that perspective you know, you can be in a wellness plan, not a sickness plan. So, you know, like I like to spend like 20% talking to you about the problem and 80% on the solution. You can tell me, we can touch the energy, we can get through it, but what are we going to do about it? That's what I, you know, with Lyme, I never looked into like, oh, this and that and oh, I, you know, and I never, and a couple of times I joined like groups just to see what they were doing and everybody was, woe was me. And I was like, I can't do woe was me. I didn't come here for what was me. So there's something that shifted within me. And I think it's very pertinent right now 
it, at this time on the earth that um, people really need support. Like we're sicker than ever. Obesity, 60% of the people are obese. Um, so I'm stepping deeper into that. And that is really actually going to be my focus for 2024. Thank you for that. Asking that, Julia. Yeah. Any more questions before we close out with Tamara? Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that you joined us and opened up. Hope everybody's taken some valuable information from this. Thank you very, very much. Is there any more Thank questions? You. I know a lot will probably have questions that catch the recording, Damara, so be prepared. Uh, definitely, we'll be reaching out to you for that. And thank you so much for sharing your story and how you got here and how you struggled with your five types of wealth and how you just reharnessed yourself and got to where you needed to be. Amazing. Thank, thank you, you, Tina. Thank you. I very appreciate much. it very much. You are so welcome. Any more questions before we let Damara head on? Hope you're able to listen in on a little bit more today. And, and of course, I'm excited to share the replay so you can capture what needs to be captured. And our next speaker is Siobhan. Did I say that right? You did, Siobhan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! And Siobhan uh, is here with us. She's a kinesiology or ologist, right? And she works on the zones of that. It's definitely something I tapped into. Um, I actually had cancer myself. I got into a lot of the mind, body, physical part at, of my learning. I think anyone that has dealt with a, a condition, a, a de debilitating disease, my husband was disabled at 32, really changes your life at such a young age. And you learn different things about how the body works. And I am so excited to have her here. Thank you so much for joining. She does, uh, her focus is gonna be on emotional stress release, tailoring off right from Demera and food affects your mood. I am beyond how this, <laughs> because one of the things that affected my cancer is being, I, I still am restricted on how I can eat because of, you know, my situation. So I am so excited for you to share your, your expertise with us. So I am, does anyone have any questions? I know we got a few minutes for her to open up. Let's see, so we got somebody in the chat. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so we will get a, get a minute. Um, does anybody have, um, try, let me think of a, a good, um, oh, I do want to share one thing with you guys, actually. So one of my journeys uh, on how I got to meet all these wonderful people in this group is I had, you know, we're always on for learning, right? Knowledge, learning, and things like that in my spiritual group that I, I've been working with for several years, um, have a life coach and uh, we, we've done EFT tapping and learn Reiki and things of that nature. Everybody finds their, their ways. I do believe in the, the, the Western side and also the spiritual side, because all we're doing is educating our knowledge and using the parts that we can to be the better people that we are. And one of the books that was given to me is called a happy pocket full of money. This is the most amazing book I have ever read. And it's one of the things that I stumbled on from my life coach. And we did some series on this through, um, through the program. And it really gives you some valuable insight, especially personally and in your professional life to be able to um, harness becoming the better person, right? There's no right answer for all of us. There's no, oh, you must do this must do this. We all have to become who we are in our own beliefs and our own visions, just like making a decision, right? Emotions are the worst decision makers. And you have to learn this thing. And I took this book on and it has been, okay, I'm a little like OCD with this, but I've got like little tabs and pointers. And it really give, gave me a lot of perspective on money. Of course, financial, being the financial geek. And of course, you know, it's, it, it's about the infinitive wealth and abundance in here and now. And whatever you have to do to find your true self in who you want to believe, be who you want to be and, and mold to be the most best personally and professionally, that's the end game. When you are at your highest potential, you are a rock star. You are going to spread that to your family to your friends, to your coworkers, to your company, 
it, 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 and to your community and the clients you serve. Just imagine, think of that. And again, I, I focus a lot on that pay it forward movie. 24 years ago, that thing was released in 2000. So I focus a lot on that because that little boy came up with that plan. And his goal was to find those three people that he knew would make an impact for their three people. And he was on that mission. And each time he felt he failed, I don't use the word, I don't like the word fail. He redirected and he found someone else and then found someone else. So he never gave up on those three people that he knew that he can, he knew he can, you know, get them to believe that they can make a difference in three other people's lives. And that is how, is why I'm here, why I started, because it takes a village. And that's exactly why we're here today. So I will open it up. Um, anyone have any questions before we get started? Let's look at the chat one more time. Ah, oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. My cohort. Uh, I love what you said, Tina. I, I wanted to acknowledge you earlier, um, but I had a lot of things going on in my head. I was so excited to be here. But I want to say that I really love your pay it forward. I think that we need that more and more. And so I, I just really appreciate that you're bringing light to that. Um, we just, when we weren't holding and hugging and talking and we were sort of distanced from each other, we forgot that simple kindness. And yeah. I, I think that that pay it forward is all about simple kindness and getting back to that. And especially in AI and all the fast moving world, I think that, I think it's a beautiful thing and I'm like fully supporting that. Thank you. And and of course, I had to be the overachiever here. And I didn't pick just three. I picked nine. <laughs> so I'm tripling my odds here. <laughs> right on. Right on. Right. They say the number three, six, nine. That's how you focused. I went with the highest number. So thank you. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you stick around. And if not, the replay will be there. And if you have to step away, I would love to see your smiling faces. But I understand earbud, earbone, whatever it is, um, I definitely stay with us. So I'm going to spotlight Savan. And it is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And again, kinesiologist. And I'm excited to learn more about you. Take the floor, girl. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, host uh, Tina. You've been doing amazing work to get us all organized and getting us here I know there's lots of organization that goes into events like this behind the scenes that we're like totally unaware of what of all the moving parts. So I'm delighted to be included in this group of experts and I'm joining you today from Ireland, from the West Coast of Ireland. Today, I want to talk about prosperous living, harnessing your energy, health and whole person well-being. And I train people in, uh, who I suppose, who have an interest in holistic health and the mind-body connection. And I take, take that, who really want to take that interest and become a professional practitioner uh, with a career that they love. So I am a teacher. Um, I run um, Kinesiology Zone. And so I have slides. So I'm going to just um, share my screen and hopefully this will go smoothly. Um, so today we're talking about the five types of wealth. And uh, I'm very look, much looking forward to the rest of the speakers and what they're sharing it. And um, we've we've kicked off um, powerfully with decisions from Damara as well. So um, so this is me. Um, I have been a kinesiologist since um, well, we're going into the last century. I started back um, almost thirty years ago. It was November nineteen ninety four when I first uh, discovered kinesiology as a as a modality, a health modality. And, um, and I started training and then I started training others in 1997. So I don't know how many years that, that is ago now, but it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a long time that I've been involved. So today I want to share my ideas about what prosperous living uh, means um, in the context of energy, health and vitality. Um, I'm going to talk about the mind-body connection, um, how to... Um, master energy really by releasing stuck emotions and give you an idea about you know i suppose removing old thoughts stresses and and we're going to have a we're going to give you a, a little um exercise in that 
um, you'll get a better understanding about how the body works and releasing the stress. I'll talk a little bit about food testing and, um, and yeah, daily routines, things that you can do that we know. I mean, health in its foundation is pretty simple, but we, <laughs> we've made it really complicated. So um, yeah, so we'll do, I'll show you a technique on how to reduce stress and um, yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. So you're in the right place if you are keen to look after yourself more and you know maybe find it confusing as to where to start. Um, do you want to make take more charge over your diet? Um, as you maybe notice that you feel bloated occasionally, uh, you maybe suffer from heartburn. That's a really um, common issue that people have sometimes is there's heartburn or reflux. Uh, you may even have symptoms of IBS or gut stuff going on. And you know the body is affected by stress, but you're not sure what you can do about that. So I'm going to show you some a little technique on that. So this is this whole um, day of, of speakers is about pros prosperous living. And uh, Tina already said about it's primary the focus is often on wealth accumulation. We often perceived primarily in financial terms, but um, you know, if you look at it from a holistic uh, approach um, you know the concept that embodies not only material uh, success but also richness in health relationships and personal fulfillment whatever that might be for you so also thinking in terms of a robust physical mental and emotional health it really forms the foundation uh, upon which you can build um, uh, and enjoy other aspects of a prosperous life um, I think good health amplifies our ability to pursue and achieve our goals um, enhances our capacity to um, enjoy life's pleasures and um, and really I suppose the word I love is vigor it's you know it's necessary for sustained personal growth and and what we contribute and so in essence health is both a component and a catalyst of prosperity um, enabling us to lead you know, more fulfilled, more fulfilled life, a more vibrant life, and engage with the world in a, in a meaningful and impactful way. Health, the World Health Organization says, is a complete physical, mental, and social well-being, uh, and not merely the absence of disease. And I think that sometimes, when before COVID, people in Ireland used to say, uh, "Oh, I'm pretty healthy," <laughs> because they didn't have a a, a disease process. But um, I think we've all started to realize that there is more to health than taking a pill for this problem or this pain. And I, I don't know what it's like there, but in, in Ireland, even now, if you want to go to the doctor, it takes, you know, you get about 10 minutes and you can only come with one problem. And so if you have three problems, you need to make three appointments. Um, and so that's just not the way we work as a practitioner in, in a holistic modality. It's like we're really interested in the person who has the, the symptom and what, uh, and, you know, and, and getting to understand them and from a mind body um, perspective. So, what is Kinesiology Zone? Well, Kinesiology Zone is the school that I run. Systematic Kinesiology is the methodology that I use. And um, while muscle testing is a part of that, it is very much the tool that we use, but the, I suppose the emphasis is looking at it, uh, looking at life and health from a holistic perspective. So um, we have our whole person approach, which is looking at the mental, chemical, physical, and energetic side of our whole being. So in a nutshell, it's about finding what is out of balance, why it's out of balance, what is stressing the body. And of course, a stressed body is more, we'll find more things that are stressing it, um, which, is, which is always, you know, kind of interesting because um, we, often, uh, we often think that it's the thing on the outside that's stressing us. But um, it's very much about being able to find out, yeah, what can we do to help someone feel more vitality? And then kinesiology and the muscle testing and the way that we use it, it can find out what, we, what needs to be fixed first and then next and then next. So it often brings in an order. It's an amazingly intricate 
um, simple, um, fascinating way to, to work with, with clients. And I found this the other day. It says, if you don't care about the tiny details, you'll produce bad work because good work is the culmination of hundreds of tiny details. The world's most successful people all sweat the small stuff. And in some ways, it's a bit like that with health too, is that we think us going to bed late doesn't make a difference. We think we haven't drunk enough water. Ah, but sure, it's only, that's fine. You know, so it's those little details that um, often have the greatest impact over time. So, um, so we have this symbol that we use as a way to describe what we do. Um, the mental, chemical, physical, and then energy is this yin yang symbol in the, in the middle. And also well, this is a nod, if you like, to the spiritual side of us. And this is a grounding symbol that we are on earth and we need to be grounded um, and get our strength from that. But all of these um, uh, areas have a, an influence on how we and how we are. And so often people will come to a practitioner with a physical type problem. And if you have if you had a physical type problem, you might think, oh, I need to go to a chiropractor or I might need to go to a physical therapist. And that's fine. Sometimes that is where the problem is. Sometimes you go, oh, I have digestive problems. Maybe I need to find a nutritionist and I need to see, is there something going on with my diet or is there something I can change? And so if the problems are primarily in the chemical realm, then that might help. And then on the mental side, when we're thinking about um, psychological issues or mental health, we often think the problem is up there in the mental realm and we need to find someone who specializes in that area. And then the energy in the middle, you've got acupuncture, you've got Reiki, uh, you've got other healing energy modalities. But there's something about the fact that all, we're all of these things. And so it can be very useful to look at something from that perspective of, well, we've got digestive problems. Is there something physically going on in the spine that's, you know, that controls the nerves that go to the stomach? Is there a nutritional deficiency or is there a food sensitivity? So again, bringing in the chemistry side and is there maybe a lot of stress going on in the brain um, that is making us more alert and stimulating the stress response when that means, and what that means is that it shuts down digestion. So we need to look at every health issue from the perspective of, well, put it this way, it's very useful to look at it from these different perspectives because um, then we can really help someone regardless of why they come in to see us. So these are our, this is our MCPE and that's what we call our whole person approach. So as we look at, um, you know, looking at unleashing our energy, optimal living, we have, um, we wanna look a little bit at this energy, this vital force. This is the fuel that drives our daily activities um it's um you know from a wellness perspective it's vital um and it powers all bodily functions it sparks creativity it allows us to think more innovatively solve problems more adeptly and then from a business perspective um you know we're talking about wealth it's like devising business strategies to navigating personal challenges our personal challenges um can definitely you know be that additional stress on us. And so um, things that deplete our vital force then is lack of physical activity. I know as much as any of you that sitting in front of the computer is often where you'll find me and it's remembering to bring in that physical activity, whether it's getting outside, whether it's doing a bit of rebounding um, on a mini trampoline, making sure to go to bed at a regular time get those seven to nine hours, uh, nine hours is delicious, um, but many of us have se you know, seven and a half hours, eight hours will be, will be good. Also remembering you know, to get some sleep and recuperation, um, get some rest, being away from the computer, being away from, from the business. Um, I used to drive a lot to where I was teaching and the three and a half hours that it would take to drive was often that kind of decompressing time, that time to reflect. Uh, the, the body was busy doing driving and uh, allowed some time for me to reflect on things. And so that's, you know, as much uh, of, ben of being a part of balanced, a balanced life as well. And then poor diet and, and hydration, you know, drinking water. I have my, my glass of water here. 
um, it's important to, you know, um, I'm not sure how what it is in ounces, but we talk about two liters or four pints of water is a really beneficial um, a goal to, to set and have a vision for, for your health as well. Um, okay, what's next? So we have, oh you know, yes, yeah, so the connection to physical and mental health. So the brain is always processing um, probably even before we consciously know what's going on. And the nervous system, which the brain is a part of, has two main responses, the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight flight, and the parasympathetic rest and digest. And so these, these can really have an effect on, like what I'm gonna talk about in a minute is about why we muscle test and how we're testing muscles and, and the impact that you can see that when someone is in chronic pain or has digestive issues, um, you know, this imbalance can be coming, can be actually manifesting physical ailments. So these signs that we get from our body that something's out of balance, if, if it doesn't stop us, you know, it will just be niggling there. Sometimes this will become a bigger, bigger problem. So if you have, if you feel that you're in a, a, a negative state, you know, uh, such exa an example might be feeling stuck um, in a cycle of negative thoughts or emotions. Um, that could be, oh, I know I need to go and, and do this, but mm, for some reason, something else, you know, takes over, but gets a priority. So feeling a bit stuck, um, unable to sleep or lying awake at night, um, getting irritated by others, uh, not enjoying life or work. I will say, if you don't like your work, um, life's too short. Um, you, it is one of the things that makes a huge impact. So many hours are spent in work that um, it really, it's even if you are working out and you're eating healthily, the impact of not enjoying what you do um, is huge. And so obviously everyone here is, um, is uh, probably self-employed like myself, um, uh, entrepreneurial, um, we do um, like it. And, and, and as Tanara said earlier, it's like unemployable. I'm definitely unemployable. Um, so the interesting about uh, then about physical and mental health is trauma. And it shows up in the body really as a reaction. Now, sometimes we don't even know that we've had a trauma. We may not have any memory of, of a trauma, but we might know that um, we might feel it in our body in some ways. We don't know why we feel a particular way. Um, but if you have sleep disturbances or gut issues or chronic pain, this may be uh, a past trauma and they all have an impact. The body, you know, the, the brain and the memory isn't necessarily uh, that you have no recollection of it, but uh, the body remembers and um, not as a memory as such, but a reaction. And so the brain is really good at kind of anticipating, you know, what might, you, if you've had an experience. Um, so a friend of mine um, went on a roller coaster um, recently and I was like, I am not going to roller coaster. I've done roller coastering. I don't, I don't need to do that. And for me, it was like, I could already know what that felt like to go up and down in a roller coaster because I've had that experience of it and so but sometimes we have an experience that we don't know where it's come from but kinesiology is very is able to access that and so that makes it very interesting when we're working with clients they come in with digestive problems and they don't know it's connected to maybe a past a past trauma so to give a little bit of teaching about what my work is we have the meridian system and the meridians are lines of energy. And you'll see that there's a whole long list there of um, what might look like organs. And they do have an organ association. So we have kidney meridian with gallbladder, the spleen, liver, et cetera. There's the heart. And there's a few others there that have different names. But for, for the purposes of, of how I work with clients and, how, and what I'm teaching about is that these energy lines um, have relevance in kinesiology because every muscle that we test is associated with one of those meridians. And so we can literally find out whether the kidney energy is low. We can find out if the small intestine energy is low. And when we are uh, working with somebody who has digestive issues, it's useful to be able to see whether a food might have a, an impact on that particular muscle. 
uh, as well as that associated meridian. The reason I'm saying that it's interesting is because if you've got a sore knee, um, there are a lot of muscles that insert into, towards, into to the knee and we can track back and see, well, what meridians are they associated with? And so I remember a, a student of mine, she was a physiotherapist, so fully trained in, in I mean, there's a connection with muscle testing in, in physiotherapy, but she would see clients and sometimes they would go, you know, I, my, my knee is improving a little bit, but you know, I also have gut issues. I wonder if that's connected. And before kinesiology, she would go, oh yeah, maybe, and continue to do her physical work. And when she became a kinesiologist, then she could also do, you know, the food testing, the emotional clearing and, and get better results because she brought in more of that whole person approach. So it's, it, is, it is fascinating. So each meridian, as I said, there was, has an associated muscle uh, that's um, connected to the meridian or, or several muscles. There's, there's usually several. Um, standard muscle testing was developed um, to assess muscle function by a husband and wife team, Kendall and Kendall. And they were influ influential figures in the field of physical therapy and rehabilitation. So they worked with polio clients and they developed methods um, for assessing muscle function and strength. And so while we are interested in how to muscle test, um, and you know, a lot of people have seen muscle testing and it's just one muscle, we're talking about a, the whole body. We're looking at the key 14 meridians. We're doing a full, um, I don't know what you call your car tests. In the UK, it's an MOT. In Ireland, it's NCT, but it's an annual or every couple of years test on your car and they test all the different um, functions of the car. Well, in some ways, muscle testing is a way to assess overall what uh, is going on in the body. And so, um, yeah, Kendall and Kendall, it was the 1940s and they you know, have a comprehensive guide and that's the kind of muscle testing that we do as well. A little bit of history, I uh, wouldn't be a teacher without giving you some history and AK or Applied Kinesiology, it was developed by Dr. George Goodhart, a great name. And he, in 1964, he uh, was working with uh, some standard muscle testing um, and he was getting sort of like different results. And he was very curious. He had an amazing brain, amazing um, curiosity and, and, and really to kind of go, why is that happening? Why is the body expressing this or reacting to this? And he began this period of research, which led him to bring in correlations between other systems that have been discovered, like the lymphatic system. There was a Dr. Chapman. He developed these or he discovered these reflexes on the body. And um, Goodhart was able to correlate those with muscle testing and the meridians. And then also uh, Dr. Bennett, he discovered these amazing points on the on the forehead. Sorry, on the whole on the whole skull. Um, we're going to work with ones on the forehead. And these are the neurovascular points. They improve blood supply. So why do we test muscles? We are wanting to see. Um, why is the body needing to adapt or adjust? And uh, we look to see you know, what that actually manifests in. So when a muscle is inhibited, so when we test a muscle and it's not able to fully lock, then, and you see when, as we move around, our bodies, our muscles need to be switching on and they also need to be switching off. But I'm sure all of you at some stage have had tight muscles up in your shoulders. All right. So that's not so much a problem. That's maybe the signal, but that's not necessarily the root cause. And so when a muscle is inhibited, it's not working fully, other muscles must compensate. So it's a bit like teamwork. You know, if there's a team member not doing so well, other team members will support them and they'll do the job. But there's only so long that you can do that. And so what we what we look at is why are the muscles not working properly? So the kinesiologist is really attempting to find the cause of the inhibition. What's going on with this team member? That What sort of extra support do they need? Do they need some lymphatic work? Do they need you know, some nutrition? Do they need to do some stress relief? And we find out what's going on and then fix it. But the tight muscle 
is secondary to the weak muscle. And that's why we are interested to find out what is going on with that weak muscle. And so here is an example of um, our, our tests that we do. Uh, most of them are done lying down. And um, I've lost my, there we go. And each one, each test is related to a different meridian, uh, those energy lines, just to give you a sense of that. And then just scrolling in a little bit there, you can see that we've got a stomach muscle, we've got a spleen pancreas uh, related muscle, heart, small intestine, et cetera. Okay, so emotional stress release. This is the little technique I wanna show you. And I say little, because you'll be amazed at how, um, how, how uh, simple it is, okay? And I'm just coming, share, I'm gonna take off the screen share, okay? So then you can see me properly. So this was the first thing that I ever had done when I first uh, was a demonstration at a talk and my grandmother had just passed away, literally. Um, she had passed away um, on the operating table. So no one was expecting her to, um, she was elderly. She'd been taking aspirin for, um, for uh, arthritis, you know, prevention. Um, and, and that had burned a hole in her stomach. So anyway, <laughs> some of the medical approaches can be quite uh, serious. So when I was a, a demonstration, the person, the the the, um, the person who was speaking said, you know, has anybody got a stress? And they didn't need to know what it was. They just wanted to know that um, I was in the mode of it. I could think about it. And so what I want you to do now is I want you all, whether you're listening to the recording or whether you're here live, is I just want you to think about a stress that you might be experiencing at the moment. Um, so it doesn't have to be too deep. It can be oh i'm under i'm in a i'm in a rush and i and i have 10 things to do and what we're going to do is we're going to bring blood to the frontal lobes of the brain which is where our kind of thinking happens and if we if we it's like usually halfway between the the natural hairline um and the eyebrows you if you had bumps if you had horns that's where they'd come out of all right and all i want you to do is i really want you to think about that stress and it can be light, it doesn't have to be a scale of 100, you know, when we're doing a scale of one to 10. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna hold these points and we're gonna give them a, gonna give it a little bit of a stretch, okay? So if you wanna close your eyes and we're gonna just take a minute, okay? So we're gonna hold these points as you think about that stress. I know it's hard when there's radio silence on a webinar, but um, <laughs> and that was about 30 seconds maybe. But what it does is it brings blood to not only our stomachs, which is where a lot of times we feel stress um, or the effects of it, but it brings sometimes clarity of thinking. And what we're doing is we are increasing the blood supply to both the muscle that it's associated with and the brain. And it stimulates the parasympathetic stress response, that rest and digest. So one of the things that I love to hear when I'm working with a client, they're lying on the table and we've been doing a bit of balancing and their, their digestive system starts to, um, you hear like gurgling sounds. And, and they go, oh, I never hear that. And I went, that's a really good sign because they've got into rest and digest. Um, because then we can absorb our nutrition better. We can, um, we have less food sensitivities. And so it's a, uh, yeah, it's a nice, gentle thing to do. And it is, what do we do when we have, when we get under stress is we actually hold our hands up here. And we go, where are my keys? I can't find my keys. And so if we did this for longer, it would be like, it's just an extension of, um, 
extension of our natural gestures. And this is what Goodhart was really good at, at um, witnessing when he was there. Uh, um, <laughs> should we do that before we eat? You could, Tamara, you could do it before you eat. Um, there are other things that you would do though to help improve the stomach and the absorption. And I might, I might go back to my screen now and just show you that. Um, but this is our number one technique. We kind of, kind of, really go, if everyone knew how to do emotional stress relief, the fact that you don't have to tell anyone what the stress is, and obviously my grandmother had still passed away, um, but the impact on my body was less because when we think of a stress um, and we use a, a muscle test for that, if we think of something and it makes the muscle go weak, it could be making any muscle go weak. And so um, it's, it's a very powerful, as simple as it is, it's a very powerful uh, technique. We learn it on the first day of the training course. First thing I've ever experienced, and I use it um, every day in my clinic. So, um, so this helps the free flow of energy um, to our brain. So that's important um, and helps us achieve personal and professional goals. Um, now, the other thing is food. And um, yeah, food is um <laughs> important uh, there's a lot of ultra processed foods um in the um in the supermarkets so you have to be really careful about what you're eating uh, it has a big impact on our health and actually the the best thing we can do is you know to look if you want a quick change in in how you feel then you know simple walking outside and eating whole foods um is is it has a greater impact on our health than pretty much anything else so when we're testing for uh, common food sensitivities or, or intolerances, or even just these don't suit you, rather than putting a label on it as being this is an intolerance or a sensitivity, the key thing is we're not testing for, we're not testing someone for an allergy. And even with the best will in the world and, and, and saying that, uh, you know, I'm testing you for a food intolerance or a food sensitivity, Clients will still walk out the door and say they have a, a, a they have an allergy, which just isn't true. So these are just common um, food sensitivities, but es essentially any food can have um, can have a, a, a an, an an influence. When I that first night when I went to um, discover kinesiology and hear about it, you know I had some food testing done on me and bananas came up, and that may have been the fructose, and because I was under stress. So can I eat bananas now? Yes, of course I can, because I've, I've, I'm stronger now than I was then. And that's the thing. It's like these things are in the now. What has an influence on your, uh, on your mood, on your ability to make decisions, uh, on your energy levels? Uh, if you are eating a lot of wheat and you're wheat sensitive or gluten sensitive, two different things, um, then you know that can affect what's being absorbed properly it can affect gut issues and so these are part of the reason part of the ways we would be testing people to see you know individually what is the best thing for you if you suspect that you have a food intolerance um it may not even be affecting your gut this is the thing people often think digestive or foods affect the digestive system but they also affect the brain health so if you've got foggy thinking you've got like if you're really not sure then try avoiding it, a food group for, for a week. That's not as easy as it might sound. Um, but, you know, if you, when I, when I was uh, started training in kinesiology, um, I, I just, I broke out in a rash, started on my arms, went literally head to toe. Uh, I think that's what happens when you sometimes, when you start getting healthier, the body sometimes has to go into a reaction to really clear out something. And so it chose the, um, the skin to kind of get through and uh, get rid of stuff. And so I then discovered that really that I was eating wheat for breakfast. I was having a sandwich at lunchtime. I was having pasta at tea. Um, I really had a very restricted diet um, and it was all wheat based. And so again, check and see like what, if you looked at a week, how many vegetables are you eating? How many, um, how many, how many portions of protein are you eating? How much wheat and carbohydrates are you eating? Just to get data, you know, just to get a sense of like what's what are what's in your diet, what is is um, maybe affecting you. 
So this is food testing. So we use our different muscles and um, ideally the food in the mouth if they eat something every day. Otherwise we put it on the body and that's that's often sufficient. So pectoral is major stomach, uh, uh, major clavicular. This is our stomach meridian. Uh, we've just held the neurovascular points on the forehead. But if you wanted to improve you know, your stomach health, then over here on the lymphatics, this little black area here, is the lymphatic reflex for the stomach, uh, uh, for the PMC muscle, just associated with the stomach meridian and the stomach organ. So if you ever get any nausea, uh, you could rub under the left-hand side, under the left breast, fifth uh, kind of intercostal space that helps to improve and stimulate the lymphatic system, which is you know, feeding and cleaning um, debris from just normal living. And I find that sometimes can be beneficial for clearing uh, kind of nausea, uh, particularly if, you've been tr if you're traveling and you, you, know, you go to a different area and you're not eating the same foods that you normally would, sometimes that can, um, that can play a role. So when I'm training, we train people in you know, the actual where the muscle is, what it does, that's the kinesiology you know, range of motion. It's like, it's like how you understand how the body is, you know, how the muscles work. And then the applied or the systematic way is then really how to make those muscles stronger and, um, and working better. And, um, and so, yeah, so that's that, that one. So yeah, so achieving peak health with a holistic view, um, kinesiology forms a part of that because of our ethos around mental, physical, chemistry, and energetic. And so when somebody says, should I take this supplement? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know until I find out what's going on, getting to the root cause, um, and then I, I can test you. And you could have four different types of vitamin C, and um, they test differently for each individual person. Um, kinesiology helps to identify the root cause of symptoms and address health issues, um, whether that's you know food sensitivities to other stress related um, uh, things that people are, are suffering from. And then practical health strategies, just incorporating kinesiology, doing ESR on kids, it is amazing. Um, kids can be very much in their heads. Um, we don't necessarily know what they're, what they're worried about, but doing this on kids just is really helping them settle back into life's okay. And, um, and adults, adults can enjoy that too. Um, and then, yeah, time is our most precious resource. And as I mentioned this earlier, if you love your job, then this has a profound effect on your health. Um, and if you, if you don't like what you do, and this is often I'm talking to people who are thinking about be becoming a practitioner, is that, you know, if you love to help others, then, you know, get out of that other job that you don't like. Life is far too short. It goes very, very quickly. So I'm just gonna very quickly, mental factors, chemistry factors, physical, you know, how strong are we? Um, uh, how was our ability to move and our sleeping, the energy, and then the spiritual. What activities give you that feeling of being alive? So this is my team. We established the school in 2000. We run our balanced health courses, which is our, our basic training twice a year. So we're in the middle of um, just about to start that. We do spring and autumn. We all are busy practitioners um, as well as, as course leaders. And our mission is to help more people find systematic kinesiology um, because as, um, as it's been said already, is, is there a lot of health issues going on around the world and overwhelmed um, health systems. Um, and that was another muscle. But anyway, that is our integrated approach, looking at nutritional, mental, physical, and energy and it's all affecting you. And this is really when we test people, it is so individual to them. And that means that they can often get issues that you get to the bottom of issues that they couldn't before. Um, and so um, I do have a free online course. Um, there's at least 20 lessons in it. Um, it talks about emotional stress release that you just saw and had experience with. Um, it shows you a few of the testing, how to test the muscles and how to balance those muscles if you find them weak. And you get a little bit more of an understanding of how the body works. And so all you have to go to is my website, which is kinesiologyzone.com 
forward slash driven and you will have um, an opt-in form there just put your name and email and that is my gift um and it is just useful to know how to do kinesiology um you know how to even just do you don't even have to learn the muscle testing but how to do that emotional stress release technique is um yeah thank you for putting that in there <laughs> so i have it lined up as well um that is um yeah it's a, just a great way to get started I've been doing kinesiology, like I said, now uh, teaching it uh, primarily for like 24 years and um, love every bit of it, love um, how uh, it just makes sense. And I don't have to be, you know, people don't have to be worried about where pains are coming from because there's usually something that um, when we work with the whole person that it really makes a difference to help them understand the little parts of their lifestyle that are making a difference, like eating a lot of wheat or getting stressed out of, out of their minds. So thank you very much for listening today. Uh, yeah, I think we have a few minutes if there's any questions. Definitely. I you mute yourself and ask questions. And the real re the reason I say that is because I want to get it in the chat for the heart for the hearing impaired. So it's best to do, I mean, uh, in the uh, captions instead of the chat. So thank you guys. Just unmute yourself. Okay, I have a question. I love kinesiology. I do muscle testing. So I appreciate everything that, that you have to say. It resonates with me deeply. Um, you said the difference between there's difference between wheat and gluten. And you know, normally those are kind of lumped together. So like, what's yes. the difference? Just different proteins. Uh, it's a bit like milk, you know, dairy has lactose. And sometimes people are lactose intolerant but it's actually sometimes the, da the dairy components, the casein that's in it. And so the same with, with uh, you can have gluten-free foods and some of them, sometimes some people won't, uh, can't tolerate that either. Now, there, so you have something called non-celiac uh, related gluten intolerance. Um, in Ireland, we have a lot of celiacs. It's a, it is a, there's a genetic link to um, celiac disease. We love our bread in Ireland, by the way. <laughs> so, so when you, it's like potatoes, you know, if you don't have a meal without potatoes, it's not, that's not a meal. So, um, so the, uh, so yeah, so you have to really find out, well, why is somebody gluten intolerant and it, uh, or wheat intolerant? And it might be that they have gut issues. It may be a bit of leaky gut. Uh, and so if we heal up the gut, then people will be more able to, um, tolerate uh, you know a bit of wheat what we find is that if somebody um, gives up wheat and um, they sometimes will just have this huge bound of energy like it's like they've unlocked um a whole area of you know of energy that they didn't know they had and um and so but then they might be tempted to oh well i'm gonna have some wheat and it can come really straight back because what happens they become super sensitive um but also, then if they do get back into eating wheat, then they can often find that their brain and their mood also spirals a little bit and, and things become a little bit more depressed. That's a common thing. So sometimes depression isn't our thoughts. Sometimes it's coming from the body. And, um, and so if we are only sent to a, a psychologist or given an antidepressant, we're not really dealing with maybe the gut issues um, in, you know, so it's like, yeah, it is, it's like treating the whole person, as you said, it's not cookie cutter. It's not protocol based. It's like learning. So what I, when I'm teaching, it's like, I'm teaching my students to become interpreters of what other people's bodies are saying, because the expert in front of us is the person who has all of the information. And so they're the ones, and we have to keep our minds in neutral because if you have a firmly held belief in your mind about what's going on for that person, you can influence that with muscle testing. And so we have to kind of be really open to what is the person telling us? And that's where muscle testing is simple. You know, it's just not easy and it takes a while to master it. So and there's lots of different modalities, but systematic kinesiology is very, very kind of whole person approach is our, is our, is our message. So thank you for your question. Anybody else? Awesome. Siobhan, I just want to tell you when I learned what, what you did and, and, you know, my story on how I got into learning about all the different aspects besides the Western medicine, I am a classic poster child for you. 
Um, <laughs> I developed a cancer. I had a tumor in my terminal ileum, which is mm. the bridge between the small intestines, large intestines. And I, you know, looking back, I'm like, how did I get this? Well, <laughs> I was highly stressed, had a disabled husband, two young children, working two jobs, uh, extreme amount of stress, uh, not eating healthy, not sleeping right. Everything you could, everything you mentioned was just what I, I did it to myself. I literally did yeah, it. Yeah, but you look at, I would also say, look how amazing the body is yeah. that you, you survived through what you got through it, you know, and the body does that. And yeah. so I have huge respect for all of the health issues that people go through. And then from that learning, yeah, the, that little ileocecal valve is a, a fun place where we hang out uh, in our treatments. We, we like that ileocecal valve. Um, uh, I had a recurring ileocecal valve issue for, for uh, when I was going through that reaction with the wheat. Um, so it is, it's, it's, it's fascinating to, um, to work in this way. It's never boring. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. It's when you talk about how unleashing your energy and, and harnessing it because you do make yourself sick, right? And the type of cancer I had was ironically also hormonal. So I brought on, you know, I feel like I brought on this hormonal condition because of what I was going through. But in the end, I lost nine pounds of organs. Woohoo, nine pounds, y'all. <laughs> I learned how to eat properly. And it's funny when you say that because I actually wear a watch that tells me when to drink water, when to eat, when to get up and move. You would not believe how much, again, one tiny little change I did to myself. And I've already lost 41 pounds since last April. That's all I did. So, and make sure I sleep. So sleep is also, you're, you're exactly right. Sleep is so vital. So if you're a professional and you're busy, even personal life, you got to take time out for yourself. Do whatever you can. Like Damara said, you find your ways to, to make yourself healthier, be the better version of yourself. And if you're not eating right and drinking your water and getting your sleep, you're not going to be the best version of yourself. And then it's going to affect so many things, including your financial wealth uh, down the road. So, oh gosh, one, uh, any more questions before we let Siobhan go? Well, this was awesome. I appreciate you joining us. This has been very insightful. I will make sure that the link is in the follow-up email to everybody that's going to catch this after. And thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing the next, uh, next presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me grab... I'm going to go onto the gallery. Okay. So our next next speaker and I am so honored to have met Ali through the through, through the speaking program that we are in. Ali and I have a lot of similarities in reference to what we do and what we focus on in reference in, to helping businesses. But one thing that people do not know is Ali and I are actually cousins. He is Superman, I'm Supergirl. And we learned we had that in common. So we were at an event recently and Nikki took our picture and this was our first picture. Well, Nikki said, all right, you two don't even look like you like each other. Well, we're cousins, do you? Right? So then she says, all right, you got to smile. Okay, so we gave it cheese. <laughs> well, it's been a very, uh, good experience. I like to always find people of the like minds and thank you, Ali. For, you know, we have that passion personally, but professionally, we also have a lot of similarities. And Ali is the owner of Wisdom and Wayfinder Business Consulting. It's a new adventure for him. He's branching out um, many years of experience, and you will learn about what you do is not nearly as important as why you do it. And then say no to anything that's not a part of the vision you have for your life. Man, that's going to be very good. And when you learn to be good with you, everything else falls in place. So I want to warmly welcome you to Ali and his presentation. And thank you so much, Ali, for yeah. joining us. Thank you, guys. There you go. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, let me know if you are having any trouble hearing me. Uh, I am here at Bell Works in Home Dell, and they're having it. Actually, they're having a health and wellness uh, summit uh, themselves uh, over in the atrium. So uh, there is a lot of background noise. So if you can't hear me, I will do my best to speak up. 
uh, but just raise your hand if there's any issues with that. Uh, I am also going live on Instagram, so you won't be able to see the Zoom uh, that is currently playing, but I don't have any slides or anything to show, so uh, you'll be able to join in and just hear everything that I'm saying. Um, so yeah, so I'm happy to be here. My name is Ali Taylor. I am from Wisdom and Wayfinder, uh, formerly of Bell Marketing Design Studio. And I have another picture that I would like to share uh, if that's possible. Um, here we go. Uh, everyone's doing this trend on social media now where they're showing their pictures of themselves at 21. Um, this is a picture of me at 17. Uh, in my what's known as a royal ranger uniform uh so i was not a boy scout but i was a royal ranger this was attached to the church um and a part of during my time there we learned all different types of skills uh such as wilderness survival uh, i learned how to build a fire with one match no matches uh whatever you had in your pockets um learned how to set up a tarp and um latch things together so i can survive out in the wilderness if i need to uh there might be some things i need to brush up on but that is something that i'm capable of doing uh during my time there and so one of the things they taught us uh is how to use an actual compass to navigate and um, chart out a path on a map. So with this type of compass, like most of the other ones you've probably seen, you're not able to adjust the dial or anything. It just has the, the, the arrow that just points to north. And so most people just follow that. But with this type of compass, you can actually set it down on a map and chart a path and orient which direction you want to go to so that you can actually find and go in the right path. And so I bring this up because one of the things they taught us early on with this type of compass is that if you're off by even one degree, if you don't have it oriented correctly, and then you go out on your path, the further out you go, the further away that you're going to get to, the further away you're going to be from where you actually want to go. And so in my presentation today, I'm talking about, you know, what you do is not nearly as important as why you do it. Most people, when they go out and they start their businesses, they're starting it from a place that uh, they may not be aware of that's not going to get them where they actually want to go, right? So how many of us have ever been lost or been in a car with somebody who's clearly lost and doesn't want to ask for directions, right? Go ahead and raise your hand if you've done that, right? Yep. <laughs> so we've all had that experience of, holy shit, I've been driving for however long it is, or I've been walking for however long it is, and this is not where I want to be. I don't know where, like, where I am right now, and I don't know how to get back to where I want to go. And so that's why it's so important that you make sure that you have a clear idea of where you want to go, where you want to be, so that as you go over time, you don't end up completely foreign and out of place from where you actually wanted to end up. So when you have that clear understanding of why you're doing something, um, that why will provide the clarity and the motivation and the alignment in both your personal and professional life, right? Um, I'd like to say that why you do what you do makes a difference in how you do it as well, yeah? So uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. When I first started Bell Marketing Design Studio. I was working for another agency at the time. Um, and I had, we just had different ideas of what work looked like. I won't get into the details of bashing my old job or anything like that. I'll just say that we just had different ideas, different ideals, different vision. And so when I left that company, it was about two or three years later, I'm working and someone had sent me a screenshot of somebody's email uh, of my former VP's email saying, you know, listing me as <clears throat> one of their uh, competitors. They had listed like their top three competitors. And I was listed as one of the competitors, even though I'm a solo person starting my own business. And I was like, fuck yeah, like I'm going to get back at them. Like I'm going to show them like, you know, I'm going to prove them wrong. They were wrong for, you know, not going the way that I wanted to go. And so that was like a big motivation for me. Another big motivation for me in my business was um, when my father, he was alive at the time, we didn't have the greatest relationship. He worked in the union, he worked in construction, and he wanted me to go into the Glaciers Union. 
uh, we had a big fight and an argument about it because I wanted to go study graphic design. I wanted to do something more creative. And, you know, I understood where he was coming from, but I was like, no, dad, I'm going to show you. I'm going to, I'm going to be successful. This is the way that I want to do things. It's going to be great. And so about three years into my business, uh, I did a program called the Landmark Forum, which had me, you know, really take a look at some of the internal motivations and really address and observe like why I was doing the things that I was doing, um, helping to get more authentic and bring integrity to the decisions and the things that I was doing. And I got really clear that a lot of the things that were driving me was about proving people wrong, was about trying to prove my worth, um, trying to show people like, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this in spite of you and I'm going to prove you wrong. And the thing that I really got the thing that I really got for myself was one, the people at my former job, they moved on. They didn't care. They were doing whatever they wanted to do, needed to do, and they weren't even thinking about me. So why was I spending so much time trying to prove people wrong that one, I didn't even like, or I stopped liking, right? And people that weren't even thinking about me. Why am I letting that drive my decision? And the same thing with my father, it was like, once I was able to have a conversation with him and start to repair that relationship, it stopped being about trying to prove my dad wrong. And instead I got to have a conversation with him where I remember one time I went to go visit him uh, and I was telling him about all the things that I was up to. And he was like, you know, Hey son, I'm, I'm really proud of you. And so being able to get that acknowledgement that he was proud of me, once I stopped trying to prove him wrong, once I stopped trying to make him proud of me, that's when he was actually able to tell me that he was proud of me. And so at that point, I tripled the revenue in my business. Like it just exploded, right? I was able to just go out and sell and think about, wow, what am I really doing? What am I really bringing to the table in terms of my business? Um, because once it stopped being about proving, you know, how good I was, proving my work, then I was free to finally start serving the people that I was working for, to be able to serve my clients and to look for look out for them and what they needed, what they want. And so I come back to, you can be great at what you do, but if you're not doing it from a place that's clear on where that motivation is coming from, you're not going to be as effective as you could be in the long run, right? So again, just... Why you do what you do makes a difference in how you do. Uh, I had a friend this week on Facebook. She wrote a great post. Her name's Lydia. Um, I'm not going to pronounce her last name, but uh, she wrote this great, great post about how perfectionism is misplaced uh, rage. And she was talking about how, you know, so many people have adopted an inner critic for themselves that drives them to keep pushing, to try to be perfect, uh, to perform at a really high level in excess of what's actually required by the situation, right? So maybe you had a teacher in grade school who said you were a slow reader, you weren't gonna be amount to anything. Uh, maybe you had people that made fun of you, your, your clothes, your financial situation, or you had a partner who wasn't very supportive of your business. Uh, I know we've had a lot of people uh, sort of in the spotlight group that have talked about how their spouses have not been supportive of the moves that they've been making, right? And so sometimes you can come from that place of wanting to perform and be perfect uh, as a way to spite people, but you take on an inner critic and it becomes like this own monster that is haunting you and driving you to um, react in a way that's rageful. And so that shows up in your business. It might show up in like how you price your services. It might show up in how you, um, you know, the types of like how much money you ask for, you know, whether you ask for money. Um, those are a lot of things where it's like, okay, I'm going to try and get this much money, but I'm going to over deliver because there's still that place you have to prove something. Right. So, I just loved what she said about how that perfectionism is just another form of misplaced rage. So you want to make sure that the context in which you do anything, uh, it's coming from a place that's pure, right? Are you doing this to give love or to receive love, right? What's your primary motivation for, do, for doing that? Um, so if you want to discover your why, here's a practical tip for you. Whenever you do something, 
you want to ask yourself, whose approval am I seeking? Right. Whether it's a service that you're offering, whether it's an, attend an event that you're going to, whether it's the, the investments that you're making in your business, are you doing it from a place of seeking approval and whose approval are you seeking, right? Are you doing it for your own approval or are you doing it to try to um, get the approval of your peers? Or are you doing it to get the approval of your clients, right? And then whenever you're not doing something, this is really important. Whatever action that you know that you should be taking, you're like, man, I, I really want to do that, but uh, I don't know. And you're hesitating and you're doubting yourself and you, and you choose not to do it. Ask yourself, whose criticism do you fear? And that'll tell you everything that you need to know about making that decision. Okay. All right, so nugget number two, say no to anything that's not a part of the vision that you have for your life. So part of having a clear vision for your life in, in business is knowing where you want to be, right? Again, coming back to this compass, not just, not only where do you want to go, right? Where are you trying to be, but who do you want to be when you get there? What kind of person do you want to be when you get there? So a lot of times what will happen is, you know, if you don't create a vision for your life, if you, and I, and I suggest that you take some time to write this down, actually list it out. You know, what does life actually look like for you? You know, what type of money are you making? What does your lifestyle look like? Uh, what are the values that you are upholding and expressing when you get to this point um, so that you have that clear vision? And then you have to be diligent about saying no to anything else that doesn't match that. Like you have to be relentless about it. Um, so you have to say no to outside influences because there's always going to be those people uh, who see the changes that you're making, right? They've gotten so used to who you've currently been that they may have trouble integrating and accepting this new version of yourself or this new person that you're growing into. Uh, if there's somebody that you used to party with all the time, maybe you went out go, you know, drinking every weekend. Or maybe you did a lot of, you know, going out on trips and maybe spending money that you didn't have. And now you're getting clear that, no, I want to do this for my business. It's the kind of lifestyle that I want to have. So I need to make different decisions or maybe it has to do with like your health and your fitness, right? That's those types of lifestyles. Or maybe you've, you've made some changes in how you show up spiritually. And so the people that you used to be aligned with, now you no longer align with those people. And then the, your environment doesn't align with who you want to be either, right? Because that's going to be a reflection of who you are as well. And so as you begin to make these changes, you're going to experience that pull back to who you used to be, how you used to show up, that box that people were, that box or that role that people were used to seeing you in. It's the same way like when you see... Um, famous actors who are known for like their comedic roles and then they suddenly do something dramatic and it's like, you know, Adam Sandler's doing a, a serious role. What the hell is that about? Like he's the, he's the happy Gilmore guy, right? He's the Billy Madison guy. What is he doing a serious role for? You know, people aren't used to seeing that. So, you know, they may not be so ready to accept that. And you've got to be diligent and willing to say no to any of those temptations or pulls back to who you used to be uh the other thing so that's all the ex external stuff you also have to be relentless about saying no to your own internal patterns that's where we or a lot of us get really tripped up is that we don't realize that we're like robots we have these patterns that have been ingrained in us we have these grooves that have been worn into our brain that are just subconscious we're just running on autopilot and so you have to be able to say no to those internal things, such as if you know that you need to start waking up earlier, uh, if you're someone who's not used to taking massive action during the day, if you're someone who's you know not used to having a clean desk, and now you know that having a clean desk and eating you know drinking your water in the morning and having that quiet time to journal and reflect in the morning, right? And those are changes that you're making. You have to resist going back to those old patterns, especially as things get rough, especially as things get challenging, right? Because we're always going to hit those roadblocks. We're always going to hit those, those walls. But if you suddenly revert back to those old patterns, 
that's like starting the cycle over again. It's like Sisyphus pu pushing the boulder up the up the hill. Um, you're just going to end up starting over and over. And so you want to make sure that you develop some type of practice. And uh, James Clear talks about this a lot in the in his book Atomic Habits, where you have to create set yourself up for success and create those cues for yourself and make sure that your environment reflects the person that you're becoming and not the person that you've been. Uh, so yeah, again, so as far as practical guidance, you know, again, you know, have the, the things that I just said about setting up your environment, having the cues, having those things that fit who you're becoming, and then make sure you have your vision written out. And you want to write down everything that could disrupt achieving your vision, and then you want to create a plan to mitigate that. And I also recommend sharing that, that plan and that vision with someone who is similar to or like the person that you want to become, right? Because there's somebody who can, that you can bounce ideas off of. There's somebody who can hold you accountable. There's somebody who can support you during those times where, you know, you do, you are going to revert back to old patterns and habits because you're human and you just got to have some grace for yourself. But then once you do that, you just got to get back on to, you know, get back on the horse, right? All right, and so... That's going to bring us to golden nugget number three, which is being good with you, right? Uh, again, when you're saying no to people, nobody wants to be kicked out of the tribe. I don't care, even if it's a crappy tribe and you know it's a crappy tribe, if it's the tribe that you've had that you're used to, nobody wants to experience that loss of belonging, that loss of connection, that loss of being you know, a part of something. But if that tribe no longer reflects who you want to be and the type of business that you're building, the type of life that you're creating, then you've got to be good enough with you in that transition period where you're leaving the old tribe and then finding a new one, right? You have to really have a good relationship with yourself to be able to do that, to be able to stand and sit and not be pulled into uh, other people's drama, other people's perceptions of you, <clears throat> again, going back to that question of whose approval are you seeking and whose criticism do you fear? When you can get really good with yourself, and this is this is one of the things that I love about doing mirror work, uh, because you know, I do this every morning where you know sometimes it's you know, it was hard at first, like sitting doing uh mirror work. Um, in fact, I'll tell you about when I went to uh Costa Rica for a uh men's retreat. Uh, our coach uh, Ashley had us. Uh, we were it was like three, four four guys and and her and she's sitting across the room and she's like, all right, the guys we're all ready to sit there like do some type of exercise. Like we've got our journals, we've got our pens. We're like, all right, Ashley's gonna like hit us with some wisdom. We're gonna take some notes and then we're gonna go home, and start crushing it in all areas of life. Right? That's what we were expecting. So she just sits there. She literally sits across from us and she doesn't say a word. She's making eye contact with some of us. And then we're all looking at each other like, are we supposed to do something? Like, like, what is it? Like, what, you know, we're trying to figure something out. And I figured I'm like, maybe it's like a leadership test. Maybe she's trying to see like, who's going to say something first or like take the first action. So I did at first thinking that that's what was supposed to happen. She didn't respond, didn't say a word. So it was super awkward after that. So we're talking... 15, 20 minutes of absolute silence. Five people in a room sitting there looking at each other saying absolutely nothing. It was the most uncomfortable 20 minutes that I've ever experienced in my life. <laughs> oh, Kim, this was like, a, this was not a pause. This was like an intermission. This was like a, a break. <laughs> Like, it was crazy the amount of time that she just had us sitting there. But she did that for a purpose because so many people are so uncomfortable with silence. They're so uncomfortable with being with themselves. They cannot sit. You're right. Uh, even if they're watching TV, they got to have their phone in the hand, scrolling through social media. Right. How many people are, are able to just sit across from somebody else they say that they care about, that they say they're interested in, that they're connected to, and they've got their phone in their hand scrolling through social media? 
we live in such a society in, that is so insistent on extracting every bit of attention from everybody, right? That people are incapable of sitting with themselves. And so they make decisions that are often not good for themselves, uh, that are not in service of who they want to be, who they say that they want to be, because they haven't mastered the ability to sit with themselves. And to be able to do that while looking in a mirror, if you can develop that, you are the, you will be one of the most powerful people on the planet. I have developed an ability to, you know, through doing mirror work, through being able to sit in silence, um, have developed an ability and such a strong spine, strong sense of self through that work, right? It's like, okay, yeah, you could say something negative about me. Yeah, you're probably right. And guess what? It's not going to phase me because there's nothing that you can say to me that I haven't already said to myself three inches from my own face. Right. If you if you can sit and look at yourself um, and accept yourself, right, the good, the bad, the in between, there is nothing that anybody can say to you that is going to throw you off your path and your vision for yourself, your vision for your life. And it will literally make you one of the most powerful people on the planet. So, again, mirror work, highly, highly recommend. I don't care how uncomfortable it is. You de develop that you'll be more powerful than Superman or Supergirl or a Justice League, the whole freaking Avengers, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> be one of the most powerful people on the planet, right? Because you'll be able to resist whatever, you know, pull that people are trying to have on, whether it's pulling you back into bad habits or old patterns, or if you have a clear vision for your business, right? Um, a lot of people today that we have running businesses should not be running businesses, because they're thinking that they need to be uh, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, right? They need to somehow be um, jerks in order to succeed in business. And that's not the way, at least that for me, I don't believe that that's the way to do that. I believe that kindness, serving over selling is the way to get ahead in business, being able to help people and do it from a place that's pure and from giving, from serving, Right. As opposed to trying to just take, take, take and get whatever you want. And then, you know, what what good is having a successful business if you're trading in your values and your morals and your integrity to do that? Right. So if you can develop that strong spine, that strong sense of self to be able to resist the way that society tells us that we need to operate our business, the way that society tells us that we need to get ahead and in order to be successful. Um, that's how you chart your own path forward. And so when you have that self-acceptance, that self-awareness, that's going to filter into everything that you do inside of your business. It's going to filter into how you structure your business, the types of services that you offer, the types of clients that you serve, uh, the way that you interact with your employees. Uh, it's often said that business isn't personal, but that's just a lie because people are at the heart of every business. And we are who we are wherever we go. So if you're taking all of that into your business, of course, it's going to be personal. You may not think it's going to be personal, but it, of course, it's personal because you're a person. And so if you're not aligned with who you are, if you're not aligned with your vision, if you don't have a clear vision, an open heart and a strong spine and a powerful voice to be able to speak to what it is that you want and how you want to grow your business and how you want to be successful, um, if you don't develop that, you're going to allow yourself to be pulled into things that you don't want to be doing. And then you're going to get to the end and be like, how the hell did I get here? Well, and here's the other thing that I think. Um, so two more points is when you're misaligned with who you are, when there's a misalignment between who you are and where you want to be and how you structure your business, you'll either spend all of your time trying to create a business that's based on somebody else's playbook and you'll end up burning yourself out, right? You'll end up you know, making bad decisions and then you won't have a business. But here's what I think is even worse than that. You'll end up being super successful. You'll make it to the top. You'll get all the awards, you'll get all the accolades and you will still be unhappy. You will still be unfulfilled. Right? So, 
develop that self-awareness, develop that access, that acceptance of yourself, all aspects of yourself, develop the daily practices, whatever it takes to nurture a positive relationship with yourself. So in addition to mirror work, I also do journaling. Um, and I also do meditation. I listen to, you know, certain music, uh, to make sure that I'm, I'm in that right mindset. Um, uh, but I also found a picture of myself at five years old. Um, I don't have it with me. Otherwise I would show you, uh, but I'll, I'll add it to like the, the follow-up recording right now, but I have that sitting on my desk in front of me because I'm always making sure like, what would he want? Like, what would he be proud of? What would five-year-old Ali be proud of and see me, you know, how he sees me building my business, how he sees me working with my clients and the things that I do, right? And I'm always going back to, you know, what does he need? What are those things that he needs to, to heal from? What are those things that he needs to, um, to feel safe, right? So that he can have that expression, that so he can have that sense of pride in me and how I'm building that business. Because then I could shut out the rest of the world, shut out all the music, right? Just like how there's all this background noise and music behind me with the DJ, right? If you could sit and be focused in a world that is full of distractions, that will make you the most powerful person to be able to sit in silence and find that direction inside of all of that. So again, just to recap, number one, what you do is not nearly as important as why you do it. Make sure that anything you're doing is coming from that context of that vision that you have for yourself. So that why you do what you do makes a difference in how you do it and how you show up. Number two, say no to anything that's not a part of the vision that you have for your life. I know it's gonna be hard. I know it's gonna be difficult and we could do hard things, right? In service of that vision. And then number three, make sure that you're good with you. The most powerful relationship that you can develop is the one that you have with yourself. And when you let that be the pillar from which you build everything else, that's when you create the kind of life that you want. That's when you create the kind of business that you love. And that's when you can bring those two things together and you'll ultimately succeed. Now, I don't have an offer uh, today in terms of a, a specific business offer, but if you wanna book a clarity call with me, uh, I would certainly love to talk to you about what are the things that are coming up with you in your business, the things that aren't working. If you're struggling to grow, if you're struggling to be more profitable, if you're worried about how to manage the risk in your business, I guarantee there's some place where it could tie back to all of those three nuggets that we talked about. And I can help you put the right plan and strategy in place to mitigate those things, uh, to make sure that you are aligned with the vision that you truly have for your business. Uh, and so just go to my website, wisdomofwayfair.com uh, forward slash book and clarity call. So. All right. Thank you, Ali. I will put that yeah. in the follow-up email um, for the, after this is all done with the pre-recording. Yeah. And let me, uh, yeah, thank you. I'll definitely do that. So that way anyone can reach out and you owe us the five-year-old picture. <laughs> <laughs> I will. It's a, it's a, I, I'm not, you know, I was in a, I was a cute kid. <laughs> I mean, I'm still handsome, but I'm, I was a cute kid. I, I, you know. <laughs> awesome. Does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself um, so we can get it on the closed captions. Julia, go ahead. Oh, I have to tell you, Ali, I didn't know you were going to talk about this today. And I am so excited to see you coming out. Like, oh my yeah. God. This is so, <laughs> I am so deeply touched by how, by your, because really you're just unzipping and showing the brilliance you're showing your light. I am so proud of you. I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for presenting because it's like your journey, you know, you have learned in your journey, the, the, the tools that can help other people in their journey and shortcut it. I mean, in a way it's like you're a Sherpa, you know, uh, climbing up the mountain because you're short roping them. You're, you're helping to pull them up the mountain with what you've already learned. And uh, so I am just so thrilled by what you are stepping yeah. into. I didn't yeah, know thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And and yeah, I I that is a a vision or an image that I kind of hold close of being like I'm not radioing radioing in from base camp like sitting down here at the bottom of the mountain saying, "Oh yeah, go up to the left, go up to the right." 
Like I like to look at myself as being shoulder to shoulder with you. Like I'm climbing my own mountain. We're all doing our own climb, but I'm there shoulder to shoulder with you as we're going up together. So I love that uh, that you called out that that Sherpa aspect of it. So, appreciate it. Anyone else? Well, I enjoy I I enjoyed it, Ali. I had a few aha moments. The mirror, the whole time you were saying that, thank God I was muted because I'm like sitting <laughs> about myself, looking at myself in the mirror, and all I do is laugh at myself. Uh, it's yeah, that is very hard. I've done that. Uh, very tough, very very tough. Mm -hmm. to do that, but you're right. Once you learn to love your full self unconditionally, flaws, strengths, weak, whatever. It's yeah. amazing transformation that you put yourself in and align yourself with like-minded people. And then you connect the similarities and, and the joining of it. It's just amazing. And journaling. I, I did journaling for a little while. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I probably need to get back into that. Most of my journaling was all the thoughts in my head about jokes and stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I got to bring that up, <laughs> you know, things of that nature, because uh, uh, life is comedy for me. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just always if there is a moment I'm finding a story around it or some kind of joke. And I learned that, I guess, because, you know, being in the environments that I was in the, you know, the, you know, the work world and things, especially to American uh, reference, being in property management, oh, mm -hmm. it is like a drama center. And I found ways to just be comical about it and use analogies and teaching anybody, you know, that I worked with. So I, I totally relate a lot of aha mo moments and you're right. You have to have that full alignment in order for you to be able to give what you need to all the business owners you need to be able to have that yourself. And you're yeah. right. When I say I'm not here, I'm here with y'all. No yeah. matter what, we are all in our journey. And that is so true. So well said. You did an amazing job on all of your nuggets. And I appreciate you sharing a lot of that. Like Julia said, we learned a lot about Ali. <laughs> a lot about Ali today. And he is quiet. He's like the Superman. <laughs> running you know he's saving the world he he don't have time to talk <laughs> he's doing well, so just to just to that point i'm not here to save the world yeah. i'm here to show other people how they can save themselves yeah because right? that's 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 one of the things that i've learned recently like you can't save anybody else you can't do the work for anybody else uh god knows that i've tried <laughs> and gotten burned on it um but when you become an example of what other people can follow, right? It's like, I'm not here to, to rescue in like the, the Superman way, but I'm here to help other people unlock the, the, the superhero that's inside of them, right? So that they can discover their own power, their own self-expression, their own, um, you know, internal vision uh, of what they want for themselves. Wow. Yeah. Very, very powerful. You're right. Everybody's got to be able to do that. Unlock their own superpower. Yeah. That's my aha. That's my statement for today. <laughs> Unlock your own superpower. Anybody have any more questions? I would just say that I really loved the, yep. um, the questions at the beginning about whose approval are you seeking? And yeah. um, I thought that was, that was, a, that sent me off into a little bit of a thought um, around <laughs> things. But also then you said, you know, asking about like what our patterns are, you know, of just like the dysfunction, the things we do on autopilot mm -hmm. and saying no to those. Is there any kind of advice around anything to do in terms of doing that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll reference James Clear again. He talks about how uh, a lot of us will, will, uh, will identify ourselves or create our identity around the things that we do as a, and then we won't look at it anymore. So we'll say like, you know, if you if you're gonna be a marathon runner, or let's say, all right, if you're trying to quit smoking, right? A lot of people will say, I no, I'm not gonna have a cigarette, I'm trying to quit smoking, versus I'm not a smoker. Mm. Right. It's a it's a subtle distinction, but it's a powerful one. Because it's like if I'm not something, or if I am a certain thing, then I'm going to do the things that someone who is not a smoker is going to do, right? If I say that I am 
you know, if I'm bodybuilding or I'm into fitness, right? Um, I'm not trying to go to the gym. I just am a fitness person. I am a business owner. And so I do the things that a business owner does. I am a successful person. And so all of my habits, uh, my habits, how I think, how I view things, my perspective, uh, my environment is going to be a reflection of who I think I am. And so if I'm not getting the results that I want, if I'm not showing up as a person that I want to be, then I need to take a look at, well, what is in my environment? What are my daily habits? How am I, what's the first thought that comes into my head when I look at a certain situation? That will show me how I currently think I am, how, how I'm currently showing up. And so you can start with the physical stuff, the, you know, changing up the environment. So if you are, um, you know, to have it be someone who's very dialed in on your numbers with your business, maybe it starts by, you know what? I am not somebody who leaves the dishes in the sink uh, at the end of the night. I am somebody who makes my bed every morning. I am somebody who, dare I say it, I fold my laundry and put it away as soon as it's done. It doesn't just go on a chair in the in the room, right? <laughs> so when you start to do those things, it, it it builds the, it's like layering on top of one another. You're building that stack of proof, that stack of trust with yourself in those habits that you are who you say you are. Yeah, very true. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love your scenery, Ali. Yeah. You got to see a few people walk by. We tr oh. I, I tried to wave, but they didn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were uh, they were a little uh, small, but I'll, I'll give you a bigger view so oh. you guys can see what's happening out there. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, where is that? Uh, this, this is at the Bell Works building. It was formerly known as the uh, at and Bell Labs um, office building. It was designed by... Um, Oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. Uh, he also designed the TWA um, his, uh, buildings as well. Um, and it's a 2 million square foot complex. Uh, it's got five floors. It is massive. It's a huge complex. Um, yeah, and it's called Bell Works. And it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Gorgeous place to work. Gorgeous place to be. Oh. I used to have my office here uh, full time uh, just before the pandemic. Uh, but once everything kind of shut down and I was also taking care of my mom at the time. So we're kind of like, all right, what do we, you know, need to make decisions about how we're going to do that. So that's when I moved my office out, but I still love coming here to work and uh, I've done events here and it's just a great place to be. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So tell us how you came up with Wisdom and Wayfinder. Yeah, so Wisdom and Wayfinder, I was, um, you know, trying to think of what it, what are the services that I'm really offering? What is it that people are really going to get when they work? with me and a core part of wisdom and wayfinder is that unless you've discovered the secret to everlasting life and you plan to live forever none of us has enough time to make all the mistakes and learn all the lessons there are about running growing and scaling your business on our own so we need to borrow from the wisdom of people who have gone before people who have done it before or have expertise in certain areas and so my job as the growth consultant, uh, working with my clients, you know, I'll work with them to get clear on their vision, where is that, that they want to be. We'll do a comprehensive business analysis, and then we'll come up with a strategic development plan, and then bring in all of the tools and resources that they need to make sure they're going to be effective. And then what I do is if there's a certain area that we really need to make a critical improvement on, um, I have developed relationships over the last, you know, 12, 15 years that I've been in business of people who are highly skilled, highly expert, um, you know, uh, in their fields and have done, have gotten great results. And so I'll bring those people in to say, it's kind of like going back to the Superman superhero reference, like bringing in the justice league to say like, okay, I need a Batman over here. I need a wonder woman to here. I need a flash here. Uh, somebody who's going to help out with profitability. Uh, you know, there, here's some places where, you haven't properly managed your risk. And so we need to get some insurance coverages, some policies in place that are going to mitigate your exposure uh, in certain areas. Um, you know, like Tina, we've talked about how, you know, you help people find that money that's been missing in their business. 
it's like, okay, well, if you want to make more investments in your business, but we don't, we can't do other things right now, let's find the places where money's leaking out of your business. And I'm going to bring in Tina because she's an expert in doing that, right? She's right. going to help you find money so that you can now start to invest or plug up these other holes. And then we work on one thing at a time. Again, just stacking those, you know, fixing those problems at a time. And that's how we get you the results that you're looking for. Right, exactly. Ali and I kind of hit that second strategy of my business is I work on getting you cash flow in and hitting all those leaks. And then once they do, we want to kind of really start working on your growth um, and get you where you need to be. So Ali and I will probably be the, the cousins definitely for a long time and bringing in the Justice League and all of the people that we need to be able to get you stable and help you in the growth and keep you stabilized because it's not a Band-Aid fix that we do. We, mm -hmm. we, wanna, we want to get you to where you are and reduce the stress and the anxiety and all the things and show that it's possible that wow. it is possible to ha be the legacy business that people want to be and they just don't know who to turn to. So yeah, yeah. Exactly. I look forward to it, Ali, uh, definitely on what we both do as a blend. So ironically, uh, Supergirl and Superman, Justice League, the whole nine yards, <laughs> we will do it. So thank you so very much for your time today and enjoy yeah. the afternoon if you're able to plug in and listen in. That would be great. If not, we definitely understand, but I am honored to have had you on the panel today. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, inviting me to be here. And I look forward to having you on the Wednesday Wisdom Series this Wednesday um, at 1 p.m. Uh, where we're going to be talking about your business and, and what you do. And so, yeah, I'm excited about that. Me too. Yes. And we'll definitely uh, send that out in the response in reference to the the upcoming so they can join now is that going to be on linkedin or is that going to be through facebook live what are you hosting uh, it's going to be everywhere uh i just uh, so Streamyard actually has a new feature where i can stream it to multiple uh locations for me but anybody that i have on as a guest they can stream it to two of their locations as well so mm -hmm. while i'm on my linkedin my facebook it could also be on your linkedin and your facebook all at the same time so right. it's right. going to be everyone oh yeah. awesome well i am <laughs> glad i'm uh, i can't wait i'm excited for that too and uh kicking that off in the very fresh new of 2024 as people are still yeah working out their processes and trying to close up year end and they're still in 2023 and my world and Janet's world we're they're still in 2023 to some point and then I just really want to get everybody on the right kickoff for the end of February and we are hitting this at the right time so thank you Ali it's been an honor yeah, thank, yeah you. thank you take care all right <laughs> well thank you everyone I appreciate it Ali our next amazing guest is Dr. Sri, 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 I call her Sri, <laughs> Dr. Sri Latha Mellon. She is freeing ourselves, that is her company, and she is going to touch on our subconscious mind, is responsible for 95% of our actions, reactions, and decisions. Almost all of the stories and beliefs in our subconscious mind get there before the age of seven. So just like Ali was saying, he has a picture of himself from when he was five and he reflects back to that. I do as well. I think that seems to be a pivotal point. And, and it is possible to rewrite these stories and beliefs. And I think, you know, Ali touched a lot on that as well on how we do rewrite, rewrite our stories. It's just uh, amazing. And, and, and Sheree works on tapping, which I highly support. I believe in that. It kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of what Siobhan does in reference to the uh, scientific components of what it does to, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, Sheree, isn't it like the, what is it in the back of the brain, the medulla area that it, it's, that it, <laughs> what is that? Oh, it the the way I talk about it is when you do tapping, you um you are working with the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. Okay. Right? Yeah. So you you tamp down the sympathetic systems and you allow the parasympathetic to. So you you're tamping down the fight flight freeze response, and so then it allows your and your creativity and your um to reach your full your higher better self. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I done yeah. Western medicine for years prior to control anxiety that I had, unbeknownst to me, I found that I actually had a gene mutation called MTHFR that was causing a lot of my problems. How ironic. So I, you know, came out of that mentality and, and had been working with uh, the tapping and it completely transformed a lot of me and understanding and how the chemistry of the body works and how the mind works in the body and all of that. So that's why this whole five types of wealth is so important to me and anybody that's going to be an entrepreneur in meeting your fullest potential and, you know, removing the boundaries and the things like Ali even said, surround yourself, look, always evaluate who is in your circle and change it if you need to, because you want to meet your highest potential of yourself. And, and then in your professional life, you want to get to where you want to be. So I am so honored to have you, Shri. Uh, I just, it's been great meeting you and learning a lot more and just learning more about you during this. So I will let you have the floor and everybody welcome. I will say Dr. Shri. So thank you so much. Let me go ahead and spotlight you. So you have front and center and you go at it. Thank you so much, everyone for, for joining, for signing up for, for this uh, amazing um, summit that Tina has put together. And, um, it, it's almost as if she, um, you know, the, the way she she set me up right after Ali is is just kind of perfect. Um, because a lot of what I talk about and the, a lot of the ways in which I work with my clients uh, reflects back to what what Ali was talking about, right? So he talked about. Um, how we make decisions and we, for example, the the whole idea about um, setting up a, a, a New Year's resolution, say, I'm, I'm not going to smoke in, in this year. And you, it, if you think back, you've, you've done that every year and every year by, you know, almost 95% of the people have broken their resolutions by the time they're into the third week of January. And what we do with that is that we beat ourselves up, right? We say, I'm a loser. I'm never going to get anywhere. And then that, that allows us to kind of settle into what is not comfortable, what is not, which is not where we want to be, but is also very comfortable because it's what we are used to. So the, the, the biggest fear that we have is breaking out of a pattern that we are so used to and and the reason we are afraid of breaking patterns <clears throat> is because these patterns have been set up by the stories that we have told ourselves starting it at a very very young age so uh, i'm going to give you um a story that comes up for me again and again. Okay, so I was about five years old. I was um, my mom had taken me to this convent school to test for kindergarten from kindergarten to first grade, and they took me to this small room and asked me to do some carryover sums. Um, I was terrified. They told they didn't allow my mom to come into the room. It was a little dark room. There was a nun sitting there. And I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And so I looked at the at the numbers, there were some dots, there were some, she said, it, you can count on your fingers if you need to. And that threw me for a loop because <laughs> in my house, we never counted on our fingers. We had to do everything in our head. So in five minutes, she led me out and she said, she doesn't know anything. She can't be going to first grade. And even though my mom didn't say anything. I little children sense we are we are sponges and we absorb energy. So I knew that I had failed in some way. Not only had I failed, I had failed her. So it felt I I felt like I was shrinking, right? And then when you go home, you you know, 
it's an Indian family, so there are people coming in and out all the time. And so the story is repeated. Oh, she didn't get into the, you know, she didn't get into the school. She didn't. And every time that is done, you become more and more aware of how inadequate you are. Add to that the fact that you're the youngest of three siblings, two brilliant uh, older brothers who are always praised for how how good they are at everything. And why I'm t sharing this story is even yesterday, I'm, I, I'm, I've just resigned from my job, but even yesterday when somebody pointed out that I had not done my word formatting appropriately, what I felt and how inadequate I felt was still similar to that little child who felt completely alone and abandoned and a total failure. Now, today I have the tools. I know how to hold her. I know how to do my tapping and my meditation and sitting in silence and, and bringing myself back up in order to be able to be present and be powerful. But a lot of us who who repeat these patterns don't even know what these stories are that that are bringing up these little persons inside us who need to feel safe and in order to feel safe they are much e it's much easier for them to be in that space that is comfortable and in fight or flight rather than in power right there, there is actually research that shows that we get addicted to the levels of cortisol that that are coursing through our body so we are addicted to a certain level of stress and so that is because we are so used to these patterns that we have we have built up that we would much rather go there because it's safer the biggest thing evolution wise what has been um, the human races or any living creatures first instinct the first instinct is to feel safe so when you don't feel safe you are less likely to do something that doesn't make you feel safe so if even if it is uncomfortable even if it is so ali was talking about you know, people seeing you in a certain box and you belonging to a certain tribe. Why is a tribe important? A tribe has always been important because that is how you ensure your survival. So the thought of doing something that does not fit with the tribe immediately activates your fight or flight response. So, so what can we do about it? What, what we what I do with my clients is I take them to this place. So so I take them to a place where they are feeling unsafe. Right. So we say, suppose it's an entrepreneur who has constantly set targets. You know, every year she starts off saying that this is the year I'm going to meet all my sales goals. Every time she stands up in front of a crowd she feels herself shrinking she feels herself questioning herself she feels perhaps this little five-year-old standing up and saying no 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 it's not safe they're going to say that you failed it's much better to fail in advance rather than try and fail right so so we we go there we make we i hold the client in a space where it is safe for him or her to feel that and they think they're feeling it in the present, but we then, I then take them through a meditation that helps them identify the first time they felt these physical feelings. So whether it's squeeziness in your stomach, whether it's a tightness in your chest, whether it's wobbly knees, heavy shoulders, right? The, the actual physical feeling that you feel and the body's physiological, reaction has is a memory that you've brought forward so when we identify the the source of that memory we go in and we start tapping 
that's where what Tina was talking about. We 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 have brought the person into this fight, flight, freeze response. We use tapping to tamp down the sympathetic nervous system, make them feel safer. The parasympathetic system gets activated. Your uh, creativity is activated. Your intuition is activated, which is very important because when your intuition is activated, you become more and more aware of other underlying fears and blocks that that are standing in the way of you moving forward. So when so what you do is you you go through uh, levels of tapping, maybe three, four rounds. And for those of you who don't know what tapping is, it's called emotional freedom technique. I should have done this in the beginning, but let me do it now. Emotional freedom technique is tapping on acupressure points, and it has a, an ex solid scientific basis. Um, we we know that it reduces cholesterol levels. We know that it takes you away from your fight, flight, freeze response. Um, we know that it modulates your heart rate and your breathing. Um, so there's very solid scientific uh, evidence. It's actually a, an approved process in um, in VAs for PTSD. Um, so so that's what we do. So when when the person has come to to a place where we are away from the acute fight flight response and their intuition is beginning to pick up. We then stop and say, okay, what came up? What else came up? And once we uh, figure, so it might be a sense of abandonment. It might be the loss of a loved one. Um, it, it, that, that, you, that somehow you, you may be betraying a memory if you, if you step out and, and do something that maybe that person who's passed doesn't want you to do. So, so there are all of these deep, unconscious subconscious things that are holding us back and tapping along with meditation is an extremely powerful way for us to uncover them once you uncover them so, so let me give you one more story i have this uh, friend who's an amazing body worker um, she can actually look through zoom and tell people how to change their alignment in order for them to, to for their aches and pains to go away. She, she's just, she should be, you know, world famous in, in, the, in the kind of work that she can do. But she's been through multiple coaches, right? She's been through multiple big name coaches who've um, and gone through their courses. She's still where she was at when she started that. So she and I, we, uh, we, we had some sessions together. And in the first session, the, the, the person that came up was this eight-year-old girl, eight-year-old person, I'm going to call her AH, who was looking at the adult AH with so much disgust and anger. And she was saying, you know, the words were, you're a slob, you were a slob, you're always going to be a slob, nothing has changed, why should I trust you? Imagine that kind of fight going on in your mind every time you are starting to do something big. All you're going to do is say, yeah, I guess I am, I guess I'm not going to, right? And then so what we and there was so much resistance this is this was a fascinating thing about this this work that we did together there was so much resistance on both the little one's part and the adult ahs part to 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 bridge to bridge this divide and to be able to do some healing and it took me four sessions of deep deep work with her before she was able to say this is my child now i can hold her i can find ways in which we can work together and find creative ways in which i can express my creativity 
So this is this is the power of the work. It didn't matter that she had gone through all of those courses and done all of that work with other coaches. As long as this eight-year-old was active in her subconscious mind, pulling her down every time she tried to shine, there was no way she was going to meet her targets. It felt very unsafe because this battle inside her was terrifying. And so it's just it just felt safer to not want to face that rather than have to work out and and really put in the work to to begin to love that little eight year old who hated her so much. So I'm going to come back now that that kind of leads me to to some of the work that I think is is the most important work I do. And my my business is called freeing ourselves because the whole point of the business is to teach my clients to free themselves from this kind of judgment that we have about so many things that we do. So how do you do that? One of the ways in which I do that is I use meditations, I um, identify, so what, let me step back a little bit. Where are the places in which we don't like ourselves, right? So we don't, what we have been told, uh, I, and I will say, especially women, we have been told over and over again, that you should not get angry that you should not be yelling, that you should be always um, the person who doesn't rock the boat. You are supposed to to be the the fulcrum around which, you know, the, the whole family can uh, coalesce and therefore you shouldn't be the person rocking the boat. Don't get angry, don't shout, don't yell. Only bad women or good women don't don't get angry, right? So one of the places that we we like to push away, that we don't like to face, are those areas of our, ourselves where we have been angry and we feel ashamed about having gotten angry, whether we expressed it or not. We, we push that part of us away. What happens when we push that part of us away is that it, it goes into the subconscious and because it needs to heal, we'll keep seeing it come to us in other ways, right? So we will see anger being expressed towards us and us not being able to, to, to react to it. We, in, I like to say this all the time in, in a lot of my talks, in Hinduism, we talk about uh, there is a phrase called tattvam asi, which means that art thou, that art thou. What you see outside is what is inside you. So if you are experiencing unhealed anger outside, it's an invitation to look inside you to see where the unhealed anger is inside you. And these techniques like tapping and meditation are powerful ways in which to bring up that unhealed part of you, hold her, love her as she is angry and tell her it's okay to be who she is. So I have 10 meditations in which I do that. I go through anger, shame, jealousy, uh, the fear of stepping up um, and bring teach people how to, first of all, get into their bodies, teach them how to know where their observer is, and then use these meditations to completely integrate all parts of themselves into their heart and be fully comfortable in their skin. I, I Like I said before, I think so many of the things that I'm saying um, are uh, repetitions of what Ali, you, you may have heard Ali say, because in order for you to be standing in your power in the world, the only way to do it is if you fully and completely love and accept yourself. 
And that actually is a phrase that we use often that, that we start tapping off with, right? We, we start off saying, even though I'm angry, I fully and completely love and accept myself. That is a place where we want everyone to get to. It is not a place, like I was just uh, telling you, yesterday I was feeling inadequate, right? So it's not that it's not that you do this work once and you're all done. This is like a spiral staircase. Every time you go through and you're you're stepping up to a higher level, you go through the same healing process over and over again, but you're going to it at a deeper and deeper level and healing in um, at deepest levels of your soul. So this is a lifelong journey. As you keep stepping up, you you need to keep healing. Um, what else do I want to say, Tina? <laughs> so, um, uh, so you want to show you want to show us how to do a tapping mechanism, like give us an example and what it looks like. I know that helps a lot. Some people may not know what the word is, but they once you start doing it, they're like, oh, I've yeah, seen and, and, and one of the questions I got yesterday, actually, uh, uh, from Matina, who will be who will be appearing later on, is um, was this question about limiting beliefs and whether uh, you can, uh, you know, you can tap once and the limiting belief will go away or whether it's something that you you need to constantly do. And that's partly what I was I was trying to say with the with the analogy of the of the of the spiral staircase. It, it doesn't fully ever go away because this is work that we are meant to do all our lives. And so when we tap, we we peel away a certain layer of of uh, the hurt and we do a certain level of healing we then have to go back again uh, as we step up. Now, what is tapping? Um, what are the tapping points that I use? We start off always with the, with this uh, karate chop point. And if you, it'll take too long to go into which meridians we are tapping into, but I, this is information that I can, I can provide in the, in the follow-up. Uh, but we start off here and like I said, one of the things that we say is, for example, e even though I'm feeling inadequate, even though I'm feeling angry, I fully and completely love and accept myself. And one of the things that I like to add that I think Gary Craig used to add is, and I forgive myself. Um, a lot of people get hesitate because sometimes they are not ready to forgive themselves. So if, if that comes up, I will say, I'll ask them, what do you feel when you say, when I say um, I am willing to forgive myself and they say, I'm not quite sure about it. So we'll change it to, I'm willing to learn to forgive myself. Right? So, so you say, even though I'm feeling inadequate, I fully and completely love and accept myself and I'm willing to forgive myself for, feeling like this all over again at the age of 65. <laughs> and, and then you, you, I go to the top of the head, I'm feeling inadequate, mm -hmm. my chest feels tight. So we, we would have examined where the physical feelings are. I feel inadequate, my chest is tight. I don't like this feeling. I'm feeling inadequate, my chest is tight. I don't like this feeling. I'm feeling inadequate, my chest is tight. I don't like this feeling. I'm willing to feel this though, and learn what I need to learn from here. I'm feeling inadequate. My chest is tight. I don't like this feeling, but I'm willing to learn what I have to learn from this episode of inadequacy. I, my chest is tight. This sucks. I've felt like this so many times. I'm angry with myself for feeling this, but I am willing to learn the lesson that I need to learn right now. And so you you go through that, you examine how your body feels, whether your body is getting into a sense of um, calmness. Once you are there, that is when you can begin to rewrite the story. 
right? So, so now so what we have done is we have examined your why you're in your freeze flight, uh, fly, fight flight freeze response. We have identified stories from your past that are stopping you. We have tapped on those stories to disempower them. The next step then is to build a vision of where you want to go. So you would um, start with, I am powerful, for example. I know how to heal myself. I have these techniques. I have these support systems that I can use. And I, the person who felt that was a five-year-old and I don't have to feel that right now. So you can actually begin to bring that five-year-old, talk to her, understand what she needs to heal, and tap through that with her and then say, I am, I am the adult now. I'm going to take care of you. That story no longer has power. We are going to work through this. You don't need to act up every time I'm standing up and trying to sell my services or, or talk about what I can do for somebody else. You don't have to show up being afraid that you'll be made fun of because I am holding you. I'm here. I will always be here. And I always leave my clients with, I, I make them, after we do the tapping, I ask them to go inside. So like the, the body worker that I was talking about, we, we went in and we asked the eight-year-old, what would be something that you could do together that would make you feel seen and heard? Because what these little people are, at, the reason these little people inside us are acting up is because they're crying out to be healed, right? And so when we talk to them, and it is possible, I mean, you know, Richard Schwartz is the big uh, expert on on healing, uh, on this parts work, right? He's the person who discovered parts work. And um, he's got an audio book uh, that I would recommend everybody listen to um, and really understand how there are multiple parts within us who act up and prevent the their whole agenda is to keep you safe. So when you can teach the parts that they don't need to do that in order to keep you safe, that you now know how to keep yourself safe, they are able to take a back seat. There's also a really good episode, a Tim Ferriss uh, podcast episode, actually, where Richard Schwartz takes him through this parts process. And, and so you then talk to the, the five-year-old or the eight-year-old. You ask them, how can I make you feel that you are safe, that you are being heard? And often it is, just listen to me, you know, just acknowledge that I'm here. And they, they may say, I, I uh, you know, some, some of them have said, I'd like you to take me out for a walk. I'd like you to take me to the park. Um, this uh, eight year old said that, uh, let's go to like, you know, the, the shops that are organizing shops um, and say, um, and, and find ways in which to better organize the room. So, so that's what the eight-year-old wanted because her big thing was not being a slob, right? So, so, so there are, you never know what's going to come up, honestly, the, because you're letting that little person have full say in how he or she wants to be treated. And it is extremely important in order that you really heal that part of you, that you are that you are a reliable person for that part so that you keep your word that you do do the stuff that you said that she or he said needs to be done in order to heal as you do this work you'll begin to feel more and more complete in your body um, as you begin to feel more and more complete in your body you will reflect that 
light will shine out. You cannot help but shine. Once, once all these parts in you are healed, there is no way that people don't see that. There is, you almost will automatically attract the client that you need. So, so the biggest work, I loved what Ali said about, um, about how the business is not about grabbing, but it is about being the person, you know, it's almost as if the business should reflect who you are, the, your integrity, your morality, your sense of pride in yourself is what your business should be and it once you are there we, we are all um, works in progress and we are all at different levels of of the step ladder uh, that we are trying to climb but as we do this healing we do climb the steps and we do manage to get to levels that we had never thought possible in our lives I want to touch on something that is a little bit off um, from my golden nuggets. One of the um, ways in which we try to keep ourselves off, uh, keep ourselves safe, is by not taking the leap, right? When we when we want, we know that something we something has to change. Um, and there are all of these stories behind us telling us why it's not safe to, to take the leap. But until we take the leap, it is impossible to know that it is safe to take the leap. And so one of the ways in which you can do that, in which I would work with my clients to do that, is to do forward thinking tapping right so i for example for me right now i have taken the leap i just resigned earlier this month from a six-figure salary job and have nothing to to lean on but i took the leap because i knew that i was extremely unhappy with the with the industry that i was involved in i was involved in big pharma i i knew that that was not in integrity with who i am um i was just terrified because it is a it is a lot of money to let go but i i was able to both meditate and tap and tap into me the sense that it is safe for me to do this it is safe for me to do this and and it calm down those little parts of me that are saying oh my god oh my god who's going to take care of you <laughs> right <laughs> and and and, and she, i was able to hold her and and carry her and say no it's okay you're safe we've got all kinds of support around us so don't worry about it um so so th the way that you use these tools is not static it varies with where the client is and what, which level they're trying to step into. So, so, so you've 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 re rewritten the story. You have um, made yourself feel safe, whether it's about taking a leap or whether it's just about being comfortable standing up and 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 changing the way you appear in front of people. So there are so many ways in which the, this can be used. And then finally, you get to a place where you are able to envision one of the things that I, I became, I'm, I'm maybe rambling a little bit, but it's all to the, to the same point. Um, one of the fascinating things that that came up when I was working recently with with a client was, we uh, we were talking about we had done all of this work we, right we had disempowered old stories we had created new stories and then we wanted her to be comfortable with taking a really huge leap. So if if she's charging say five thousand dollars a course, we said okay, what if we said you're going to charge thirty thousand dollars a course? 
And what she said was my entire back collapsed. Like I, it was so frightening to say that, to even utter that out loud, that her, her, her physiology just completely reacted and stopped her, right? And what I realized was that we talk a lot, a lot about manifesting and, but if we are not, if our body is not ready to step into that space where we can charge 30,000 for a course, we are, we are going to find all kinds of ways to stop ourselves. So what we are doing then is what she is tapping on is tapping on getting comfortable saying I'm going to charge 30,000 for a course. And as she does that, and as her body and her physiology stops reacting to that, that is when she'll actually start charging $30,000. It may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but as long as you keep working on it and understanding how your body is reacting, as you say, and, and you notice that the reaction, it's becoming more and more a reality, right? When, you're, when your body feels comfortable in that space, then it actually becomes a manifestation. Yeah. So I think I'm going to, yeah, it's awesome, Sri. You're right. You're right. It's it's the it's also too from another perspective for those that may not understand the spiritual side and what you do. The other perspective is that is being confident of your value, yeah. right? Be confident of your value. Don't devalue your skills and experience because you feel I'm not worth thirty thousand dollars. How can I? You feel like in some part like I you're devaluing yourself. So have that confidence to confirm I'm worth $30,000 for this. Yeah. I'm going to make a difference in their life. I'm solving a massive problem that they have not been able to solve themselves. So that's how you have to look at it. And you're exactly right. So no matter what your thought process is, whether it's religion, spirituality, um, scientific, whatever it is, it all blends somewhat a lot together. Just like when you said you're talking to the five-year-old, look how Ali explained it, how I explained it, how you explained it. It's all the same, right? Learning how to go back to your childhood and release a, like a lot of trauma people deal with. And, and that's what I had to deal with too for years I had to do a lot of trauma work and I would go back to the child that I was and parent myself and hug myself and say, it's okay. You're going to be an amazing person. You're going to do great things and all of this stuff. And it, you won't believe how much it pulls back into your current existence and heals you. Yeah. It's just amazing. And that's how, that's why I believe so much in tapping and mirror work, just like Ali said. It's just amazing how all of you, and this is why I want all of you with me on this summit, because we are all intertwined in every belief, no matter if it's religion, spiritual, scientific, yeah. it's all to the same perspective and having a solid foundation of managing the five types of wealth to be the better person that we can be. I appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions before we take some time for lunch and come back and um and we get to hear Laura Ribbons? Any more questions? Just unmute yourself so I can grab it on the closed captions. So Sri, I know I've had sessions with you. You are amazing. And um I love all of the things that you shared. And um, we just kind of experienced a little bit of a session that you offer. It is just powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Cherie, how can people get in touch with you if they want to uh, meet with you and do a, a booking to learn a little bit more about how you can help them? So um, I think I've given you a link. If if not, my, my website is called freeingourselves.com. Uh, you can go uh, and um, on almost all of the pages, there is a link to my to my calendar and um, you can book an uh, it's an hour session, actually, and it, it's free and and we we go through what is stopping you, why, you know, how you can work through it. What are the programs that that I have that uh, that can help you uh, just that one hour actually 
can um, can give you a lot of clarity. So it's called Clarity Strategy Action Session. So um, yeah, um, and and Tina, I I want to take this uh, time to you, you've done an amazing job of bringing together uh, an amazing set of people. Um, this is invaluable. Um, so thank you. God bless you for doing thank this. Yeah, the vision. It's the vision. Yeah. Thank you. I know, I know, I, and I will say this, you know, many of you are on here today. At first you were like, what in the heck is she asking me to do? <laughs> but I saw the vision and we're all, you know, we all are entrepreneurs, but we are who we are, but we're seeing the, the side that is making us who we are to empower others to meet their full potential. Yes, we have, you know, our professional experiences that bring a lot of value to what we do, but this too is so others don't feel like, well, I'm not worthy enough. Just like you said, professional did not see the value of her $30,000 self. Yeah. Everybody yeah, feels and, like uh, that and they're not meeting that potential of who they really can be. Yeah. And, and what, what really struck me about that session was that I didn't realize how much when we talk about manifestation, how much we really need to focus in on how is our physiology reacting to this vision that we have. And if our physiology, if our body is not comfortable being in that future, we are not going to get to that future. So it's very important for us to recognize that and use techniques like tapping, visualization, meditation, and, and you know, bring that level of anxiety about being in that future down so that our bodies are comfortable being there right Once that happens i think we flow into that future yeah i call it the boomerang so when people say about manifesting again me and my analogies right yeah. <laughs> some people you start talking woo woo they're like but I use analogies. So like, how you know, about manifesting or whatever your beliefs are. And I, I love Dr. Joe Dispenza, who's a neuroscientist guy, and he talks a lot about it. And I call it the boomerang. What you say in your thoughts go out into the universe, but it's your emotions and your needs, you know, what, what you know that you want is what brings it back to you. So if yeah. you're with all these thoughts and these, in these, and you're talking and talking, but your emotions are not matching you're not ready. The universe is just, it's just going to sit out there and it's not going to give you what you desire until you can get rid of those walls and those boundaries and let that emotion truly sink in. So it can be given to you because the universe will give it to you. It will, you are an amazing person to be able to accept and receive from what you say and what you feel, let allow it to come in, but let that emotion match. And that's how the universe will give it to you once you're in that alignment. It's not going to give it to you until you're there. Just like you said about meeting the potential you want to be. Well, be the person you you look up to. And like Ali talks about, know the reason why. I'm a, I love Simon Sinek. He's a lot of the reasons why I'm sitting here today, listening to him and, and Sari taking that step coming out of corporate world and giving up that cushion six-figure salary. Because I, I just believe in myself this much and I took the jump and I took the leap and I just know there's the, it's the possibilities are endless when you truly love yourself unconditionally and are surrounded by some of the most amazing influential people like you guys. It's yeah. well worth it. So yeah, two things. One, I put my Calendly link in the in the chat. So, Perfect. so I will yeah. grab that too. Um, Thank and you. I'll be honest, I'm terrified. Right. I am terrified of, of the leap that I've taken. But the whole point of, of sharing that is that sometimes, like the saying says, you do have to take the leap and trust that the net will show up. And uh, I know for certain that God has pushed me. You know, I, I've shared this with some of you. My daughter was saying the other day that, uh, you know, sometimes God just says, you've been talking about this crap for so long. It's time for you to start doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have, you have that ability. Is there any more questions? And then we'll take like a 30 minute pause break to, for everybody to get something to eat, refresh, caffeinate, whatever you need to 
boost that energy and ramp it back up for Miss Physical. Let's get physical. Sorry, Laura. Physical. I can't help it. It's stuck in the head, girl. <laughs> Olivia Newton John, right? Let's get. And I can see the bandana and the whole nine yards. But any more questions? All right. Well, everybody, thank you. Get something to eat. I hope you come back and join us. We'll kick off with Laura. Laura does have a funny bone as well, uh, which I just absolutely love. She she is just a hoot. And she's she's definitely in the right body with all her physicalness. <laughs> and I appreciate her joining us. So have a good lunch, guys. I'll see you it's back. Fun. One it's fun. All right. Bye, guys. Hi. Hi. Thanks, everybody. Welcome back. Lunch is over. Y'all better be in your seats. I'm going to act like a teacher right now. In your seats, quiet, grab your pen <laughs> and your sense of humor. Here comes Dara Lee. Oh my God, Dara Lee's coming in. Um, everybody, I am so excited to bring in Laura. Uh, Laura, let me let a couple people in. And Laura, I cannot, as I keep saying, I keep that Olivia Newton-John song, let's get physical, physical, <laughs> I'm going to be a little cornball, but Laura has just as much of a sense of humor as I do, and she's in the right field on being very physical, and she owns a company in, in called Fitness Connection, and we have known each other for a few months now. And she is going to touch on the why and when of water, five pounds of fat, easiest way to drop. Oh, I'm excited for that one. Show us the fat. And then take the smart step. And as your personal wellness guide, Laura can help you meet your goals. So I'm excited to turn over the floor to Laura. Let me spotlight her for everyone. And Thanks. it is yours. Thank you, Gina. First of all, I just want to say so far today, and she, I just was on listening to Shri. I've done some sessions with her and it's, it's what she's talking about really does happen. So it's really your self-value and all that's really quite enlightening when you work with her. So one thing everyone needs to know about me is I'm pretty crazy, but also I have a huge passion for finding information and sharing it because it's an for those of you that know your profession and for me in health and wellness and coaching there it's endless education and i, I was going to share one thing and i went down talk listen to dr barbara o'neill last night and i was like oh my god this is even better this is great information so i'm gonna hopefully not to act too fast but i have tons of things to share with you i've got all my props here and we'll talk about this later as well so First of all, I'm going to talk about why water. So this is crazy. Okay. Now I'm only, I only had one bottle to show you, but I should, next time I think I'm going to have all what I'm going to talk about. So every day in 24 hours, us as adults lose this much water from our kidneys, one and a half liters, liters, quart, same thing, really one and a half liters, just from our kidneys, 0.3 from your colon. 0.2 water loss from your lungs and 0.5 water loss from your skin. So that is 2.5 liter loss over 24 hours, which is one of these and almost another whole one. So I know some of you in here do drink a lot of water. I do. I drink about six of these a day, but I've been enlightened about when I should drink water. So let's get to that next. So some people say, to give you a guideline, if someone who's fit, only weighed 50 pounds, like a child, let's say, they should have a good quart, one half liter, one a liter to one half liters a day. If they're 100 pounds, two quarts or two liters. What about if they're 200 pounds? Does that mean they have to have? No, Rome wasn't built in a day, so we can't be consuming water that much water in one day. So just like everything else, baby steps, baby steps, if you're terrible at drinking water, just start by sipping. When? When do you drink water? Well, if you're exercising, it's always before, during, and after exercise. So, so to, you know, it's not gulping down. It's just sipping water. 
Another cool thing I learned is we should be drinking water a half hour before our meal. Then we eat our meal. And here's the cool reason why. The first place, I, this is, blows my mind. The first place your body becomes dehydrated is in your stomach. So one glass of water a half hour before your meal will help thicken the mucus wall and the lining of your stomach. So when you go and eat your meal, everything can happen the way it's supposed to there without giving you a stomach ulcer. Um, those of you drink coffee, five glasses of water makes up the dehydration for one cup of coffee. Now I don't drink coffee. I've heard it's lovely, it smells great. But just to be thinking, five glasses of water, probably to here, that much water makes up the dehydration from one cup of coffee. Okay, so thinking you have to sip water throughout the day. And for those of you that are hooked at your desk, this is where my heart is aiming at the moment. For those that are spending a more than four to six hours sitting down, you know, you need to have that water there that you're constantly just sipping throughout the day. Um, okay, this is crazy. So now we know we need to have water half hour before our meal, but also drink at least almost two of these every day throughout the day. A lot of people say, no, I don't want to because I have to pee all the time or my ankles get swollen, my legs get swollen. That's just a message telling you that your cells aren't absorbing the water. So another new thing I started was Celtic salt is, is all hand process. So it's, it's a pure salt, it's got great minerals in it. So I carry around a little container and if I take, can't even taste it, one crystal of salt before I have my water, not table salt, Celtic salt. And, and if you can't find it, get Himalayan salt. They're both like handmade. That crystal in my mouth with water helps my cells open. That sodium helps my cells open so they can absorb the water. So now drinking water is a whole new meaning to me and hopefully for you too, that it's something that when I'm gonna go into next, why we need to be hydrated, but to, to our body's losing this much. And someone like you, Kim, that's doing triathletes and so forth, triathlons and marathons, and you know, we're losing that water, we need to replenish it. When? Little bits throughout the day, half hour before your meal to help sort of help the mucus lining of your um, stomach wall prepare itself to help digest the food well. Okay, everything from the neck up, this is 85% water. And from the neck down is 75% water for the hydrated individual. So this is scary. I'm only gonna talk about one part of you, your brain. So just be thinking the rest of your organs, how your body functions, how your gut is operating, all depends on you being hydrated and having good nutrients and so forth. But in today's world, where I see a lot of things happening that make me so sad, I really wonder how hydrated the individuals are just by this information alone. Your brain is highly dependent on water to function properly. So there's four things I'm gonna mention. Your brain tissue, 73%. Also fats, we're gonna talk about fats. Now. Your brain needs good fats. Brain tissue, 73% water. Healthy hydration ensures that the brain structure actually and its function actually happens. So what happens if it doesn't? The neurotransmitters in your brain, which are chemical messengers that enable the communication between your nerves. Don't you think that's important? Water is essential for the production of those neurotransmitters. And hence, if that's not happening, your whole cognitive ability, how you think, how you rationalize, how you react to things emotionally, if this isn't hydrated up in here, it's, you're going to be off kilter. Sleeping, sleeping quality increases when you're hydrated. And the last one's a huge kettle of warnings. So I'm just going to say what it, address the elephant in the room. And then I'll come back in another uh, presentation and talk about cortisol. But your stress re response, proper hydration supports the body's ability 
to cope with stress. And it regulates the stress hormone cortisol. So that cortisol level, for those who are familiar, can go up and down, it can throw us all over the place, but being hydrated can help, help balance that a little bit. And to give you an example of headaches, Barbara O'Neill was talking about her husband. He said, he called up one day and said, oh, I can't even, can't even drive the car. I just can't think straight. I have a huge migraine. And she's, her first question was, how much water have you had to drink? And he's like, I haven't had anything since before breakfast. So here's what he found. I'm going to tell you. She goes, start drinking water. After the first half the glass, because you just have to sip, then the migraine turned to a headache. And after the second half of a glass, he waited a half hour, the headache went to a dull ache. And after the third glass, there was no headache at all. Now, this chronically, this chronic dehydration was happening all day for him led up to his migraine. I'm not saying all headaches and migraines are because, because of uh, dehydration, but why not start there? And then if the headache still persists, you know, you move on. Okay, number two. If you said to me, I want to lose body fat, here's five pounds, by the way. And Tina, oh my gosh, 40 pounds, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. If you put all this in a big pile, you lost five pounds. Now, was it five pounds of fat? We don't know. I don't know unless I did some various testing with you then and now. But this five pounds of fat, unfortunately, can sit very uncomfortably amongst your organs and which can make your organs not function properly. Or maybe this five pounds of fat is all broken up throughout your whole body and it's helping you function properly because you're within a good range of body fat or maybe you have too much, you need to lose it. So I wanted to come up with something simple for you. Two things, usually lo losing fat means losing weight. If you want to lose weight, for heaven's sakes, start by getting rid of sugar and really cutting out all processed foods. Those would be my major guidelines. Now I'll go back to fat. A lot of you have all these Fitbits. I have an Apple Watch. Um, you can measure, but one pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So then I was like, okay, well, how many steps is that? For the average person, one mile, 2,000 steps, that's about 80 to 100 calories. So to lose one pound of fat on this average, you walk 35 miles. Oh my God, when can we fit that in? Or that equals 70,000 70, steps. But if you did 10,000 steps a day, there you go. There's your 70,000 steps or your 35 miles, depending on how you're measuring and you're stepping. So to get to start decreasing your body fat, if you feel you are over fat, you have too much fat stored in your body because this is proper fat is fuel. It's good for us. So if you say to yourself, oh, I really need to lose a couple pounds of fat as well as maybe some weight and you're not burning off that fuel because you know, it's a seesaw, excess energy, energy in, energy out. So if there's an imbalance, there's only 500. If you cut, if you cut 500 calories a day out of your diet, you're going to find your weight will start to go down. And there's all sorts of tricks of the trade to how you can modify your eating and so forth. And Daryl Lee is a great one coming up with great information on that. Um, so think about that easy way for you to get rid of fat. Just do 10,000 steps a day. You can do that as long as you have something to monitor it with. You can even do it on your phone. You could vacuum. You could dance. Put the music on. My goodness. There's so many. Or just get on one of these balls and jump around. There's so many different things we can do to get going. So we need water. We know how to get it into our cells by having salt. We are you know that we need to drink a lot. And then thirdly, as a personal fitness guide, as a swimming teacher, as a baby swim teacher, as a compassionate friend, as one that loves to help people show up how they want to show up. Um, I came across a really cool checklist. And on the seven day, you can all get the seven day on demand challenge, but the, and it's in the link. So the first link that's in there is actually a digital card. And that if you don't see the 
seven day challenge on there yet. It's being added at this moment. But the way the seven day challenge works, it's seven days of once you enter with the email of an email coming to you, it's free. Email coming to you. And the first day is what I want to explain. It's going to ask you to start because it works with mindset, nutrition, and with movement. This is a great checklist, and the acronym is SMART. So if I was to sit down and talk to you, or you were to talk to me and say, Laura, what are your goals? I would say, okay, S for specific. What exactly do I want to accomplish? Is it, it could be walking every day, or coming in relation to weight loss and health. Maybe I want to lose eight pounds, or maybe I want to um, gain two pounds of muscle and lose three pounds of fat, specific. Number two, measurable. Do I like going on the scale? Do I want to use a measuring tape or am I just going to feel how my clothes feel? Or do I stand in front of the mirror naked, jump up and down, decide like that, don't like that. Number three is actionable. What do you believe is required for you to accomplish this goal? So many of us, especially with January, just in the past, pick goals that are way, way too big. So what is, and, we, and pertaining to your overall wellness, what are the actionable goals? What do, you, what do you believe is required? Do you have to get up an hour earlier every day? Do you have to start, get let people in your house know what you're doing so they can support you? Um, do you have to do your shopping ahead of time? Do you have to pay someone to do your shopping? Do you have, is it easier for, for you to order meals that you know are good and clean eating and have them delivered? What do you need to do to make this happen? Yeah, put some comments in the chat for Laura. That's really interesting. The whole thing about the body jumping up and down. Okay, I chuckled <laughs> on that. I can't imagine myself doing that one. <laughs> and the next one is realistic. So can you do this by yourself or do you need help? So realistically, can you do it by yourself? Do you need help? And what's going to hold you back? And here's one that's, I think, so common with people is they put everyone else first before them. And then by the end of the day, like they, they don't have their time to go walking. They don't have their time to go train and go swimming. They don't have that time because um, they feel they need to be here. But um, I've done the Ironman a couple of times, which I love. And I know Kim has. And Kim, you'll probably agree with me when you're, when our specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time frame goal is to do this race over here, maybe just to complete it, maybe it's for time. You need you need to have a support system that so you can go train or go do your activity or, and not feel guilty. And I think many of us fall into that trap. So specific, what exactly do you want to accomplish? Measurable. Okay. What do you how are you going to be measuring that? Actionable, what do you believe is required? Realistic, can you do it even with help? And what might hold you back? And then time frame. When do you want to accomplish this by? Because then I think when you look at time frame, you know, if there's a wedding coming up, you want to lose 30 pounds and the wedding is in two weeks. Well, that's not going to happen safely and in health. So you are important enough to accomplish your goals and to, to decide where you want to be. It could be just feeling good. And so that's why with the seven on de seven day on demand challenge, I started thinking so much about people that are spending six hours sitting down. Do you guys realize, I know most of you are sitting down right now, but sitting down more than six hours a day increases your risk of heart disease and obesity by 64%. And there's another, I could go down the whole road of what happens to your health when you're flying all the time. Um, we already know about dehydra dehydration. That was just within, oh, speaking of dehydration, you do know that pharmaceuticals dehydrate you. So for those of you that take medication, pharmaceutical medication, just double check, see what the hydration uh repercussion could be because it might mean you need to really drink a little bit more water so with those specific goals i would love to know if you put in the comments i mean what are your goals what are you trying to accomplish 
And with all these areas of wealth, our health is our wealth. And as I put together the seven days, I touched on mindset, I touched on diet. There's a way to get the eat clean recipe book. There's um, an all about your movement. And movement can be anything, vacuuming, dancing. But one thing all of us should do when it comes to movement, and I'll finish with this, is what I call lymphatic shakedown. All the certifications I've done for years about teaching and personal training and medical assistant, and no one ever talked about the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system that runs throughout your body is your detoxification system. And it doesn't have a pump. So unless you're moving, like I can even bounce in a chair, say I'm in a wheelchair. I can just bounce in a wheelchair and get the lymphatic system going. I can also stand up. I can stand up and bounce. Come on, you guys, go ahead and stand up. I can bounce with my toes a little bit. I don't have to have any impact. You can pretend you're little and do la, 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 la. But just that standing up and moving and bouncing, trampoline, rebounder, what it does is it gets your lymphatic system going. So here's what makes me so sad. Every single person I know that has unfortunately dealt with cancer, the lymphatic system, I remember them saying, oh, I know, now it's in my lymph nodes, or now it's not in my lymph nodes. If everyone that was not well just took, said, who cares how silly I look? I'm going to bounce every day, a couple times every day. Our lymph lymphatic system is going to start functioning a little bit better. Part two of being sad. Kids don't bounce anymore. Most children have digital apparatuses. They're not playing as much. In school, they're not playing as much. They're taking away PE from some schools. So that natural childhood bounce up and down, playing, running, jumping, hopping, skipping. That's, I worry about their health. And that's just movement. That's not talking about their nutritional side of things. So hopefully that helped. Um, oh, Allie, I like your goals. Yep, strength training is super important. Oh, you take, Allie, salsa dancing and yoga, stretching and mobility work. It's all important. It used to be five components of physical fitness. You know, there's your fat composition, muscular strength, muscular endurance, cardiovascular endurance, um, and flexibility. We've added on to those balance, coordination, stability, you know, it's everything. And for anyone that's becoming chronologically superior, good way to say it, chronologically superior, then you can just get out there and start moving a little bit. It's going to help you. So mindset for uh, Tina, yes. Mindset is so important. Oh my gosh. Let me give you an example. Women, Ali, you can tell me what men do, but women are so unbelievable. We can sit in a car, look at our leg as we're driving to the gym and go, oh my God, if I can just slice off both sides of my leg, I'll be so much happier. And then you go work out, you get back in the car at the same hour and you go look at your leg and you go, oh, that's so much better. Nothing changed. Up here changed because you exercised. And people that don't want to exercise, you know, we get them into water fitness and they, they, their friend pulls them in and they finally get in there. And they realize, oh my gosh, this can be fun. We can laugh, we can move, and my body thanks me. So if you, or if you know anyone who is not in a good state of health, I would suggest, you suggest that they stop clowning around and instead put on their superhero outfit and just go get it done. <laughs> So I have many more things I could bring up, but I just chose only to bring these two for Tina's sake. <laughs> and if any of you have any questions. Yeah, definitely unmute yourself and ask Laura. Definitely. <laughs> Laura, I love your idea of using, this is Lisa Louise. Aloha. Hi, Hi Lisa. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, I'm wondering about adding electrolytes to water as opposed to just having a crystal of salt? You can do both electrolytes. Be careful what you pick. And depending on what you do, Lisa, I think we have to, 
We have to look at, you have to look at your, we're our own doctor, right? So look at yourself. What do you need? What's missing? And then try it. And then, okay. you know, if you go, whoa, this is cool. I mean, unfortunately, electrolytes got a bad name because, because Gatorade was attached to it. And that product itself is not a very healthy product. But if that was the only thing in the fridge and you needed electrolytes, you know, but great question. And I think, yeah, you get is, a look. Is it similar to salt? No. I actually don't know what they are. <laughs> you want, you want, well, he'll give you an example. Like in baby swim, I have to remind the parents that if they're under the age of 12 months, their blood supply is like, let's say this. And when they're 12 months, their blood supply increases. So under the age of 12 months, if they consume too much water, it will dilute their system and their organs and the electrolyte imbalance will go off kilter. So you yourself, if you've been sick, haven't been eating, you've got major chronic diarrhea, you're losing your fluids, that's when I would get some electrolytes and who cares if it's Gatorade, I'd put some in your body. You can also buy these other little tablets and use it. But our essential elements that we need besides oxygen and besides water is the next one is sodium. So we need to have good sodium in our body. And I was just listening this morning. What did Barbara say? So basically to open up that, open up the cell to let things in, you need to have, in order that that water to go in there, it's got to have a component of sodium with it. So I think it's so interesting how our bodies work. Thank you. That's helpful. Laura, what about mud water? You were talking about coffee. You don't drink coffee because it dehydrates. And I know a lot of other people I've talked to don't drink coffee. Have you heard of that stuff called mud water? It's supposed to smell and, and have like that same effect, but it's much, much healthier. What's your thoughts on that? I don't know it. And I'm not saying don't drink coffee. I'm just saying be aware that science has shown that it can dehydrate you worth of five cups. There's some great benefits of coffee. And as I've learning, learning, I'm, I have a cappuccino once in a while, but I love the smell. There is many different types. Like, you know what, Tina, actually answer your question with anything else. Look at the quality of what you're having. If I was to go have a coffee, I would I would pick probably somewhere I know has really good Blue Mountain Jamaican coffee, you know, because I know where it comes from. I know how it's made. And I don't know enough about coffee and the processing of it. Maybe some of you guys, other guys do. But um, I, think, I don't know about mud water. Okay. Yeah, I owned an espresso business. It was an espresso truck years ago. Um, so yeah, very familiar with how the beans are and what they do and the different variations of roasting them and things of that nature. So yeah, I know there's a lot of benefits of coffee, but it seems to get a lot of stigma with it too. And then this whole thing with this mud water, that's supposed to be much better for you. So I was just wondering if you had heard about it. Well, like, here's my, no, I haven't. Here's one thing I really suggest people do. I had a long discussion with someone about this yesterday, I think, or the day four, is Everyone is so different, but we have to listen to our bodies and people don't. Um, and to give you a quick little story, some of you already know it. Two weeks ago, I didn't, I came back from Las Vegas, taught and on Monday was a holiday and I taught a couple of private clients inside and went in the pool, got out of the pool and I was like, whoa, I had double vision. It was the first thing that came to my head. And I was super Double vision. I mean, I guess this is what it's like when people go trip on drugs, but it was like this. It was so bizarre. And I was like, okay, I got it. And then I, my legs, when I first started walking, didn't feel like they walked straight. Anyhow, I come inside and I'm goodbye to the client. I'm Googling double vision. I'm texting my doctor and texting my girlfriend. And then I thought I was going to get sick or have to sit in the toilet. So I went to sit in the toilet texting and my doctor texts back, can you please go to the hospital? And as the same moment as Google says, double vision, sign of a shot of having a stroke. I'm like, I have no time to have a stroke, let alone it's not my time to have a stroke. So bam, bam, bam. And then I'm thinking, I can't, I said, this is really scaring me to the doctor. I don't, don't have time to have a stroke. She goes, um, just get to the hospital. So 
thing to remember when going to the hospital, call ahead because, because I did, we had to drive like 45 minutes to the best hospital here for this kind of thing. They called the neurologist. So he'd be on his phones. It was a holiday ready to read what they found in the MRI. So I go rushing into an MRI. I feel great at this point. And I come back out. The doctor comes and says, yes, you have a little white line on your cerebellum. And that's a stroke. I don't know anything else until the next morning. So my girlfriend leaves. I have to stay there 24 hours in the hospital. My girlfriend leaves me and, my, and her husband. And from three o'clock in the afternoon until midnight, I was down a rabbit hole with research. What is a stroke? What does it mean? Um, why, 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 why? When the doctor came in the next morning, he knows me and he's like, oh God, you have a whole list of questions, don't you? And I said, yes. Anyhow, so what I found out was a stroke is a blockage. And yes, I had a stroke. So minuscule, it's ridiculous. The, when I was dizzy is when the blood couldn't go through this minuscule vein. And instead they went, oh God, it's blocked. Okay. And the blood went, found another way. So they're never going to use that little teeny vein again because now they found another way. And then I understood that it, in my case, he showed me my brain and I had to see all the pictures, of course. And that it's basically a scar when it happens. A TIA, if you know what those are, it's another kind of ischemic um, stroke, but they, they don't make any marks. So a stroke makes a mark. And then I could see my brain and see history of my brain. Like there's one little white mark over here, one little, anyhow. So for Laura Ribbons, I don't have to worry. Nothing was major. But what blew, what I went down a rabbit hole about after this is 98% of people don't go into the hospital or call the doctor when they have double vision. It's when something more severe happens later on and they're like, oh, I have been having that all along and I didn't bother calling. So people... So what does that tell me? All right, number one, people need to start listening to their bodies. How can I share my story to help people listen to their bodies and also question what it is rather than just go to the doctor and says, oh, you're, you know, you, you're one of your, you have a slip disc. Well, which one, why is it slip? You know, get as much information as possible. The other good news with blood tests is you can find out so much. So for me, I take, I was just telling Kim, I have all sorts of great supplements, but what I've added to my supplement list is my B12 was down and my magnesium was down. So all these things by knowing your body, but by getting a proper checkup, by getting your blood done, you guys, by taking your blood pressure, um, why after eating a steak and having a glass of red wine does my blood pressure go up? Okay, because those are two things I shouldn't be having. Um, that's me. Um, uric acid goes up, makes blood pressure go up, you know, so forth and so on. So I am very plant-based anyhow. But the funny part is, of course, is that people that know me really well were like, oh my gosh, if you had a stroke, I'm doomed <laughs> because they're not, they're not exercising at all. And I think it's not about that. You know, I can say the word now. Two weeks ago, I can say the word. I was too scary. I was like, it's got to be another word besides stroke that I can talk about because it, it meant something so big to me because of other things I've heard. But then when I started finding out, it's like a heart attack in your brain. Mine was like a little teeny thing. Some people have big ones. But the moral of the story is, you guys, you have to. OK, I'll go back. Stop planning around about your health and just I mean, have fun with your health, but stop planning around. Put on your superhero powers and start making one baby step at a time. One little baby step, maybe today is just water. The purpose of the set, some people that did the seven day challenge, it was only about awareness. They weren't trying to, it wasn't about them doing everything to lose weight for that seven days. It was about just awareness. And that's what this is so cool about this summit is all these different areas of wealth that will make us who we wanna be. You are so right. Wow. That is so true. So remember guys, write it down. We don't have time. We don't have time for a stroke. We have to hold that down. <laughs> you cannot put that on your calendar. Death, taxes, no time for a stroke. Exactly. Yeah. That's funny that you say, I don't have time for this. 
I mean, my mom is 95, 96, 95. She just turned out of the 95, 96. Very active, but she has a routine. She does, like, you know, just like us with marketing and whatever we're doing, you've got to have consistency to get any results. And so she has a routine she does every single morning, and it includes mindset, includes nutrition, includes movement, and movement's non negotiable. Right. And Ali, we now have a new superhero in our team. Oh, yeah, I, can, I must get my other outfits out. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions for Laura? I have a, an observation here because Lisa had asked about salt. And being in Hawaii, I mean, the thing I noticed about Hawaii is they, you, there's so much salt. They Everything is salty, salty, salty. So I think that they figured out that that's what they need to stay hydrated is they need salt. I mean, salt on foods. Yeah. They, there's a lot of salt in their food. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not necessary because probably table salt, unfortunately, but um, which is. No, it's sea salt. Oh, it is sea salt. It's sea salt. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a good, you know, there's having some and having too much. But another thing I was listening to about people putting salt on foods, you know, before you know it, the, you're not even feeling, you know, tasting the food anymore um and some foods some foods you I mean in hawaii you have hopefully a lot of fresh produce and grand cayman i i grow all mine on a tower or i buy frozen because the fresh produce is already has no nutrients after 48 hours anyhow and everything gets either shipped here or it's grown and soil that i can't quite don't quite know if they're using roundup or not you know so, yeah, I saw we just got to watch our salt, Julia, but yeah. And so it, do, it does matter where you live, too. Wow. And how long have you been? How long have you been in? I'm, I'm assuming your whole life. How long? What got you into the physical fitness components of teaching people about wealth and coaching them on it? Well, I used to teach school and taught, had a blast, taught phys ed as well as all the other subjects. And when I get when I came to Grand Cayman, I was teaching diving and then started with aerobics, you know, uh, jazzercise, the rest of it and exercise and leading, you know, people just had fun. Um, so big people, little humans and big humans with um, exercise and then Ironman marathons. And my, I actually live where I work. So it's a duplex. I live in one half and my gym and the swimming pool are in the other half. Oh, wow. Nice. Nice. And that is a definition of loving what you do and being the definition of the and living where you work. Oh yeah, my God. There, there are definitely pros and cons. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Gosh. Wow. Anybody else have any questions? This has been, you taught me a whole lot. I mean, Celtic salt. Now, What's the difference between that? Because for the longest time, the pink Himalayan salt people would say, what's the difference between the two? Well, Himalayan, it's just a, it's just a higher quality, but it's how they're, they're both hand done, Himalayan and Celtic salt. Oh. Okay. So, whereas, um, and they have the mineral blend in it with um, table salt is another whole conversation, but it's frightening what happens in table salt. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have any more of it. Yeah, I know table salt has like been out of my existence for a long, long time. But well, I going back to uh we're talking when Lisa was talking about electrolytes. What's really interesting, and this is where I had my mindset had to change. Like this little thing of Celtic salt, it's gonna last me for a long time. But in US dollars, this is probably $16. You can get table salt for probably a dollar or something, a big thing. So Unless someone is educated on what to do, it's just like having, I love where I live and everything, but the water that comes through my pipes, I do not drink, I'll buy bottled water. So bottled water costs a lot of money here. Um, I think you just have, to, I think my nutrition and my health first, and then I buy the product that's going to take care of that rather than going with processed or, you know, cheapening what I should be giving myself. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And can you talk a lot about like we were before we even came on recording, we were touching base on like how beneficial Juice Plus is. And now they have other alternatives that we do. What is your thoughts on the Juice Plus when people can't get all their veggies in? Or fruits and I've been working, I partnered with that company about 12 years ago. Ah. The coolest thing, number one, it it, it is the most research company out there. But the coolest thing is triathletes, Kim can tell you. When I did the Ironman, I lived on it. Um, I, oh, I haven't been off it. If I miss a day, I know. But I take all the megas, the, so brain fog, everything. They, everything's plant-based. So I skip the fish. And um, they also make, make the tower gardens. So that's why we have the tower. We're trying to get them in all the schools. So I know it's, and they have vegan capsules. So I know I'm getting Juice Plus, the normal dose. For adults, kids have gummies or I take two capsules of everything. That's eight capsules a day. I'm not going to spend energy on, oh, I have to take eight capsules. Just open my flipping mouth and put it in. If I wanted to, I could empty them in a blender, but then you have to make sure you get everything in there. Anyhow, it's bridging the gap between what I should be getting and what I'm not getting. Correct. In 1954, one cup of spinach was superfood, had everything in it. 1954. In 19, I'm um, in 2001, you needed 70, it's probably gone up since then, you need 72 cups of spinach to equal one cup of back then because of the soil, the environment, how we're growing. Oh, yeah. So little kids, parents literally walk in the door here and they say, I'm sick and tired of my kid being sick and tired. Give me that stuff. And their kids are no longer sick and tired. It builds their immune system. During our challenge with those those twenty those two years, I doubled up every single day, and on every because it's just food, right? So it's not going to hurt me. And if the kids got in, here's the coolest part: if the kid opened a bag of Juice Plus gummies and ate the whole thing, they would only be bloated. You would not have to call nine one one. Whereas if you get the Pebbles chewables, it says call nine one one if they eat the whole thing. It's just food. So I think that you have to, Juice Plus is a great example. There's some other ones out there that offer, you just have to look at the ingredients. If the ingredients are like, Daryl is the one that get, set this guideline for me and I share this and she's coming up, she's awesome. If you look at all the ingredients and you don't understand anything that's said, that's being said there, it's probably a super processed. But if the first ingredient is slippery elm, which coats your stomach, by the way, great stuff. And, um, you know, it's things you recognize, raspberries, strawberries. Um, the only thing they add in the gummies for Juice Plus is um, pure cane uh, tapioca sugar. So everything's pure. I mean, look at sugar. When the U.S. changed the whole sugar issue, kids age three have diabetes. In South America, they don't have any diabetes because they're still on cane sugar. So we, this is huge. We can go down a huge rabbit hole. But I think it's important to look at our bodies and the resource that are people here Oh my gosh, for every avenue of our wealth, everyone is here to share. Yeah, very much. Gosh, thank you, Laura, for all that valuable information. I know I definitely took out, uh, took a lot of good insight into this. Thank you for your time and your laughter. And it's it's just been very in, in, informative for us. Thank you very much. And you get back at your dancing and your swimming and we look forward. If you can hang around, we would love for you to stay with us. Uh, You'll see me here in and out. I don't have to go to the pool for a while, so I'm good. Oh, good, good. Well, thank I'm looking you, forward thank to you it. so much. Thanks for taking your time out today, and I so much enjoyed it. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Awesome to get to know you. And our next speaker uh, is my little cohort. Not only are we in the same like mine, we live just not too far from each other. And Janet and I um, collaborate a lot together on the F word, you know, not that word, the financials. So we do do that. And I'm uh, so honored to have her join us. She owns a company um, called Excel with me. She's in training and consulting. And even though we're a lot alike, we are different in a lot of ways. I love that Janet also does training on what she does. She trains a lot of small business uh, people on optimizing the same philosophy, right? It takes a village. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is the truth. She's going to talk about how to optimize expense and income tracking, how to embrace the profit 
first principles in your business and understanding key performance indicators. Now that's, if you've ever heard me say KPIs, that's what I call the thermometer. So I simply you get into that one more than me. Yeah, I can <laughs> call it the thermometer because you wouldn't believe how many companies don't really manage their KPIs correctly with invalid reporting. So I am so excited to have you. I will share the freebie in just a minute. But Janet, I'm going to spotlight you and let you take the floor. Thank you. Right. Well, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'm going to see if I can get the right screen because I've migrated up to four screens now. And sometimes it's a little fun to figure out which screen's which. But that's okay. We're going to see if we can get to it. And let's see. Did it work? Did it not work? Who knows? What's going on? Well, maybe. Did it work, Tina? Yep. I see you. All right. I can't see me, but that's okay. We don't need to see. <laughs> but I've got to figure out where it put the slideshow so that I can control moving it forward. You got to love it. You know, technology. How many of you guys in technology find it just a smidgen frustrating at times <laughs> as you're going through? You know, like, but if you think about it as entrepreneurs, that's our life. As parents, that's our life. As just general, that's our life. Things never seem to go right. I don't know about you, but I have the best laid plans when I get up in the morning. They don't always happen. <laughs> They absolutely do not always happen. And I am still trying to chase down my thing because that would be really helpful if I could find the screen so that I can extend it. But you know what? We'll just go with it. Did it switch over to roller coaster? Plan B, C, D. I don't even know what I'm on at this point. Yeah, I cannot see us. So that's okay. We're just going to roll with it and go anyhow. So I'm going to take a minute and we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, well, you think about money. Money's not always fun. But it's one of those necessary things that we want to enjoy our life. We want to kind of do some things. We want to spoil our grandkids. We want to spoil our kids. We want to spoil our family, friends, whatever. It kind of is one of those things that's kind of important. So what I have found is it's like a roller coaster, especially when it comes to your business. Now, I'm going to slant this towards business, but keep in mind anything that I'm referring to today, and I'll bring it back into play for personal as well. It's, it works both ways. So what I'm going to talk about and I'm going to focus in on is the roller coaster of your business. The ups, the downs, the overs, the unders, the loop de loos and everything else. Because one minute in comes up, one minute in comes down. Expenses are over here, expenses are here. And all you're doing by four, you know it, is you're hanging on for dear life because money is flowing out faster than it's coming in. It doesn't matter if it's business or personal. I'm going to guess a couple of you here today can probably relate to that. So as you're thinking about this and you're talking, and we're talking a little bit about money, which one are you? Which one are you? Are you enjoying it? Are you hanging on for dear life? Are you screaming because you're loving it? Or are you a little terrified because you're just not quite sure how you're going to pay that next bill? If you're in business, are you getting a paycheck? Some things to think about. Life is a roller coaster. I think that much is pretty certain. Life is a roller coaster. We never know what's coming when we're talking about life. And that's okay. That kind of makes it kind of fun, makes it kind of crazy. One never knows. But as you're thinking about this and you're going through this, that roller coaster that you're on, are you enjoying the ride? And I think that filters us back over onto this whole thing that we're here today. And Tina, I'm so grateful to be a part of this because, you know, it is all five areas. All five areas intertwine together to make us who we are. And we've got to strengthen all parts of that, not just one, but all parts. And that's what makes this group so special and so spectacular And this group that is here together. I think it was Kim said the synergies are just amazing. And they are because we all complement one another. And it does take a village. So where are you on this lovely roller coaster that's called life? So as we're kind of going from there, what should you be thinking about? It? And I'm going to slant this down to two numbers in particular, because whether we like it or not, we're going to deal with numbers today. And I'm going to try to make numbers fun. I am a little crazy. It's okay. Tina can agree, but it's all good. We're going to focus in on two specific numbers to help get your hands around not being so stressed when it comes to money. So what do you think those numbers are? I can't read the chat because I still can't find us. So that's okay. If you had to pick two numbers, we're going to make this super, super simple. What two numbers do you think we got to focus in on? 
What do you think? Do you ever shout it out because I can't find it? <laughs> I can't see the chat to you, so you have to read them. So what do you think? What two numbers? Yeah. Can when you we're dealing with money, yeah. do we've got to figure out. Anybody? It's after lunch. Everybody's sleeping. No comments. They really are sleeping. Everybody's got full tummies, half asleep. We didn't have enough water, Laura. We did not yeah. have enough water. We gotta get some more hydration going on. Can you hear people are commenting? Janet, can you hear? Yeah. Me? Okay. Yep. So we've got in the chat income and expenses is from Lisa Louise. Ali said money in and money out. And Laura said income and investments. And of course, Laura made us well know that I love money and welcome it, but yes, not always know when it's coming. Perfect. Perfect. You guys got it. We're going to take this down to simple. How about that? Two numbers, income and expenses, money in, money out. You guys are absolutely right. That's exactly what we're going to focus in on. So how can we do that? How can we do that? Because you're on this ride. You're hanging on. Are you hanging on for dear life? Are you holding on because you're enjoying the ride? Or are you just holding on because you're hoping it's going to end really, really fast and you just don't have any idea what's going to happen when you go over that loop to loop? I'm also from the North. I talk pretty fast, but that's okay. Are you really enjoying the ride? I had to put the grandbaby in here. What, what can I say here? She was out on, she is out on the retro version of the stroller, having a wonderful time with Pap as they're going for a lovely walk. She was the talk of the neighborhood. And the best part is that was the stroller that I had when I was a baby. So we had no idea. My dad actually kept it. And there you are. You know what? She is enjoying her ride. They had a blast. The whole neighborhood had a blast as they were going for that walk. They enjoyed the ride. I found myself, oh, I guess it's been about eight years ago, not so much enjoying the ride. I was in corporate America, had been in corporate America for 20 plus five years, okay, lots of years. And I had been in oil and gas and banking, spent most of that time in accounting and payroll. My last position that I left, we have 1,100 employees in three states. I don't miss payroll at all. But with that happening and thinking that I wasn't enjoying my ride. And here's what I found. It took a little bit. We moved. We moved from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. I had the opportunity to step away from corporate world. Thank you, Lord. Walked away from it and really thought, okay, we can do this. This is going to be okay. I Because I, I'm not enjoying this ride anymore. Because it's 70 hour work weeks, not uncommon. January, February, never saw my family because 70 hours were kind of short for those that particular time frame. Anybody in finances can probably relate to that one. January and February are like the worst months. I wasn't enjoying that ride anymore. But what I found is, guess what? My health wasn't enjoying that ride either. And it took stepping back for me to start listening. And I think folks have been saying that. Are you listening to your body? I needed a two by four. I needed the two by four. Ended up, shortly after we got down here, I got slapped upside the head all right. And I ended up in ICU with bleeding ulcers. Mm. Not the way you want to spend the one trip up to Pennsylvania that you had actually planned. <laughs> I ended up in ICU. Why? And they're like, oh, it's probably bacteria. I'm like, no, it's stress. They're like, oh, it's really uncommon. No, it's stress. <laughs> the Lord had opened my eyes. It had been stress. And it took a dog on two by four to wake me up. I wasn't enjoying the ride. That's not how I want to live life. That's not who I am. I wasn't even smiling anymore. That's not who I am. And that's not what I want to do. So I want you to be able to enjoy the ride. It's life. Why not enjoy it? Well, we can. Let's take some steps. So let's slide this back. We talked about our health. We talked about wellness and we're starting to kind of well round this out. So let's start looking at the wealth side of it, the money side of it. So what can we do? Let me ask you a question. Are you proactive or reactive when it comes to money? What do you think? Are you proactive or are you reactive? And my guess is yes. Because <laughs> there's times that we are reactive and we have to be. But if we can learn to sway that and switch more of the reactive reactions to being a proactive approach, Think about what difference that would make. Think about what the difference in the stress level that would be if you focus in on 
the proactive side. And that's what I want to take a few minutes. And that's kind of where I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about and get you thinking about what we can do. How can we be proactive when it comes to money management and to making sure money in and money out is kind of at least corralled or at least known? Those types of things. So that's what I want to encourage you today. Fair enough. So let's get started because when it comes to money, you want to be proactive. I don't want to be stressed out. I don't want to have to figure out where I'm going to come up with because I don't know about you. I have not figured out how not to pay taxes. Well, I could lose money. But wait a minute, let's think about this. Is taxes such a bad thing? If I have to pay taxes, that means I made money. That means I'm profitable. That means I probably got a paycheck. That's not such a bad thing. When I'm coming to my business, thinking about that, okay, fine. We're working our way through this. We're kind of figuring out the direction that we're going in. What if you have a vacation coming up? Would it be nice to have that vacation already paid for before you step foot? onto the cruise, onto the, maybe we're coming to visit. Laura, can we come visit you in the Grand Caymans? Uh, Julia, you were Hawaii, right? Can we come visit? Mm -hmm. If you have that on the books, would it be not nice to make sure that you have all of that taken care of? The only way you can do that is to be proactive. You've got to be proactive when you're dealing with this stuff. So that's what I really want to encourage. So I'm going to sway this a little bit back to business, but keep in mind, it works just with your own personal budget as well. So I've always heard, as I started networking, I knew not a soul when I came from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. My husband is a truck driver. He had been transferred. That's fabulous. Here we are, I know nobody. And I started networking. And I had to get to know people because I honestly thought I also do Mary Kay. And I honestly thought I was finally going to become a director after 20 years. The Lord had other ideas, but that's okay. We kept working our way through it and found out that these people that I was networking with, that I was becoming friends with, struggled with something that was second nature to me. As I said, I'm weird, I'm crazy, I'm nuts. I'm in the finance world. Numbers come easy to me, but that wasn't the case for most. They'd start talking about, you know, I'm networking with these folks and they're like, they didn't know how they were going to pay their tax bill. Wait a minute, what do you mean you don't know how you're paying your tax bill? Well, I didn't quite understand because I was raised from a dad who was extremely proactive. They grew up in the depression. There was a 20 year gap with us. That's a whole nother story for another day. I wasn't even supposed to be here, but you know, Lord does have a very cool sense of humor sometimes. And here I am. And now you guys are stuck with me as well, but that's okay. We're going to have fun and enjoy because we need to enjoy the ride that we're on. So as I was talking to these networking folks, they were stressing. They weren't sure how they're going to pay the bills. They weren't sure how they're going to do this. And I'm like, well, why are you not setting it aside? That to me made sense. I know in Pennsylvania, it was nothing for us to have a $2,300 oil bill to be able to fill up our oil tanks. Why? Because we put three tanks in so that we could make all winter. Because it was much cheaper to fill up in the summer than it was to fill up halfway through the winter. The price was like doubled. But that meant we had three tanks. The first time I filled this up, my husband was like paranoid because he's like, what are we going to do? Because he came from a family who was reactive. They weren't sure how they were going to pay that bill. They had to just scramble and figure it out. Where in my family, my dad's like, okay, if it's going to be $2,400, that's $200 a month. You start now. And you start putting that back. So when it comes around to needing that money, it's there. And I want to encourage you to do that same thing for your personal side, as well as your business, especially. So as I'm networking with these folks and getting to know them, I always heard this. So I don't know if you guys have heard this or not, but this is what they were always saying. If only I could get to $100,000. Anybody hear that? That's what they were saying. If only I can get to $100,000, it'll all be okay. And I'm like, $100,000 in revenue will solve everything. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. So let's think about this. You have $100,000 in revenue coming in. You have 120,000 of expenses, or you have 70,000 of expenses. Who's enjoying the ride now, left or right, when you're thinking about that? Same 100,000 to get started. Which side of the equation are you on? Which side of the equation is that business on? Or yeah, what can you be doing? Back to the proactive versus reactive, because if you actually do the math on that, One's in a lot better position than the other. One lost money. One gained money. 
one's going to be a lot more stressed than the other when that tax bill comes. Because unless you found a way around it, I have not figured out how to not have taxes due at April 15th. Haven't figured it out yet, unless you're not making money. That's not necessarily the direction that we want to go either. Because if you're in business, your business should support your lifestyle. Otherwise, it's called a hobby. But just a thought, just something to be considering about. But thinking about that. So as we're talking about this, how can we be proactive? Going back to the income and those expenses. How are we going to do this? What are we going to do? How are we going to put all of this together? Because I don't know, as I'm talking to folks, I'm talking like 100 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, they're glazing over because I'm talking income expense. I got a sneaky suspicion. You can probably relate. And if it's not you, probably someone that you know. You gloss, gloss over when it comes because you pretty much have a big puzzle piece in front of you. The problem is all of the puzzle pieces are in front of you that you've got to figure out how to put all of this together. But you don't have the picture on the front of the box to even know where you're going. That's a problem. That's a major problem. And that all too often is what I found as I was talking to these folks, networking with them. They were trying to put the pieces together. I had no idea what direction they were going in. One of the key things in business is you've got to have those goals set. You, you got to know what direction you're going in. And if you don't actually find a way to track your numbers, you can have all the best goals out in front of you and you can be throwing darts all day long. But if you don't figure out what is going on, guess what? You're throwing darts, you're blindfolded, and you don't even realize that your dartboard's behind you. That happens all too often when it comes to money management. Just not sure. There's no steps in place. How do we do this? What do we do? How do we dump all of these puzzle pieces out and figure out what's on the front of the box to get us where we need to go? We want to get our hands around the money, the money management, figuring all these pieces out. So how do we do that? We do it with a system. A system is your best friend. A system can be overwhelming. It can be, yeah, I will never say easy. It can be simple though. So I want you to consider this system. Is it worth putting a system in place? S-Y-S-T-E-M. Save yourself some time, energy, and money. So now let me ask you again, is a system worth it? If the answer is yes, I'm ready to save yourself some time, energy, and money, then let's figure out a system that is simple. I will never say easy when it comes to money. I will never say easy when it comes to numbers, but it can be simple. So what does a system have to do for you? The first thing is you got to be able to track everything. Like it or not, we've got to find a simple way to track our numbers. We at least got to get to that income and expenses because once we get to that, then we can start figuring out what's going on. Then we can start seeing, are we making it towards our goals? Are we actually on target for our goals? Or are we on left field going because the dartboard's behind us? By looking and tracking this stuff, now we can start seeing what's going on. Because once we get that system in place that's going to track these numbers, we can get reports that guess what? We can start saying, okay, here's the past, here's what happened, here's where I want to go, and now all of a sudden I'm starting to get a treasure map, a map that's going to show me how to get to that treasure that I'm looking to get to, to the end result, to the goals, to that dartboard, to that bullseye, whatever you want to call it. Once you start doing this and you get the right system in place, you can do that. Because of course we're on that roller coaster. Are you holding on for dear life? Or are you enjoying the ride? It is possible. So here's one tip that I'm going to really focus in on. And I just want to give you an idea of what this is all about. Some of you may or may not have heard about it. I personally use to track my stuff. I personally use QuickBooks. I am actually a pro advisor with QuickBooks and have helped quite a few clients to be able to start tracking that. We utilize the system and tools in front of us. And I make sure that they're utilizing what they have already there, but they're not just using 10% of it. They're using all of it. Take advantage of the tools that you have in front of you to get the system in place to do it. So I'm just gonna cover a little bit of Profit First. What is the concept of Profit First, especially when it comes to your business? But it holds true as well on the personal side. It is based upon uh, the concepts and principles within Mike McCallowitz Profit First 
book. So I don't know if anybody read it. Normally I'd say raise your hand. I can't see them. So we'll just go with it. You can raise your hands. And okay, everybody heard that. What is he saying? Most folks say revenue minus expenses or income minus expenses is your profits. That's the normal concept. So basically what's left over? He decided to turn that on its head and say, no, wait a minute. When you're talking about business and you're talking about your business as an entrepreneur, should that business not support your lifestyle? And the answer is yes, it should. So he said, no, we're not going to do it that way because you got to make sure you pay yourself first. One of the crazy things that I was talking to a lot of these business owners as I'm learning and I'm networking, I'm building relationships, is they forgot to pay them because I think this has come up before. We forget to take care of us. We take care of everybody else that we never get back to us. Same concept happens in the business. Very often you pay everything else because you're just hanging on for dear life, but you're not paying yourself first. And that's not what we want to get. So this concept is a little different. He wants you to pay yourself first. So what does that mean? What in creation does that mean? So as we're looking at that, it kind of turns the concept on its head. It says, okay, sales minus profit equals expenses. Same numbers, different order, different roadmap. So it's setting you up to make sure that you get your hands around your finances, around your money, around understanding, so that your business truly does support your lifestyle. So talking about that, very often, though, when I start talking about this thing, this is what, especially if I start talking QuickBooks, oh boy, what I find is everybody's like, oh, oh it's just, it's too crazy. It's too much. It's overwhelming. I'm going to guess probably you've heard this before as well but it doesn't have to be. There are simple ways to do it. One of the advantage and probably what it makes work with me so very, very different is the fact that when I was in corporate America, we actually, I got the privilege. <laughs> we had eight mergers at the bank, eight companies that we absorbed. I happened to be the payroll manager for five of those. Funny thing, we had to figure out how to work together. Because bottom line is they needed paid, they wanted paid, and I needed to figure out how to get them paid, but now they had to conform to our system. I happened to be on their side that was acquiring the banks. It was quite an interesting fiasco many days because most of the time the two didn't mesh. And it was pretty crazy. But by learning how to mesh those systems together, it gave me a unique perspective, a perspective that I now can take to the small business owner and say, okay, here's the systems that I've used in the past. I know, Tina, you, you've probably got me beat on several of these systems. You've created quite a few of them. You need to get a system that's simple to streamline the processes to be able to make everything work together and not land in that position. So that's what we're going to talk about. So if we kind of do this and this overwhelming thing, and I always ask folks, how do you eat an elephant? Anybody have that answer? How do you eat an elephant? Anybody shout out? One bite at a time. Perfect. Awesome. You're absolutely correct. I'm not sure who that was, but thank you. One bite at a time. That's exactly how you eat an elephant. So we're going to take the first bite. We're just going to take a first bite out of that. And the profit first concept, he takes into consideration the habits of humans. <laughs> Last I checked, we're all human. And it's a fact of life. And he said, okay, we got some habits. So why don't we leverage them? And the first one that we want to leverage is bank balance accounting. So what in the world is bank balance accounting? I'm not sure about you, but most of you probably have a phone. And I often saw business owners when something came up, they're like, okay, let me see if I can do this or not. They pick up their phone, they log into the bank account, they look at the balance of their bank account, and they make the determination of whether or not they can do something. You don't have to admit anything. No judgment. But is that reactive? are proactive to do that. Think about that for a minute. As you're thinking about that, how do we do that? Well, that is bank balance accounting. It is what it is. So how can we start working around that? How can we start figuring out what we can do, what direction we can go? And my husband was good about that. We were, we had just gotten married. I was used to being monthly payment because I worked at the college while I was in college and work study and stuff. So I got paid once a month. He got paid once a week. Well, when we got married, he got paid twice a week. I was still in a monthly cycle, so that 
kind of worked for me. So we did the Dave Ramsey version. Remember envelope systems? Kind of same concept here. We have the envelope system. <laughs> so I stuck all the money in for the month and then I was sent for training to Oklahoma. So I left Pennsylvania for two and a half weeks. And I left him the monthly allotment because, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. We, have, we got everything set up. I had him covered. Two weeks into it, I get a phone call. How much can I take out of my next paycheck? Wait, what, what are you talking about? Well, I'm not sure about you, but I learned very quickly. I had to figure out a better communication style. <laughs> he had spent the entire month on one trip to Sam's Club. He was looking for his next installment. So he had done that on about day three that I had left. He scrounged the entire rest of the two weeks. The only problem is now he took the entire month allotment. So what do you do? So how I handled that going forward, I got two sets of envelopes, but that's another story. But thinking about that, bank balance account, at least in envelopes, when the cash was done, you were done. Now we have credit cards. Now we have ACHs. Now we have all of this other technology, <laughs> credit cards, credit lines, lines of credit, all of this stuff that all work together. Is your envelope empty or not? It's a little harder to tell. But talking about that, so that's not proactive. That's reactive. So the first thing it talks about is we've got to get some creative accounting here. What does that mean? Not really creative. It's pretty simple. Remember, I won't say it's easy. You create some separate accounts. So if your habit is that you're going to look at that bank balance and make a determination, let's move the money out and be proactive. Just as I said, oil is $2,400. It's $200 a month. If I start chunking $200 back a month, it's much easier when that bill comes due to just write the check. But I have to move it out of the account so we weren't tempted. I had to actually ban my husband from looking at the checking account because the discipline wasn't quite there. So we, we, we learned to work through it, but you move it out. And I always say I have a little golden piggy because your little golden piggy has the money in it so that you don't have to be stressed and reactive when things that you know about are coming due. So that's one of the concepts in the profit first. So how can you apply that to your business and even your personal side? So in the profit first concept, he says, okay, all your money comes in. Then you just delegate it out. You move it over to the piggy banks. You move them over there. I'm going to just talk about four of them. This is on the business side, owner's pay, profit, taxes, and of course your expenses. So now, no matter what comes in, you go from there. And Hammy is here representing our piggy bank. This is Hammy. He is actually uh, the pig that is on my book, Money Doesn't Spend Itself, So Where Did It Go? And Hammy helps you turn your Hamiltons into Benjamins. So he's here to help us today to do that. So we take our income and we split it out. Notice you haven't spent anything yet. That's the concept. So how do we split it out? Well, we pick target percentages. And that is just basically saying, okay, for every dollar that comes in, how much am I going to allocate out? And it's just a mathematic. So we're going to take the emotion out of it so that we can be proactive and not reactive when it comes to our money. So by doing that, if you allocate based upon these percentages, you can see that if you have $1,000 that came in, it would divvy out to different buckets. So now when you actually look at your bank account, if you've allocated it out on two separate occasions throughout the month, just regularly allocate it. When you do your bank balance accounting, that $1,000, there was only 400 of that thousand that was left into your operating account. So when you look at your bank balance and you see that $400, you're going to make a better educated decision using a habit that you already have. So thinking about that, does that kind of make sense? I can assume head nods here. As I said, it's a little struggle since I have not found you guys yet, but that's okay. But all too often, this gets so overwhelming and it gets a little crazy. You end up terrified and scared. And all of a sudden you start shrinking back and not being proactive anymore. That was a little child that I brought home. His name is Bear. He was had a little rough life. Tina, you mentioned some things. He, he had an abusive life before he came to join us. And he just wasn't sure how to handle that stuff. But it's amazing when you get the support that you, from this group, from the folks around you, from the village that encircles you, what a difference that can make. And you get a good system in place 
that helps you to guide you and actually starts working through all of this. Get that system, a simple system. And when you do that, think about the possibilities. Think about what a difference it'll make being proactive and not reactive when it comes to your money. You turn into a pretty confident. You turn into knowing what's going on and you can start to enjoy that ride. That's better today. So I want to encourage you to take control of that. Really take an opportunity to get into there. And Tina, I know I said we're talking about KPIs. I'm going to leave that one for you or it's another conversation because I want to make sure that you can really excel your profits, excel your bottom line and move forward. And I do have an extra bonus. And I know I'm getting close on time. I should be right about there. I have a Profit Accelerator Masterclass coming up. If anybody's interesting, we'll drop that link in there as soon as I find you guys again. And Tina, you don't have this one because that's one that's coming up, but I will go ahead. There is also a freebie that Tina does have, and she'll go ahead and drop that link in there and I'll drop in the Masterclass. I'd love to have some folks join me. We're really going to dive into this and get more detailed and a little bit more hands-on as we're going. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. And let me find the stop share button. There it is. And I'm back. There you go. There you go. Do you see the gallery? Do you see everybody now? I'm Jen? back now. Yes, I have found people. <laughs> back. <laughs> Time for Q&A, y'all. You roll with it. It just, it's life. It's life. I'm on the roller coaster. I'm going to enjoy the ride. That's right. <laughs> she does it so, see, it's not <laughs> It's not easy, but she try, She works to simplify and educate. And that is the reason why her and I click so well, because we can, we talk the same language, but she made yeah. it sound simplified. You gotta have fun with it. You got to have fun. You got to enjoy it. I was waiting for Winston to be up. Usually Winston makes an appearance, the little lab who's well, little 60 pounds, but a little smaller than a hundred pounder that he was holding. It's really kind of comical, but he usually makes an appearance, but he didn't today. He's on my feet. <laughs> He's on your feet. Yeah, it's it's very interesting how what's so second nature for us being in finance and you network and you don't know that no others don't know it like you do. But I love to work with people for their strengths Absolutely. and learn from them and then, you know, ping pong off of each other. But it's just amazing how just general society and just financial literacy and understanding, and then you're owning a business. And that's the last thing you want to touch is the financial side of it because you're so focused on running the business, getting the clients, making sure you keep your customers happy. You know, uh, the last part you want to do is sit down after a very long 14 hours <laughs> possibly and deal with receipts and putting things in the system and billing contacting people that may not have paid if you're if you're on terms or something like that so it just what's Janet and I have to be a little bit twisted in our mind because that's what we love to do is is getting you organized less stress less mm -hmm. exhaustion let us handle it we love the end the other part that no one really sees you <laughs> focus on what matters to you right that's the most important thing mm -hmm. and we handle handle the rest and you do have to be a little twisted to do what we do and we're a little crazy. It's all good. We have fun with it. <laughs> but par for the course. But, you know, surround with the right people. Get your strengths. Partner with folks that have the strength that you don't have. And there's such a wealth of knowledge here. Partner with those. Let Pull the strengths, just like Tina said. Take your strengths, elevate them all, and make it all work together because we all rise together. Exactly. Exactly. Anybody else have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and join in. Well, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Janet, how did you make your um, PowerPoint presentation? It is like amazing. No, it's thank like you. I, this, that's my fun job. Uh, yeah, I it's I love animations. I love, oh, well, I start with Canva. My, me personally, I like Canva because I have more graphic control in it. And then you can export Canva as a PowerPoint. Then I add my animations because Canva won't let me animate, <laughs> which irritates me. But PowerPoint is a little bit more clumsy as far as getting the graphics and the different, you know, the sizes and stuff. It's much simpler in Canvas. So I use them both. And oh, I that's just, your secret. It was the marriage. It's like, oh my God, it was just it's fun. I, I like to have beautiful. fun with numbers. I don't want to do this if it isn't fun. <laughs> when I stopped smiling, I had a problem and I needed to fix it. But yeah, it, it's just the fun job, but it's animations and transitions is what it technically is called in PowerPoint. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, all the beef was good too. I don't want you to just think it was just the, it's the, all the pretty picture. Well, it's all inclusive. 
<laughs> as long as you can sound like Charlie Brown's mom. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> That's the most important thing is not sounding like Charlie Brown's mom. Well, we, uh, let's see how much more time we have. Uh, we got a little bit more time uh, before we bring in Kim. Anybody have any questions? Oh, Louise, Elisa Louise, go yeah, ahead. Lisa. Aloha, I'd love to hear more about how you chose your target percentages and what you do with your profit piggy bank. Okay, so basically what happens is we take a look and see kind of where we're at. And it, it's every person is a little different, I'm going to be honest. So that's that's kind of where we'd start diving in. That's more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but to get started. So what I'll look at and say, okay, if we've got cash coming in, if you only have 1% to go to, ca to profit, then we start at 1%. That's the first step because we're going to put at least a penny over there <laughs> because here's the deal at the end of it. One of the things that Meg McCullough talks about in the book is we're looking at that. You're going to have to celebrate some wins too. I think we'd all agree. We've got to celebrate. So I don't care if we put a penny in there because at least at the end of it, even if we have like six pennies at the end, we may only be able to get, well, you can't even get bubble gum for like three cents anymore. All right. I'm dating myself. It's all good, but you get the idea. You might only get an ice cream cone to celebrate if you're lucky, maybe a baby cone, maybe a snack cup. I don't know. But anyhow, you get the point. You start with one and you've got to look at your expenses. So we've got to take the past and see where we're at. We've got to see what you're dealing with. We've got to see where we're going to start. So if your expenses are way out of can like way up and you don't have the hands around it, we may have to put like 65% of that uh, into operating to get to a point. So we start where we're at and we work towards the goal. So ideally, if your business could bring you in 25% of your business, you're doing pretty good. Most folks, you that's not the pay, but we want to aim towards 25 to 30%, but there's all these additional things coming in. Does that make sense? So we start there and we start really looking, but you always take all four buckets and deal with it to start with. Okay, that's really helpful. And those numbers can just change as your business changes. It's a, exactly. Yeah, Tina and I were kind of talking about that. I kind of, I say budget loosely because my budget and cash flow are kind of blended because I deal with a lot of small business owners. So we don't have to get, I mean, the concepts are there and it depends on how large it, like, it goes from there, but I kind of do it as an ebb flow. So I'm adjusting my budget based upon cash flow, based upon what's coming up, based upon because that's how a lot of the small business owners are working. So we kind of adapted to that. And I use two biggie banks. I'll encourage you to have two. And then I take QuickBooks and within QuickBooks, there's a way I do what I call my cash accounts within that secondary account. There's an extra spreadsheet if you're not going to do multiple, which is fine. That tells you, okay, here's the percentages that I've got broken out. And then we do a journal entry so that I can look in QuickBooks and then know exactly how much I have in the taxes. And I add one more piece that Michaela was, is that's my committed ones. Because how many times do we pay once a year for something that we have to return in a year? I don't want to come, like I'm a BNI member. So, you know, I've got what, $900, whatever, whatever it is, that's going to come due in a year. I don't want to come up with $900 in one month, but I can come up with less than a hundred maybe. And if not, now I'm starting to evaluate, should I be part of that? Right. Now it's starting to give me that ability to put that puzzle piece together. Great question. Great question. Hey, thank you so much. Sure. I really learned a lot. Thank Good. you. <laughs> Good. Love to have a call. You know, definitely. If you can join for the Accelerator Masterclass, we really dive into some numbers and I give some examples and we kind of, we play with some numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, and Janet works with, do you work with, you work with the smaller entrepreneurs and some of the mid. Uh, yeah, it's more, yeah, they're, yeah, it's kind of. I guess it'd be small business. Usually most of my clients only have about 10 employees tops. You know, it's anywhere from like two to two to 10. Usually I do have one that has 40 employees that I work with, but that's my largest one at this point. But most of mine are more of that solopreneur that is growing and just needs to get a handle on everything. And we make sure that we get it there. Exactly. Any more questions? And we've got a few more minutes. Anybody got any accounting jokes? Come on. We got jokes. <laughs> I was going to look up that one that said about what is accounting. It's pretty much a wizard <laughs> is what it boiled down to. It was really cute on one of them. I'm like, ah, I should have found that one. I had done that for a BNI presentation. I'm like, yeah, the definition I found on Facebook, like the definition of an accountant is basically a wizard to make up numbers from people that have no idea what they were doing. <laughs> right, right. So it was kind of, I'm like, well, and, that, and it's not, it's, you don't know what you don't know. And that's part of it. This is stuff yeah. that I had over 25 years of corporate accounting that I'm bringing that, so I'm not your typical. And then to have the ability to 
shift from ADP, which was a DOS program, if I'm really dating myself, into the first Windows-based, I had to get that converted at the bank. Then we took that and converted it to a system called Altipro. So like to me, QuickBooks is a scaled back version. So I have a benefit that a lot of folks don't have because I know the back door. QuickBooks is not like when I call. I don't even let my clients call. Like you are not allowed to call QuickBooks. I will call because I speak both languages. Most business owners do not. And it's not, it, but the, the staff doesn't speak the language either half the time. And we've got to be able to bridge that gap. And I have an advantage because I do, as I said, I'm bilingual. <laughs> I speak small business owner, I speak tech, and I speak accounting. So it kind of triple link, whatever that is. But I have that advantage just based upon the experience and having all these systems that I have had gotten stuck converted. When we went to Altipro, it was crazy. We, I had a staff of five for the whole payroll department, 1,100 people, three states. And they gave, we had to convert everything. Tina, you'll relate to this one. We had to convert it. So they got me temporaries to help fill in the gaps. Yeah. Temps mm -hmm. to do the job. Unbelievable. After about the sixth one, the job wasn't getting done. <laughs> oh my gosh. So it, oh, but it's it. common in corporate. And hence the reason I was exhausted. I said 70 hours was a short week. Yeah, it's <laughs> true. It's happening. Yeah. It's not, you can't physically and mentally and health wise do that long term. Demer has a question. Go ahead, Demer. Yes. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yep. Okay. Sorry. I think I've been unmuted and I'm driving. I'm sorry. I came in a little late, but I'm interested. Um, is this only for Americans? Because I'm Canadian. Concepts are the same. Concepts are the same. So it wouldn't matter. Would okay. not matter That's at all. Because I'm going you. more concept wise. Now, as far as some of the specifics and conversions and stuff, I'm not as strong on that side of it, but um, the concepts are identical. Lovely. I'll be interested in coming then. So I missed your I missed your presentation, but I'll rewatch. Thank you. Perfect. There is the link to the master class. I almost forgot to put okay, that in. Okay, thank you. So love to have you. Right on. She looks like she's skiing. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see her. It's cute the way she's like leaning back. So that is the master class. Okay. Yep. That's on February 20th, right? Yep. It is. That was an extra bonus. Thank you. Wait, it's always good to have an extra. It's have it, always good to have an extra. Well, Janet, I am so glad that you joined us. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I appreciate your time and co-hosting everybody. <laughs> been the stealth mo back there helping me co-host and keep keeping things on track i appreciate you more than ever no thank problem. you we will definitely uh have to split another margarita we are <laughs> might have to be two this time <laughs> we both had to drive home and still work that night <laughs> so i do, do appreciate it now i know um some of you don't know but jenna is in our spotlight as well she just doesn't get on the Marco Polo. Marco Polo. He's always in the quiet mode. So now I, you get to meet a lot of the of the team. I do listen. <laughs> I just don't participate. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Janet. If you have to go, you just let me know, and I'll I'll You're be good. monitor. So thanks so much, and I am so happy to announce Kim Groshak. She's like my ultimate. I just look up to her. She's so smart and so much that she does. She recently released a book. She is the pause lady, as people know her. Pause power. You told heard me in the beginning talk about how she has helped me learn. It's not time out. It's not smell the roses. It's pause. And I hope that terminology just continues to spread across all entrepreneurs, all individuals, all ages, to understand that even though technology is moving so, 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 so fast, um, we do have to take time and pause. And everyone has touched on what happens when we don't pause. So that is so important. And Kim's gonna hit on enhanced time management skills, tangible improvements in results and personalized success blueprint. So I am honored to have you, Kim. Thank you so much for joining. I'm going to get you on the spotlight. And if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand. And it is almost all yours. Thank you so much. Boy, I don't know if I can. 
That's quite an introduction. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, and thank you for having me. This has been a very amazing uh, summit. And it's been, like I had mentioned earlier, synergistic. I mean, it seems like it's kind of all building and I'm sure it's going to continue to build. Um, and since it's focused on wealth, um, I'm going to just say one statement here and take a pause when I say it and just let it set. Your wealth has everything to do with your time. Yeah, so today what I'm going to do, all the things that have been said so far, and I'm sure after, are all things that can fit within the modalities and containers that I'm going to talk about. So I talk about pause, which Tina uh, mentioned. I also talk about a time box, and I'll explain a little bit more about these. And then I talk about the shift, which is something that a few people, um, I think Sri and Ali kind of alluded to with the shift that happens in going from A to B, like when your pattern changes. I think uh, Siobhan also had mentioned something. Um, but before I go into this, I'm just, I don't have a beautiful slide presentation, Janet. So, but I do have <laughs> one thing that I can show and I can put something in the, um, in the chat as well that you can use. I'm not going to follow the worksheets very much, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about me first. So you get, some of you know me, some of you will know a little bit about me. Some of you know more about me, but I've been in the industry for over 35 years, and um, I started out in IT back in 1989, so I used DOS and all those things that I heard Janet say. But really what happened was I didn't really know that I was going to do this. I was about maybe five. My dad is a computer operator. He used to bring me to work with him. And I used to key punch on the key punch and, you know, those little IBM, I called them IBM cards, but they were punch cards. Some of the, they're labeled different things. My mom used to be able to type, um, put little Christmas trees and it was so fun. Right. And I just went to work with him and typed on the keyboard. I didn't really think anything of it. In fact, I was supposed to be a fashion designer. I was a tailor in high school. I was in the newspaper. I was supposed to be this big thing. Well, when I got out of high school, um, things shifted in the, and, you know, you always say, you always say, you know, there, there's a reason why you go through different experiences in life. And I was a, I probably have gone to, I would say eight colleges. <laughs> um, and, but that actually taught me how to go into different places and adjust and, and do what I did in my career. It was just amazing. Right. You look back and you say, wow, that really makes sense. Um, and I was a first out of my family that went to, to college. So there was a lot of unknowns. And as I uh, experienced what I did, and, and I'm sharing why and all this to get you to where I got to pause, right, um, is because I, I actually wanted to put support structures around people so they didn't have to go through what I went through. Okay. So in any event, um, I actually took a whole year off from from technology and social media because I found myself, I was a first adopter in 2005 before the public got into social media. And I used to be called into universities to talk about it because I'd create, oh, here's what you have to do because you know, be figuring it out. And so I predicted where we are today. It's probably even farther than what I predicted, um, how we would this device here would become the driver in the driver's seat and we we are now in the back seat right now and so i found myself in that same situation so i just connected and that's where the pause came into play and i'm going to stop sharing now because that's enough about me um but i like to write i like to dive right in because you know laura took my basically my big whiplash <laughs> which was think about the fact, I'm just going to say it, five people have a stroke or heart attack and die because they're working 16 hours a day. And this is why the pause is so important. 
And the pauses can be used on, it's a modality, right? So it can be used in any way. I mean, I was practicing to pause when I spoke. And I just got off the phone with someone about not, you know, she thought, well, I thought that the time management was all pause. Well, there's more about pause. Pause is a modality. It's a container that you use to do different things, to, to catch your muscle, what's going on in your muscles, like Siobhan had said. It's pausing and, ref and getting in that space of being and then really identifying some of those muscle things. So then you can reach out to Sri and, and Sh Sh Siobhan and uh, all the experts to help solve some of those things that are deteriorating in your body because we aren't thinking about it. So when you saw that slide, it was pause, unplug and breathe. And that was real, that's really the intent to start practicing, practicing that. But here's the thing, when people started practicing and they said, well, I don't have time to do it. Here comes the time part, right? And the thing is, when you pause, you get time back. You get time back. And that's what I discovered when I took a whole year off. I actually took 15 minutes a day to pause. And in that 15 minutes, I actually then created a time box. And I'll explain kind of how this all works, but I'm giving you the words you know can start kind of associating because industry uses all kinds of words for these, right? I don't know. Tina had mentioned she used different words before she heard of the pause and other people use the Pareto method for time management, right? But the time box is a very specific um, way to approach things. And I think Ali talked a lot about defining, you know, your patterns and understanding those and then moving forward. And there's a lot of about decisions and agreements that, that are that need to be done within the time box because we personal we are not agreeing with a lot of times when we say we're going to do something. So coming back, I set a time box for 15 minutes and I say 15 minutes cuz this is the big key to success. The compressed time box is what I talk about. The compressed time box related to finances will come later, but I'm just saying the compressed time box, 15 minutes a day when I pause for 15 minutes, I set some time on my calendar for 15 minutes to write. I had time now to write 15 minutes a day because I knew that I could pause and I knew that I needed that creatively. And then all of a sudden an evolution happened because then I started to set goals around, Laura talked about being athletic and getting exercise and drinking water, right? Well, I set a goal to run a half marathon in all 50 states. I set a goal to, I had time, right? I started to get more time back because what happens is coming back to pausing and clearing out the muscles, clearing out all of that, those childhood thoughts that we have in our, um, you know, three, I don't know the word, but you know what I'm talking about, the, um, you know, in, in that, in your thoughts, right? You're clearing that out. It's like a feng shui. Pause, feng shui. Release all that old stuff, right? And then become familiar with what you, what's happening. Because especially when you're making a shift in your life, the shift, right? Coming into the shift. So those three things happen and getting familiar with those words. The shift is moving from A to B. You're shifting just like, I don't know, I think it was Ali talked about um, your identity and your identity is one thing, but you're going to shift into a whole different identity, right? And that's what I'm doing. I'm going, I'm walking through, the, I'm walking the walk and everything that I teach and coach on and support people on is something that I have experienced. It's not only it's not just education and education is experience anyway. And I always like to prove out that it works and not just be someone that just says, woo, woo this is going to happen. And I never experienced it. It's just what it is. Okay. So let me get into the, the nuts and bolts here. When I think Janet was talking a lot about, you know, how to manage the money side of the house. Well, we need to be really aware of the fact 
when money's coming in and when it's coming out and how it's all working. And if we aren't very clear on that, right, we lose everything. So the commitment and your calendar will design your success faster than your passion. Let me say that one more time. Your commitment and your calendar will design your success faster than your passion. So let me come into the modality, the focus around the time box, because that's the key. You're going to get the time boxes, the free book here in the link. This is what you're getting, the book. And what it is, is I'm just going to give you just the framework. You can take this framework and apply it. And you do define it as a 15 minute time box and you can do four increments if you want to do the hour, but you want to get results from that 15 minutes. So you want to be really clear about the decision that you make about what you're doing in that 15 minutes, understand what you're going to focus on in that 15 minutes, and then make an agreement with yourself that you're going to actually complete it. You go through the process of the 15 minutes, you know, a little nugget, we talk about nuggets. If you want to choose to do a two minute increment within the 15 minutes to do one nugget, you know, you, you get that clear about it. You're getting those nuggets off your plate. The results are off your plate. You're finished wine, you're getting things done. And now you even have more time back. So there's a forgiveness piece that's re-talked about, which is really important in the time box. You go through the process of the 15 minutes with that, you know, the 15 minutes deciding on what you're going to do and then make an agreement with yourself and get the results. But let's say you get to the 15 minutes and you, it didn't really work or didn't really play out the way you thought. Maybe you didn't pause that day for 15 minutes, whatever is was you were putting in that time box. The end step is to look back kind of do a lessons learned for those project managers out there, or just look back and say, how did that work? Okay, didn't go as well as I thought. I forgive myself and move on. I'll do it again tomorrow. So that's another feng shui, right? So that is the process of the time box. Now coming into the finance side of the house. Now what we do with finances, and I'm just going to give one example. Janet had all, all kinds of great stuff in there, and I'm sure Tina's going to have some more later. Um, but one key thing, is simple thing you can take along with you today, is you mark off a 15-minute box each day. You open up your bank account. You have a spreadsheet. And you look, you write down all the things, all the things that you have, the balances that you have in your bank account. So you know where you are. Very simple, 15 minutes. You look at your credit cards, whatever, all of it. It takes less than 15 minutes, by the way, but the 15 minute time box, you get it down, you can cut it down. So that's something that I would suggest that you do, but there's so many things you can do with this. But the whole point is you're decluttering the past and you're starting with a fresh slate using these modalities using these structures all right so do you have any questions right now because there's more to be said um i'm going to put the pdfs even though they aren't everything that i cover in here please ask questions i'm going to give you a pause here to reflect and raise your hand here you go any questions so far Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Pretty simple. Now it is a little different. So this here, this time box that I use has been my one of my successes. Why is it my success? The biggest thing is the agreement that you have with yourself and the conversation you have with the other person or persons and the agreements you have and making sure that they agree when they leave. That's an empowering conversation. And I believe that this is what I believe. I don't know if it's on 100% all over the place, but from my experience, 
I believe that we aren't having the conversations. I believe our noses in, are in this so much that we are not communicating. So then we're barely hearing, we're barely talking, and we're barely understanding and listening, pausing to listen, to really let it sink in so that we can actually agree with what we heard or reiterate what we heard with, to someone else that we, what, what we agree with. So these are some of the things that I practice in my community and it gets uncomfortable. <laughs> what I do is we always practice the pause for 15 minutes and we all agree on practicing the pause, but each person chooses what kind of pause that they do for the week. And we go around the room and each person explains what kind of pause they're going to do. And then they agree with the pause that they're going to do. And even when we talk about the next time we get together about how it went and it didn't go very well, it gets very uncomfortable to forgive ourselves. Look at all that feng shui that we really, <laughs> you know, all that stuff that we're holding in our, our mental capacity, in our muscles, all these things that we're holding on to that we don't even know we're holding on to. And we're making our bodies sick. So when Laura talked a lot about the water, proactively drinking those, just having the water next to you, right? And just sipping all day is a proactive approach to help our bodies to be healthy, right? And that's what the pause does. That's what the time box does. And now let me talk a little bit about the shift. Let's take a pause for a minute here. Let it all sink in. All right, now. I know that might, how did that feel for everyone? Taking that pause. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself and speak and ask him questions as we go. Cause this Kim's presentation is a little more interactive. So feel free. What I thought Lisa Ray's doing this, Janet. Yeah, it does make a difference. I mean, I mentioned being in corporate so much and it was crazy. The days, and I'm very good at eating through lunch and I'm very, very bad. Ha I don't eat enough. So that's a problem. That's where my issue runs into. I had it in corporate, find myself doing it. But the days that I took a walk, just a simple walk around thing. And I used to do water aerobics when I was in corporate. For I would run over, do water aerobics, come back for my lunch hour. I got so much more done by taking that break. So even if I just take 15 minutes, it makes such a difference. And I, and I know this, and yet I still find myself not doing it. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, especially with our virtual world now. I mean, I've been working virtual yeah. before virtual became popular. Um, but even it's gotten so, so, I mean, cause I know that when you work from home, you get more done by the way, if you really are a worker or a doer, um, because there is less distraction. However, um, what's happening in our workplaces, which this isn't just workplace, but in the workplaces, since you're talking about that, um, they're going from meeting to meeting, to meeting, to meeting, to meeting. And what's happening is people are angry and anxious. And well, anxiety was never really a word. I don't even want to go into that. Angry, fearful, whatever, full of stuff, worried about stuff that's going on at home. I just got a phone call from someone that just said, can you talk to me for a minute? My husband just got in the hospital. My mom got fell and broke her hip and I have had a migraine and, and she just broke down, right? There's a lot going on, right? So anyway, so at work, you've got this on and on and on. And when I was sharing this with corporates, cause we're trying to bring this into companies, five day pause programs, totally want it so bad 
they want to implement a 45 minute meeting. So they have a 15 minute pause naturally because they need it. They go from people are angry in the meetings and then they go from one anger. They have never, they don't even have time, Janet, like you had mentioned to even let it settle and let it go. That whatever anger thing that happened in that meeting, which it shouldn't happen to begin with anger should that all, you know, so when we come to the shift, the shift, it's a great segue. The shift has everything. I'm showing you my books because this is all related to this. The shift is the big, the kahuna. That's the important one. Because once you practice the pause and you practice the time box and you start getting it down and getting the methods in your, in your life and being able to spend more time with the people you love because you put the time boxes in the right way you shut things off when you need to shut them off. Your mind is now free. You know what you're doing. You're turning it around. So you're in the driver's seat. And you do know because you are proactively deciding, right? And this is not, right? Then you have time to learn the methods that I've learned and applied about anger management and releasing stress and releasing fears and releasing those blockers that are in the way, understanding the triggers that are happening in your body. That's what the shift is. Ultimately, that's the depth, you know, the traumas in our bodies that we don't even know we have. I didn't even know when I started doing this in August, I did not even know I had anger. And now I'm very aware of it. And I use the practices and, you know, I'm still working, I'm practicing because there's, it's a, it's a process to learn that you don't learn it in three days, you know, but it is, it's, it, it, for me, practicing this is a very objective and subjective approach. And I know Ali talked about landmark. I was in landmark for years. I totally know that world <laughs> and I lived it and I understand it because I could be, I, I could convert it in my mind to a more real word, real word, real, real world experience with the words, right? And that's what the shift is. It takes something more, it's not woo woo, right? Cause we always talk woo and woo is not bad. I'm just saying it, it, to me, it's very tangible. It's a data-driven approach. You look at things from the subjective, which is internal and objective, external. And this is, I taught my daughter cause she's got par, she's kind of borderline ADD. And, you know, it was either put structures in place or give her drugs, no drugs for me. I'm all about holistic, just like Laura, right? And I taught her, I'd always teach her like this, the objective point of view, what's out there. And Ali talked about, I don't know, demons or something. I called them gremlins. I even have an article in a, a book, you know, one of those collaborative books that I talk about my gremlins. That's always happening. And then there, that's again, tangible. For me, I always put tangible words to things. That's where I say modalities and containers. It just helps me see things clearly with those specific words. And I think, I think sometimes our words and our articulation, right? We're missing a lot of that. And so that's why I put words to things. And that's why I write so many books. But coming back to the shift, there is actually, a, it's a very simple approach where you always ask three questions to look at yourself subjectively. And then three questions to look at yourself objectively. You also look at the other person who might be angry, right? You might perceive it as be, them being angry. And then you can, you can switch it. So it goes away. It's like, I was taught by Dr. Orman who has applied it to his life for 35 years. He had major anger. He got divorced and all kinds of things before he even, he tells a story so I can say it. <laughs> and that's the point though. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's a proven method that makes a lot of sense and you're using words to understand it. So I'm going to pause for a minute and feel free to ask questions, reflect.
Funny, I used the word gremlins, Kim, when computer systems are going haywire and something's wrong when people aren't looking at their the code changes or enhancements that are done to the ERP systems. I'm like, all right, you got gremlins again. Who's watching the gremlins? How ironic, right? Yep. Gremlins. <laughs> All right. Well, if nobody has, I have, I have more. I have lots more. I can talk all day if you'd like me to talk all day. But yeah, you got you got some time. But if you yeah. have any questions, just raise your hand. And yeah, please, please do. I I want to make sure that you're yeah you know, you're get your it's landing over there. Um, thank you, Siobhan. Um, so here's another thing. Um, when you pause, you know, there's a lot of shifting going on and that's what the shift really means. It's, it's, you know, like I'm changing the way I used to be to the way I, I now am. I'm walking into a whole new world. And I used to say, um, you know, it's like I'm at the edge of the forest and it's dark in there and I'm afraid to go in there. There's a whole thing around stuff I've written. That's the gremlin thing. That's fear. There's all those things. Right. And I've used these methods. Um, it's, you know, all about, I think Ali mentioned something about identity and I have really shifted my identity. It's been six months of shifting, but I wasn't really aware of it. And it was really funny. I think Tina and I talked the other day, um, she was on my podcast and we were talking about, you know, how, when you shift into something you don't know, I know in my situation, I basically turned off 35 years of my experience thinking I was a child again. And it's almost like I lo I lost in my mind because I said, I, I don't, I'm not that anymore. I was trying to like cut it off. And then I, I, you know, I learned through the, and, and, and then I think Sri and I talked a lot about this, but, and then there is this, it is like a, a value system. You lose it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Tina said, I felt like an embryo. There's, there's this thing where you feel like you just don't fit in and everyone else is up here, but I was on the mountain over here. I was, heck, I was well sought after over here. What happened? <laughs> and it took a bit because I, I would create stories in my mind. And I think Ali talked a lot about the stories. I love that. That was so cool. Um, I do that. I'm a big storyteller. In fact, I, Ooh, there, I really have a lot of stories. I get, got to get rid of, you know? <laughs> um, but you know, it, it, it took a bit to get that, you know, oh, I'm kind of like, well, I don't know if I'm not good enough type of stories. I don't know what it was, but totally I'm getting now, but it was all about me shifting from one identity to a new identity and having that support, that person that can support you along the way. I'm kind of that container, if you want to call it that, that modality to help move people from A to B. That is really my strong suit. I'm also good at networking, but <laughs> um, I take that from industry and I get that. I take that from industry and I bring it in here and I move people fast. I mean, I have done something in six months that it takes people two to three years to do. And I remove the obstacles. I feng shui people. <laughs> they do it themselves, but I help them see it quickly. I teach them things so they don't have to go through what I went through and they move forward. So that the shift itself is such a critical piece of this, but you have to practice the pause. You have to practice the time box and understand it in order to get to the shift. And that's where the wealth comes in, the prosperity. And the wealth isn't just about money. Money is just a piece of the puzzle. I mean, prosperity to me are all of you. You know, and we talk about service. I mean, that's what it's about. It's all about service. And I, I don't know, someone had mentioned, um, you know, we talk about sales and all that, because that is part of this, right? And I, it, it isn't a, it isn't a sales conversation. I think it was, it's called a service call. I just wrote it down. It's about a service call and, and, and defining that I'm going to have a service call today makes things so much different because that's what it is. It's, it's in service. 
you know, I just got off a call. I mean, I go through my list trying to do my 20 calls each day, which you do, you know, it's a practice that I, I practice because it's not something that I did in business. People would just call me. Yeah, my business is blowing up. Come on over. The other big companies couldn't do it. So come on over and do it for us. Sure. That was easy, right? Now it's a different thing. Yes, Tina. Yeah, I absolutely love that you renamed that. So what, again, like you say, shifting with the words that are different for me, I had a very, I, I'm going to be honest, I had a very tough time with that word sales call. I was so, let me tell you how much it was, it was for me. I would, when I dated, when I was in the dating world, I wouldn't even date a salesman. I wouldn't talk to a salesman. I would never even, as soon as they said they were a salesman, I wouldn't even give them a chance a day. That word was so taboo for me because to me, a salesperson was someone talking shit. They're lying to me. They're just trying to sell me something. I'm not dealing with it. So let me, that is what I'm saying. The mindset that I had on the sales word impacted me through my entire life. Not only that, my career. So for me to go in and, and, and I will tell you what was my biggest fear is how do, how do I sell my, you know, myself? How do I sell? I mean, that's my thought process. Like, well, I, here I, I and I'm going to spin off of that because yeah. I want everyone to learn this because I, I just mean. got done. I just got off a, another summit talking just like that. And she was just blown away. So this is what I've learned. I am a service service servant leader. This is what I am. I have always been that. And I started in June. And T and I give you a lot of kudos, kudos for creating a summit without getting trained. I went to training for that. I also had master classes where I had one person show up. And it took a few months before I had 15, right? Because no one knew me, right? Here's the thing. People are calling me. People are, I'm on a summit as a guest and they'll raise their hand and say, I get Kim's newsletter. And every time I read it, I get something out of it. Okay. So here's the thing. People notice you stand in your value system, in your, in your, in your heart, in what you stand for, your legacy that you're leaving. And you continue to walk through that step by step in service, right? And, and eventually it, you become the magnet. I was just on a call with a lady from my, from my newsletter list that I, again, it's a little bit of a thing, but I'm doing it. And I call, I must've called her two weeks ago. She said, oh yeah, I talked to you two weeks ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and she said, and then she started telling me how she just is finishing up her book. And then all of a sudden, and then I told, cause she was like confused about my newsletter. And I explained what the newsletter, Oh, I should start reading that more. I guess it, I was misinterpreting what that was. And then she said, I'd love to send you my book in a month when I get it done to get to be one of my readers because she didn't know. Right. I'm, I said, sure. I'm of service, you see? And, and then she even said, you know, and who knows how we can help each other in the future. This is, it just, it's just being in service, being you and loving yourself, understanding your new identity, which is a process. It's an A to B process. That's what I'm here for, right? To support you in that. I think who was it? I think it was Laura and I were going to work on um, going through an, I have an avatar exercise and, and really it's not even something you need to go through. Cause here's the thing, you know, who your avatar is. I'll tell you a little secret. It's you. You are your avatar. Boy, that was six months of work for me. You don't have to do. All right, so I always leave you guys nuggets and I'm gonna give you, I think 10 minutes here for just an open time here to pause if you wanna take a break or if you have questions, I'm here for you. 
Um, there is a link in there and I am more than open. You go to kimgroshek.com and open, just feel free to schedule time. Some of you are already in my mastermind. So you get my time because that's part of it. So um, questions, answers, thoughts. Lisa, I know you're thinking something over there with your kitty. <laughs> I appreciate you defining what we do. We're service because we are solving problems. We're not selling for our benefit. We're set, we're solving the problem. Oh, that, that right there. That's my aha. It, it really defines we are servicing. We're making service calls to solve problems. So here's the thing. My first book was practice the pause, practice the time box. They aren't called that anymore. Practice saying service call instead of sales call. It's a practice. Yeah. Yeah. I've got all three of Kim's books. If you all <laughs> haven't gotten them, you all can get them. Well, you're going to get the think box. You download the PDF. You've got it. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Thank you so much for having me, Tina. Oh, and thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Oh my gosh. It's just, it, it, it's just, this summit is just amazing because it just, it just shows the universal alignment of us all coming together and how we're just blending in the same thought process and prosperity and abundance. And every day I wake up, there's a, you know, getting back to my book that I was telling you about, it, it brings in a lot of religion, spiritual and scientific mindset. And in every paragraph, this gentleman mentions, I am wealth, I am abundance, I am joy. And when I say it, I'm feeling the emotion and I have it on my wall now. And it's emotion. It's emotional and, for me because this is a and just, just so you know, Tina gave me the idea, this little idea. I had planned on sending a text out to everyone to remind you to pause for the, for those of you on my list, you'll get one every Friday, just to remind you to pause and guess what's going to be in that text. You are what, Tina, what Tina just said. It's so just, yeah. And loving yourself, forgiving yourself for anything. I mean, just continue to grow and evolve and prosperity, wealth follows you on all five of those we of the wheel. So true. So true. I am so thankful to have met every one of you and watch all of our journeys together. It's just I can't, words can't even describe it. I just am so thankful to, to have met every one of you and everyone that that's signed up, I know is looking forward to looking for the replay of this. And I hope it does bring a lot of inspiration to people that are working to get to their path. And maybe people like myself and Sari that took the biggest jump of our lives and to believe in ourselves and do this because we wanna give back. There's a lot more of us to give back than, than, you know, being in the corporate world. And I think every one of us can agree with that on so many levels and helping people elevate and be the greatest legacy that they can get to. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Now, Dara Lee, uh, she may join in with us. We may. Oh, get I think Sri had a question. Oh, Sri. Oh. I, I just wanted to say uh, just one of the other things that happens when you when you are in integrity with yourself right and when you completely are comfortable with yourself um so you're you're accepting the anger in you you're accepting the selfishness in you you're ac accepting that all of those things exist within you you become much less judgmental of people outside of you because you know that everything that you are seeing, typically, what do we judge? We judge something outside of us that is inside of us. So when we get to that place of peace, my, you know, I mentioned the Hindu saying Tattva Masi earlier, that what is inside is what you're seeing outside. The way to see more peace in the world is to get to complete peace within yourself. Um, and I think 
I, I had an article in the Elephant Journal about the terrorist within, about how once we recognize that there is as much violence or potential for violence within us, we will be able to, and we are able to love and accept that part of us, we will stop seeing it outside of us because that's the healing that the world is crying out for the to to really that's what loving yourself that's why it needs to happen and i i just wanted to bring everything that kim was saying as well you know the shift is is that shift of being what it all does is to get to that sense of being completely comfortable in your skin and then you see that outside of you just wanted to sew that all up together a little bit that's beautiful very much very much if no one has any questions we can definitely take like a five minute quick break before i bring in daryl lee's recording hopefully she can jump in and see us but she sent me a recording on her 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 portion she is spending time with family. Remember we talked about time and I, it does ma doesn't matter because I know her message is going to be delivered just as if she was here with us. So go ahead, take five minutes and we'll be right back and I'll get started at 3.15. Okay, I'll give it just a minute for everyone to get back. And I know we're doing a recording, so I will, I want to introduce first. Thank you, Kim. Love it. Love how you intertwine those three and closing out your growth so we can continue to learn from you. Now, Daryl Lee Simmons could not be here with us today, but she is with us today. She is going to touch in her speaking. She's going to touch on the power of mindset regarding health, what it meant means to, with clean eating and to simplify its implementation and how to embrace movement to strengthen your health. You will see a lot of intertwining between a lot of what has been discussed today and I will share her freebie in the chat. So let me get started and make sure that you can see her screen, see the screen. Are you living life to its fullest? Are you as active as you'd like to be? Are you doing things that you used to do? Like when you were younger, are you making memories with those children, your grandchildren? And are you feeling the best that you can feel? If not, I've got a solution for you. Hi, I'm Daryl Lee Simmons, and I am going to bring to you today three simple steps to ignite your health and lose weight for good. I'm super excited to be here today, and I have actually, I'm recording this because as you're watching this, I'm out making memories with my grandchildren. I apologize, but I double booked this weekend, and... I am out skiing with my grandchildren this weekend. What a blast. Oh my gosh. I I just love it. They're 10 and 7. Still love spending time with Grammy. And hopefully that will last because I am able to get out and do things with them, spend time with them, and do the kinds of things that they love to do. And I'm still able to get out there and do those things too. So hold on, let me share a PowerPoint and I'm gonna give you the three simple steps you need to implement to get your health, wow, exactly where you want it to be. Take just a second here and bring it up. And um, sorry, wrong one. Here we go. All right. So I'd like to start with a small disclaimer, okay? I am here as a friend to sharing information, information that I've discovered through my journey to lose weight, feel better, 
and really to be able to live this last chapter of my life with vitality, with energy, with excitement, with enthusiasm, and with a zest to get the most out of every single day. I have no formal background in nutrition or medicine or anything like that. My background, I was a special education teacher and retired as a school principal. And uh, for much of my career, I also, in addition to wanting to support families, support individuals, because that's what I love to do, I have done tons and tons of research, gone to seminars, read books about nutrition, health, how to keep our bodies as healthy as we possibly can. And when I retired about a year and a half ago, I knew that I had this stubborn weight that I had lost and regained, lost and regained, lost and regained more times than I want to count, right? If that's you, been on that yo-yo diet, you know, treadmill, then this is for you because that was happening to me. I tried, you know, counting calories, counting carbs, um, counting uh, fat content, fat, all of the numbers, right? I've tried supplements, all the newest, uh, you know, newest fangled supplements that came out. I was like, yeah, let me try it. Let me try it. And they worked great for a while, but then, you know, my body either got accustomed to it or, I, I stopped taking it, whatever. And then the weight came back very often, even additional pounds. So about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I said, you know what? I've got to figure this out. I, I want to just really feel good in my body. I want to lose the weight, not just for how I look, but really more importantly for how I felt, right? I wanted to have more energy. I wanted to be able to, you know, play more with my grandchildren. I wanted to be able to hop on a bike and take a bike ride. And all of these things I wanted to be able to do successfully. And through much research, trial and error of my own, I developed Ditch the Diet. I began sharing it with some friends. They started having success. And that's when I said, you know what? I need to bring this to the masses because what I have... I believe is really pretty amazing. It just, it's super simple and it's super effective. So without further ado, let me jump in. So a little bit about me, I'm happily married. My husband, Bob and I love um, adventure. We love to play golf. We love to go to the beach, all those kind of things. We have three grown adult children between the two of us. I'm a um, number one best-selling author. I love to cook. And those are my beautiful grandchildren. A year and a half ago, that was two summers ago. Uh, and like I said, as you're watching this, I'm out on the ski slopes with them today. But I just love um, the ability to be able to be of service. I was always... Um, of that mindset in my work. I worked with individuals with disabilities my whole life, supporting them and their families. And when I retired, I knew I wanted to do something to, to continue to be of service. And it, it brought me here. And I'm super excited to be here. And I wanna, you know, actually while I'm here, Tina Meeks, thank you so much for offering this opportunity and getting all of us on here to get the word out because, oh my gosh, this is one powerhouse group. and. Uh, we all have such a, a different take on the same thing, like living our best lives from, from, you know, looking through a different lens. So here we go. And the reason why I coined the term ditch the diet is because diets don't work. And if you've ever been on a diet, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, very often they can be, they, they can work very effectively for a while, but to get a diet that's going to work long-term, that's really tricky. The reason, many reasons, but one of the reasons is because they become very restrictive. Like you feel like, oh my gosh, I have to count these points. I have to count these calories. Oh, you know, um, is this allowed? Is that allowed? That kind of thing. And it really becomes cumbersome. At first, it's really exciting. You're really excited. You're really gung-ho. But in order to really embrace a healthy lifestyle and really embrace 
what healthy eating is all about, I have three main components for you to really consider. The first is all around clean eating. What do I mean by clean eating? Basically what cleaning eating is, is eliminating or significantly reducing the amount of highly processed foods that you're eating. Okay, that's a mouthful. What exactly is that all about? What it entails is if you pick up a package and there's an ingredient list with a ton of ingredients, half of them that you cannot read, cannot pronounce, look like chemicals, feel like chemicals, they probably are chemicals, they're not food, that would be considered a highly processed food. We want to try to get as much of that out of our diet as possible. Now I say eliminate, really what I mean is significantly reduce because unless you are farming yourself and you know growing all your own food, it's really pretty challenging to completely eliminate any highly processed foods. But the idea is to, to really significantly reduce that. Those fast food restaurants, uh, I would really highly recommend you stay away from those because again, their foods are full of all kinds of additives, artificial flavors, artificial colors, artificial sweeteners, or, um, you know, hydrogenized oils, all of those things that really are wreaking havoc on us. So then you say, okay, so what do I eat? That's really simple. You eat lean protein. That could be chicken, fish, um, turkey. There's even lean, lean cuts of beef that are appropriate. It's the, those are really what you should be um, consuming small portions of those. What do I mean by small portions? When you're putting together your plate, one quarter of your plate should be these lean proteins. All right. Then you want to fill the rest of your plate with plants. I'm all about putting more plants on your plate. There's a ton of research, a ton of reasons why you want to put more plants on your plate. And the idea is to let's experiment. Let's get out there and try. Look, the typical um, American diet is about half of your plate, a big old honk and piece of meat, maybe a potato slathered with some, you know, sour cream, butter, whatever, and then a tiny little portion of peas or green beans, right? I want you to start thinking a little differently. A quarter of your plate, that lean protein. Then you add all kinds of fruits and vegetables. When you go through the produce aisle, just take a look around you. There are more items in that aisle that you've probably never even tried. I know there's some on there that I still have yet to try. I just tried yucca um, about a month or so ago. I love it. Oh my gosh. It's like a starchy root, really delicious, super yummy. And there, I know there's people on here that say, I eat yucca all the time, but that's one of those things that may or may not be on, on your radar, right? But just look around. So really three quarters of your plate should be plants, fruits and vegetables, uh, grains, whole grains, excuse me, um, like uh, barley, whole uh, brown rice, quinoa, those kind of things. There's, again, there's hundreds of different kinds of, of grains. And just take a look, start experimenting with different items and see which ones you like and which ones you don't like. So instead of buying the uh, minute rice that's already in a little package, it's that's highly processed rice. Just buy a bag of rice, okay? A bag of rice. Okay, does it take a little longer to cook? Yes, it does. But what I recommend you do is you batch cook. So when I cook rice, I cook enough for probably two or three meals. So I only have to do it once a week and then we have it a couple of times. Rice is fine for, you know, several days, five or six days in the refrigerator, you, you know, so you can have it um, a couple of times during the week. That's what I like to do. Or you stick it in the freezer and it freezes just fine. You take it out uh, so that you don't have to, you know, cook it every single night. Uh, and then you've got, so you've got your lean protein, you've got your fruits and vegetables, you've got your whole grains, and then you have uh, legumes, which is beans, hundreds of kinds of beans. There's black beans, pink beans, kidney beans, all of those. And again, that is one thing. Okay, beans do take a while to cook if you're going to cook them. Uh, I do use canned beans again. So what I'm saying is to reduce the amount of highly processed, 
Typically, if you look at your cans and you can find canned beans that only have in them the beans, water, maybe a little sodium, um, I always rinse my beans to make sure that we get the sodium off of there. But again, the less ingredients, that means the less processing that's in there, right? And and beans is something that you can, again, get a batch cook if you have the time, but the canned beans and all of the um so-called uh, plant-based kind of gurus, the people out there that that promote eating more plant-based foods, more a lot of them use canned beans. So, and a lot of them um, have uh, Dr. Uh, you know, MD at the end of their name. So I tend to listen to what they have to say. And so I do pretty much rely on canned beans. Although I do love making my own bean soup too. That's a great way to get a whole bunch of vegetables, a whole bunch of fiber. Um, we could talk, I could talk all day about uh, fiber and, and the benefits of all of that, but just really pay attention to what you're eating and try to start cutting out of your uh, daily routine those things that are highly processed and have a lot of chemicals, a lot of extra ingredients in it that, uh, you know, you could put, and I did this once many, many years ago, I put a Twinkie on the shelf and it still looked like a Twinkie two years, two years later. It was hard, but it still looked exactly like a Twinkie. There was no mold, nothing. What does that tell you? That tells you that it is so chocked full of chemicals that, you know, even the, the, the natural microbes out there don't want anything to do it. That should tell you something, right? So you want to really look at that. And when you do, when you switch this over, you're going to feel a difference. You're going to feel more energy. You're going to feel like super energized. It's just amazing. Joyful movement. I encourage you to get up and move every single day. The, the recommendation is 30 minutes of purposeful movement for at least five days a week. So about 150 minutes of, of movement uh, per week. Now, if you're just starting out, I'll tell you a little story because uh, a little over a year ago when I was working with one of my first coaches, and he said to me, Dara, uh, you know, do you move at all? Do you exercise at all? I was like, nope, not at all. He says, okay, so do you think you can walk for 10 minutes? I was like, sure, I can walk for 10 minutes. Okay. He says, I want you to take a 10 minute walk. So I had a treadmill and it was winter then. And I said, okay, I'll get on the treadmill. Well, I want to tell you 10 minutes felt like, oh my gosh, it wasn't as easy as I, I thought it'd be like, boom, like that. It wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. Now, of course, I've built up and I can walk for, you know, an hour if I want, but it's, it, it takes time. So don't, don't think that you have to jump right on and do 30 minutes. No, no, no. I highly recommend. And I know my good friend, uh, Laura Teets, who, or Laura, I'm sorry, Laura Ribbons, would also also recommends this you start out slow right you just take and, and again five, maybe it's only five minutes is all you can do that's okay you're going to build up and just gradually build up until you can get to the point where 30 minutes feels comfortable and initially it might be 10 minutes in the morning 10 minutes in the afternoon once you can do that a couple of days a week, maybe you can up it to three or four days a week. Maybe you can up it to, you know, 12 minutes in the morning, 12 minutes in the afternoon. However works for you, just start adding a little bit of movement into your day. And if you're somebody, if you're an entrepreneur and you're sitting at your desk, please get up at least once every hour and do something quick, some kind of movement. Make it fun. Dance a little. Do some jumping jacks. Do some stepping jacks. I don't know if you ever heard of stepping jacks, but instead of jumping, you just step, you know, and that's a good way to start too. Instead of, you know, doing it as a jump, you do it as a step and, you know, you're just moving, get your body moving. Mindset, mindset is huge. And I'm going to start talking about that on the next slide. So here we go. Mindset really is key to getting this healthy lifestyle right. What is mindset? Mindset is really kind of like the lens that you look through. It is really your attitude, how you see things, how you interpret things, how you interpret other people. And when we have an open mindset, we feel like, okay, I can learn new things. Yes, you can teach this old dog new things. Okay, I'll try some new vegetables. Okay, I'll try walking for 10, 12, 15 minutes in the morning. Okay, I'll try a little bit of chair yoga. Uh, you're being open 
to trying new things. That's a growth mindset, okay? Another thing that you want to think about is how we're nourishing our body. And when your mindset becomes that, that I want to nourish my body with healthy, good, nutritious foods, rather than thinking, oh, I, you know what? I can never eat this. I can never eat that again. I can never eat something else again. No, that's not true because I still, I still indulge in, in desserts. Not all the time, but yes, there's a time and a place. We all want to have fun with food. It's like a party in our mouth with a big old chocolate cake, right? I'm not ever telling anybody that you could never have that experience. I'm telling you, you shouldn't do it every single day if you really, truly want to lose weight and want to have, um, enjoy a healthier life. Okay. Now, what is a fixed mindset? A fixed mindset is like when you say, okay, I'm just addicted to uh, junk food and that's the way it is. Well, if that's the way you think, guess what? That's the way it'll be. Okay. We are, I'll, I'll be honest with you. We are addicted to that junk food. And do you want to know why? It's because the food industry hire scientists and their sole job is to be a craveability expert. That's their job. They are try, they are putting in all the right ingredients, the right amount of salt, the right amount of sugar, the right amount of fats, the right amount of crunch so that it is so delicious, so um, satisfying in your mouth, that explosion, that party in your mouth that I'm talking about that you just want more and you want more. And something else I just discovered recently is that not only that, but they create the bags so that they're easy to reach into. Think of a chip bag, right? You can set that bad boy right there on the table, right there on the couch next to you. It stays open, doesn't it? So you can easily reach right in there and grab more. That's all. It's all marketing, folks. It's all marketing so that you stay addicted and they make more money because you buy more junk. All right. It's true. So when you really swap that mindset around and, and start thinking, okay, yeah, I want to live a healthier life. I want to, you know what, for me, this is what it was. And I'll share this is that I've, I've seen friends, I've seen people maybe that I know not so well, but struggle to walk from their car to the grocery store. And it breaks my heart. I'm like, we do not have to be in that type of position, okay? It doesn't matter if we're 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. If we take care of our body, we can start now. It doesn't matter where you are in life, what, what kind of condition your body is in. You can start today and it'll make a difference six months from now, a year from now, two years, five years from now. It'll make a huge difference. But I want to remain as independent as possible as I go through, like I said, this last chapter of my life, I'm 65 years old. I figure I've got about 30 years to live. I want to live. I don't want to be stuck at home. I don't want to be relying on others to do things for me. I want to keep being out there. I want to be on the golf course. I want to be on the ski slopes. I want to be riding my bike. I want to be walking through the forest. Okay. All of those great things I want to be. And just as simple things as shopping. I want to be able to shop myself, put my groceries away, carry my groceries in and out. You know, I want to be able to be independent, put my own shoes on. Okay. That's in, in order to do that. We've got to start wherever you are now and continue to build that help moving forward. So if you are looking to kind of help change your mindset, grab an affirmation or two. I have one of these on my refrigerator and I have one of them on the cabinet where I keep my nuts and uh, dried fruit. I, I That's what I usually run for if I'm looking for a little snack, but I remind myself before I go in there so I don't take like a whole Cub, I just take a little handful, right? Just a little handful, all right? So I choose foods that fuel my body and provide energy. My body is my temple. I choose to honor it with nutritious, wholesome foods. Find one of these, discover one of these. And just like if you're an entrepreneur, you probably are uh, reading affirmations that that have to do with, you know, keeping yourself in line with business, keeping yourself um you know, honorable to yourself and authentic and all of that. Same thing here. If you want to have better health, if you want to have more vitality, if you want to live a healthier life, then find an affirmation that really um, speaks to you and use that every single day. 
I want to talk a little bit about mindful eating because when we are mindful about the way we eat, when we are look at it, you know, put a when you create a plate for yourself, it should be appetizing looking, it should be appealing, it should be colorful, it should be, you know, something that looks and tastes delicious. Because when I eat whole foods, it's delicious. I don't need anything that tastes yucky. It, I just don't. That's not what I'm about. But when you sit and just really are tuned into your meal, as opposed to mindless eating in front of the TV with a big bowl or bag of chips, anybody done that? I have. I, I mean, my husband, this, my husband and I, this used to be like a pretty regular activity for us, right? Pop on a movie, make a bowl of popcorn, um, you know, grab a bag of chips, whatever it was, just sit there and you just eat and you're not really paying attention. All of that is just filling our body with um, empty calories, like non-nutrition. I shouldn't say empty calories because they're calories. It's adding fat. It's adding, you know, all kinds of um, calories to it, but there's no nutrition in it. Whereas when you're mindful and you take your time and you're really enjoying your meal, that's when you can tune into your body. You'll know when you feel satisfied because you're paying attention. Put the screens away. Don't do it in front of your computer. Put your phone away and just enjoy the meal. And when you do that and slow down, you will know our bodies, we know innately when we're full. And when you start to recognize and feel that comfort level, you don't have to count calories. Although I have an idea of how much, you know, how many calories are in something. And if you've ever been on a diet, you have some idea of how much calories, you know, or anything, but you don't have to count calories if you begin to tune in to your own body and know when you feel satisfied. And then when you're eating mindfully and slowly and paying attention to all of that, you will stop when you're satisfied, okay? If you feel like, oh my gosh, that was so delicious. I need to have a second plate full. Stop and wait about 10 minutes and you'll realize, oh yeah, I'm satisfied. Have a glass of water, something to help you recognize when you feel satisfied instead of overstuffed. I promise you, you'll feel a lot better. I used to live on Tums, anybody else, right? Tums, um, Rolaids, one of those things. Almost every night before bed, I'd, you know, oh, I'd need the Tums. It's because I overate. I, I'm so happy to only on very rare occasions, if I happen to eat something that, you know, doesn't really agree with me. But I, I used it every night, every night before bed, I would be eating that, okay? If you feel like you're challenged with cooking, I can help you there too. All of these meals, these beautiful meals that you see in front of you, uh, I can I can show you how to make them in less than 30 minutes. There's pad thai. I've never made pad thai before. This pineapple chicken, uh, it's called tropical pineapple chicken. Oh my gosh, a one dish meal. You slice up uh, the chicken and some green peppers, so in some uh, snow peas and a seasoning packet with a can of pineapple. Pop it in the oven for about 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes maybe until the chicken is done. And you've got a one dish meal, super delicious, super healthy. Um, and uh, enchiladas, whatever the whole, I, I could talk to you for an hour just about the meals. And this is uh, part of what I teach, part of what I promote. I partnered myself with a company that offers spice blends that are clean without artificial colors, out of artificial sweeteners, without um, any uh, preservatives. It's dehy It's just dehydrated food in the seasoning packet. So you can whip together a wholesome delicious meal in a matter of minutes and stick to healthy, clean eating, but have it done in a hurry. Super fun, super, um, super amazing. This is really about how to get movement into your day. You know, just get outside, take a walk, enjoy time with your children, um, enjoy time with your, with your spouse, your significant other. And you know what, even working, uh, uh, housework, housework is, is physical movement. Okay. You ladies know what I'm talking about. You get the vacuum out, you get the mop out, you get, you know what? We are moving. So when you're doing it, put a little oomph into it and you're going to get your movement activity. That's 
the way I convince myself to get my housework done. Okay, Dara, you can do your 30 minutes of movement just by getting your housework done today. Okay, I'm killing two birds with one stone, right? It's a great way to do it. So I don't want you to think that the only way to, you know, qualify for, you know, getting those movement activities is to go to the gym for an hour a week, a day. Um, unless that's what you like to do. If that's convenient and that's what you like to do, more power to you. It's, that's extremely beneficial, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can, like I said, you can play with your children, dance in the living room. Um, I put this slide in here. I, I did this presentation for a group of moms. So, but just think about, you know, yourself just out taking a walk. I love being outdoors, taking a walk and being adventurous that way. Whatever works for you, put on a YouTube video, you know, uh, I'll be dating myself, but anybody remember Richard Simmons? You can still find him on YouTube and you can be sweating to the oldies with Richard Simmons. What fun, you know, just pop it on for 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is. And you can, uh, you know, just move and groove. It's just about putting in some movement, 30 minutes, five days a week. That's your goal you know, and again, start out slow, start out where you can. But the impact of movement on our physical health, it, it makes sense. It's going to help you with your weight management, your cardiovascular health. Our heart needs to be pumping a little faster. It It's just like any other muscle, right? When you use it, and then when you're at rest, then it's really resting. When we don't do that, it's at rest is at a higher rate than we want it to be. For strength and flexibility, this is important just for everyday living. Like I said, you know, putting away groceries, what about the next time you fly on an airplane? How hard is that for you to stick your um, suitcase up in the overhead bin? My good friend Laura talks about that, and I never thought of it before, but this is really just about being able to live life, like do those household things that you need to do. You know, you're carrying in heavy groceries, you're putting them away, you're putting them, you know, in lower cabinets, upper cabinets, all of that stuff. We need to maintain our, our strength and flexibility. It also enhances our immune system. I, I'm not going to go into great detail, but our lymphatic system, it does not have its own pump in the way it, it actually, which is, you know, huge in our immune um, system, but it, it, you need to move in order to get that all uh, humping and it'll give you improved sleep. I know a lot of people as they start eating, having trouble sleeping. Well, get some movement in during the day. It will actually energize you. And if you think, oh my gosh, I'm too tired to move. And I've had that happen to me. I'm too tired. I don't want to take my walk. As soon as I start going five, six, seven minutes later, oh, boom, guess what? I'm energized. So it does. It actually movement activity actually will energize you, will give you more energy. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but try it. I, I swear to you, it really, that's absolutely true. It's also impact on your um, mental health. There's mood enhancement, stress reduction, cognitive function. The rates of cognitive decline and dementia and Alzheimer's are going through the roof here in the U.S. I imagine all across the the world and many and many of the um, industrialized countries, but I I just really have, have looked at the research here in the U.S. and uh, a lot of that has to do with the food we're eating. A lot of it also has to do with um, the amount that we're moving or not moving. Because when we're moving, the blood is pumping throughout our body. It maintains brain health, mental resilience, all of that. Movement impacts every organ in our body, including our brain. And we want to keep our brain functioning as well as we possibly can. So just um, get out there and move. What happens when we don't move? Muscle atrophy. It means that they start to uh, shrink. Um, we, we lose bone density. Oh gosh. So uh, you've heard of osteopenia, osteoporosis. It's when our bones start um, deteriorating, actually, you know, um, we want to maintain that because as you often hear of, uh, people as they age and they fall, then they break bones, they break hips, they, all of that kind of thing. A lot of that has to do with the fact that their bones are getting brittle. We can help. It doesn't mean that this is a hundred percent guarantee, but we can help reduce the uh, bone density loss by doing a little bit of strength training and strength training doesn't mean have to mean lifting um, heavy 
heavy weights or anything like that. It's just, you can use your own body for strength training. And again, uh, check in with Laura Rivens for that. Uh, joint stiffness. Do you feel joint? Do you feel stiff? Are you, you know, unable to move? Well, guess what? The more we move, the less stiff we'll be. And initially you're stiff. It's like, oh, oh. I do want to recommend if you're starting to do some kind of exercise, some kind of movement routine, please, you know, consult with your doctor, make sure it's all good for you. And that term, no pain, no gain. No, that's not for us. Anybody who, you know, that's for young kids, the athletes, super athletes. We, if something hurts when you're doing an exercise, stop, don't keep doing it. Check with a professional, check with a, you know, a certified uh, professional trainer, check with your doctor, check with a PT, check with somebody who knows, you know, about the inner workings. If something hurts, you should not continue to do it. Okay. Maybe a little discomfort, like when you're starting to do some stretching, you'll feel a little, you know, you'll feel that little stretch. I'm not talking about that. Um, but really if there's, if there's pain, stop. Okay. Um, we start to have cardiovascular issues. We start to have posture problems, digestive issues. Oh my gosh. Movement is huge. If you're not moving the inside stuff every day, uh, part of it could be, you're not, don't have enough fiber in your diet. Another part is that you could not, that maybe you're not moving enough. Now, like I said, I worked with um, individuals with disabilities my entire life, and that was very often an issue for uh, individuals who do not have the ability to move their own bodies, and they need to use a wheelchair for access, and they need you know people to help them move. Well, that was a big job of the of the physical therapist. It was to help them get into different kinds of standing positions, moving positions, so that you know, that digestive system would work better. When we're sedentary, all of that food that's in there gets sedentary too. We need to help it move. So not only the fiber, the water, but also movement is going to help with your entire digestive tract and circulation. If you're, you know, getting swelling around the ankles, things like that. Um, again, talk to your physician, please. But uh, movement can really help with circulation, keeping everything circulating around your body. So let's just move and groove, right? And keep it simple. Just start out small and add to it um, as the days go on. Are you ready to really harness the power of your mind for better health? And again, like I said, it starts here. Like you've got to have that mindset that yes, you know, it's about empowering myself, empowering my body, living my best life, developing all that I can um, develop to live, to, to enjoy and, and do all of that. And when we have a health mindset, a growth mindset, a mindset that, yes, I want more, I want more areas of wealth in my life, then that is when your life will explode. And I am just absolutely honored to have been here today. If you would like to begin your journey jump on a ditch session with me. Yeah, if you want to bitch during your bitch ditch session, go right ahead. But I have a free call for you. Seriously, I would like to help you figure out which steps you yourself can take to get on a better path for this area of wealth in your life. And when you are ready to, you know, jump all in, let me know. But just, this is just a free 30 minute call Let's just talk about where you're at. I can give you a couple of tweaks. We can't change it all at once. That's not what I'm trying to teach people to do. I, I, what I teach is take a couple of steps at a time, just a couple of things, and then you just add to it. And this is, you know, it's not about being, being where you want to be in six weeks. It's about adopting this as a true lifestyle, as a true journey to better health, to, to this portion of wealth in your life. So I want to thank you very much. I am going to, um, I don't know why my mouse is not showing here. I wanted to stop the share, but here it is. And I want to thank you so much for being here with me today. And again, Tina, thank you so much for this summit. It was an honor and a privilege to be a part of this. And please 
reach out to me at uh, Ditch Session. I'm Dara Lee Simmons. You can follow me on Facebook or uh, Instagram, any of those, uh, uh, LinkedIn. Just uh, look for Dara Lee Simmons, and I look forward to helping you with your journey to better health. This wealth. Bye-bye now. Wow. First, I know Darley will definitely listen to this recording. I just want to thank you, Darley, for doing that recording. I had a little bit of a hiccup in the beginning because I kept lagging. I was afraid, afraid to go to full screen, <laughs> but it worked. And I'm so glad. And I hope everybody got to hear it. Uh, the closed captions were running as well. That would also help. And uh, the Twinkie story, I mean, how many people have not heard about the Twinkie story? That is the truth. Richard Simmons, yeah, that ages us. I know several of us probably laughed at that one. And another thing that Daryl Lee has is Meatless Mondays. She's been doing that now for over, I think she just hit her first year. So that's also something you may want to join in on as it, you know, just one little step makes a big difference. And I know she does those on her Facebook and I believe she does them live. So very good insight. Does anyone have any feedback they want to give um, or comments they want to give to Dara Lee when she looks back at this recording? Please unmute yourself and feel free. All right. I I'll, I'll, say, I'll say I really admire her for the dedication, you know, and, and figuring something out because after, you know, trying diet after diet after diet, and then she's like, okay, I got to do something different. And now she's figured out something different and she wants to share that with people to make it easier for them. I think that's the, the theme of this summit is like, hey, I figured something out. I want to shortcut it and make it easier for you. Well said, Julia. Well said. That about sums it up. That is true. Let's give a hand for Dara Lee, Julia's insight. And we are so thankful, Dara Lee, that you were able to do that recording. And we are looking, uh, going to be working. Uh, Matina and I did swap. Uh, Matina is actually going to be up next. She is in Germany. So she's six hours ahead of our schedule. So it's about 10 p.m. and her time. Matina, thank you so much for coming and deciding, you know, to join us and switch in with me because I didn't want you to be up so late. And Matina, it has a company called New Start For You. And she is going to be talking to us about it is quite possible to land in depression without noticing the process. Become aware of the symptoms so you can help people dear to you who are in a downward spiral without realizing it. We've heard that word spiral mentioned in several scenarios today, from roller coaster to spiral staircase to spiraling just in general. She's going to talk about how to build a life for yourself that is awesome, successful, healthy, and fun. We all love fun. The F word, another F word. Learn about methods to do so that won't break the bank. Okay, now we really need to learn, learn that one. With all the financial talk today with Janet's insights and all of that good stuff, I am so pleased to bring Matina to the spotlight and let her share her expertise. Matina, let me uh, get you to unmute and I will spotlight you. It is all yours. Hi, hello everyone. So happy to be here. You right. Um, I start you off with uh something from my life. Here's a little story. <laughs> I was cold and I was so tired and exhausted. I was out walking my dog. It was dark. And the park was covered in ice and snow. I felt I couldn't walk another step. I felt dizzy. And I literally had trouble staying on my feet. I decided to lie down. And because it felt too wrong to do so on the path, 
I stumbled through the trees lining it and up a few steps onto a slope where during the day uh, kids would toboggan down. So the snow there was really hard, pressed down and uh, very icy, slippery, but I, I literally crawled on all four and lay down there. Um, I didn't feel it was weird. Uh, there wasn't anywhere there to see me anyway. And I lay down on that packed snow and looking up um, like, and saw some branches above me that were swinging in the light, slight breeze. And they looked beautiful. They looked ethereal. And for the first, first time in as long as I could remember at that point, I felt at peace. And that was, that was so wonderful. Because for the previous around about two years, two years and a half, I was sad, just sad, completely through and through. And there was no change in that. All encompassing sadness. And this peace that I suddenly felt was the most wonderful experience. I noticed I would, wasn't cold anymore. I felt perfectly warm and comfortable on that icy slope in the middle of the night. Peace, no sadness. I wanted to last this. I wanted this to last forever. And I decided to just stay there and let things take their course. At some point, a couple of dogs ran up to me and said hi. I knew them and I knew their owner. I knew he would be close and I could call out to him. He is a big, strong guy and he knew I had a depression. He knows what a depression is. He had uh, personal experience in his own family and um, he would be able to get me home. My home was actually not even a five minute walk away, but I wasn't able to do it. It seemed as far away as the, um, as the moon I could see above me in the sky. I didn't call out. I was embarrassed to be needing help. I was too embarrassed to call out to someone who would completely understand what my problem was and ask him to take me home five minutes. I just lay there. The dogs ran away. They were happy. They had no idea what they were witnessing. And I lay there at peace. I felt warm. Didn't make sense. I knew that. Still felt warm. It was good. And I wasn't sad. It was wonderful. I just wanted that peace. And then something made me turn my head to the, my left. I don't know if he'd made a sound. But uh, there was my dog, shivering hard. He was looking at me. I couldn't read his expression in the moonlight. But I could clearly see his little body shaking with the cold. And suddenly I had energy. Suddenly I was able to get up and walk home because my darling little dog was suffering. I was able to walk home. It was only five minutes to safety into my, sorry, into my warm apartment because my little pup needed that. That's what depression can do to you. I'm sorry, I've... that's what a depression can do to you. I have always in my life been a very joyful person. I grab life with both hands and make the most of it. I always have done that and I'm doing it again. Life is wonderful, again. Life is completely different now from before the depression. Um, to give you a timeline, I got hit by the depression about nine or ten years ago. Not completely sure because it was a downward spiral that uh, you've heard about before in other areas of wealth or the lack of it. And, uh, and... I uh, had years of 
very much talk therapy. I had two stays in clinics, one eight weeks, one 13 weeks. I have been taking antidepressants for those nine or 10 years. I still take them, but at a very low dosage compared to earlier. And I'm here today to tell you what a depression is. Now that was an insider's view. It's different for everyone, but um, what it can be is it can have that wish for everything to just end. And uh, it is difficult to get out of a depression. But here's the thing. It's pretty bla bloody easy to, to not get into one if you know what to watch out for. So that's why I'm here. That's my new mission in life, um, to get as many people as I can knowledgeable about, um, about the problem of a depression. Problem. I mean, it's, it's just an illness like any other. It's, uh, it's an illness that has a stigma assigned to it for many people because it's a mental thing. It's a psychological thing. And... Um, my mother, for instance, up until her death, believed that all this psychological bullshit was just that, bullshit. She didn't believe in mental illnesses, although she had a daughter with one. And as it turns out, her husband, my father, has a depression as well. I never knew about that, but uh, he only told me after my mother died. And that is one of the um, points that increase the likelihood of a person uh, to fall into depression. It's if you have someone in your family who's had it or has it. And uh, But that's really just uh, statistics. And the thing is, uh, the doctors still don't know what really causes a depression because I think it's a lot of things that um, come together. Uh, there's a very nice picture that explains something. Uh, if you take a glass, just a perfectly normal glass, and fill it up about halfway with water, and you take a second glass, the same size, but you fill about this much water in it, uh, and imagine that's uh, what you heard about before, your limiting beliefs. Um, Free explained all about limiting beliefs, so I don't need to go there, but you've got a glass of water this full and this full. That's the all the negative beliefs you hold in your um, subconscious and all the negative stuff that's happened to you in your life. It doesn't have to be beliefs. It can be anything that has happened to you in your life. One glass very little full, one glass, quite full. And then, for instance, a traumatic event happens. That can be you losing your job. It can be someone dear to you dying. And that adds this much more fluid to the glass. The glass that was already pretty full will flow over. The glass that only had a little bit in it will still have space for more bad stuff to happen. And the glass flowing over represents uh, that poor person going down that slippery slope into a depression. So that's something that uh, I actually got from a doctor's website, <laughs> that comparison. Uh, he didn't say anything about limiting beliefs. That is my personal interpretation. And I'm not a doctor and I'm not a therapist. I'm just someone who's got some experience with my own depression. And I have, of course, spoken over the years with a lot of other people who have a depression because I was in self-help groups. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's how it can come. So I'll give you a few pointers, uh, likely symptoms. And again, the thing is, this isn't like a broken bone uh, where you have basically a very clear symptom of pain in a particular area. Um, 
because the mind and the body are so interrelated, uh, it can actually, something like uh, pain that gets more and more severe and more and more chronic uh, can be a symptom of a depression that's getting there. And depressions don't just woof, happen usually unless there's uh, like a sudden trauma, like a car accident or someone dying that can trigger a depression. Um, they usually increase. And that is also the danger to it because you don't necessarily notice it happening. So um, most cases, it is someone near and dear to the person who develops a depression, who notices a change in them. So please pay attention to anything like the following that might be changing in someone you know and you like, you love. Uh, one of them is uh, just feeling down a lot more than you're used to. Uh, depression is feeling down all the time or most of the days, most of the time but um, everybody feels down every now and then, and that's perfectly normal. It's when it goes down and it stays down for a long period of time, maybe a little bit up, but never really happy anymore. Like a person in a depression can literally not physically feel joy. It's, it's impossible due to the brain chemistry. Um, something that was an early symptom for me was that I stopped having fun with activities I used to love. Like, <laughs> I'm a fit fitness nut, or I used to be, I don't look like one anymore, um, but I used to do a lot of fitness, boxing, uh, karate, anything. I cycled absolutely everywhere, I didn't own a car. And uh, I went mountain climbing, I did snowboarding, skiing, kite surfing, mountain climbing, rock climbing, anything, you know? And I wasn't interested anymore. Completely lost interest, stop all of that. Someone could tell me, um, do you wanna go skiing tomorrow? And I'd be like, nah. And what I did instead was sleep. I just slept. And that is another symptom. Um, people who are on that downward spiral um, are very often tired, very frequently tired is what I mean, or they feel exhausted. Uh, that can be, both of that can be without any apparent reason. It can also be because they've developed insomnia. Most people with a de depression um, also have insomnia and insomnia is what happens first and then it stays there. Uh, that can be not being able to fall asleep in, in the evening and it can also be something like waking up at 1am and not being able to go back to sleep for several hours. Um, then Something else is uh, most people who are developing a depression feel like everything's just too much. They do just can't handle as much as they used to be able to handle. Uh, or they have difficulty, difficulty concentrating or remembering something. Like, you know, these... Um, when you log in somewhere and they send you an email and you've got to put in six digits that were in the email, someone with a depression will very often have trouble remembering those six digits without looking back and forth two or three, three times. Um, and uh, then there's something else. <laughs> and um, that had me flummoxed because I developed asthma. I developed uh, heart arrhythmia. I had, I mean, I Nikki isn't here. We could talk shit with Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my digestion was very, very off in the other direction. And uh, 
a lot of people start eating a lot or eating very little. A lot of uh, it's actually most people actually um, lose weight. That was unfortunately not the case for me. I put more on, not that I had too little before. And um, so what what I had was all kinds of um, physical illnesses that were measurable. I went from one specialist to the next and um, but uh, they couldn't find a reason. The heart specialist due to the where I went for the heart arrhythmia that I occasionally had, it of course didn't present itself while I was there and he did um, um, what's it called? Well he 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 put something on my chest and he was watching, literally watching my heartbeat. And after a while he said, you know, I could I could save this video and put it on the web saying, this is what a healthy heart looks like. And still I got dizziness spells and literally fell over. I fell out of chairs with armrests on. So I didn't drive a car anymore because it was too risky. And uh, so if there are several symptoms that don't make sense, just check. Now that's, uh, so that was all the bad stuff. <laughs> um, here's the good stuff. Um, important to keep your mental health up. Uh, is to plain and simply pay attention to it. And um, learning to do that is quite easy. Um, you can do some meditation practice. You can uh, look at mindfulness practices. There are all sorts of courses everywhere. You could, uh, could, can get a book, you can get a video, you can uh, participate in a course. All of that is not expensive and not difficult to get to. I think uh, mindfulness is actually um, something really important. Another thing is fitness, um, because when you keep your body healthy and moving, that actually helps the parasympathicus and the sympathicus the nervous systems and um, a healthy nervous system stops depression from happening. So uh, the fitter you are, the more you do for your body, the less likely you are to actually develop a serious mental illness. And uh, something else, what did I think of as well? Um, be with people, that helps too and uh, find things that you enjoy. Uh, there are um, cognitive behavioral uh, therapy has all sorts of how to's uh, that people can do to get out of a depression. And the cool thing is they work also to keep you from ever having one. Uh, that includes um, simply making a list of stuff that you enjoy doing and every now and then just point at the list and pick one and do it. You can have it on little uh, cards and mix them, point, get something out and do that. Yeah. Oh, um, thanks, Matina. Matina, I do have a question. So. Yes. Wow. Your story is unbelievably amazing. I have, uh, it's been a pleasure just getting to know you and relate so much from fa family dynamics. So when getting out of this and you've done absolutely amazing, give us all the accolades of how you started your own business and the value that you bring beyond what your experience is to help other executives and people that are dealing with it. Cause there's no one, and you know, Julia hit it earlier, our experience and our expertise is from our own personal, our own personal struggles. So give us some insight on how it all started for you. <laughs> um, how the depression started or how my new business started? 
Yes. And helping others. Cause you have tell, let everyone know what your amazing techniques are and, and your, your knowledge. We need to see that part. <laughs> well, uh, like I mentioned before, the fact that for some people, the glass is already pretty full and, and mine was uh, filled nearly to the brink before the, uh, my personal trigger happened, which, uh, it doesn't really matter what it was. I had a trigger, but the reason I fell into depression was my glass being already quite full, full of limiting beliefs in my case. I mean, there's, um, it's probably different for different people, but um, I have found a way um, where I, I do need a practitioner for that, uh, a coach, a practitioner, uh, whatever they might call themselves uh, of a, of a method that clears limiting beliefs. And I have cleared uh, limiting beliefs. Uh, one of them was, I'm not lovable. That's actually one that like 90 plus percent of everyone in this world has. Um, I had one, I'll never be good enough, whatever I do. Uh, so try to live up to that. And um, this method that I actually learned because it's so great uh, and I do that for my clients now it uh, starts with a question like what is it that you are experiencing in your life that you'd rather not experience or um, what is it that you want to accomplish and that for some unknown reason is not happening for you Something along those lines is where we start. And then um, I take my client into a trance-like uh, state. They remain awake and aware the entire time. So it's it's not something that I do with them. It's it's really, um, it's it just enables me to talk directly to their subconscious. And then we take a little trip into their imaginal realm. I suggest a few things and uh, their subconscious comes up with everything else. And uh, this method enables me to help my client to completely, to first to find the limiting belief that is the reason for the answer to that question, one of those questions I mentioned before. We discreate that limiting belief completely and because we're already in the subconscious and there's now a hole in the subconscious that needs filling, um, we create a new empowering belief that can be absolutely brilliant. Um, it should be ex absolutely brilliant. It should be the best one they can come up with. Um, and we install that in that empty spot. And life as we know it will never be the same again. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It, it is life changing. I had quite a number of those sessions uh, in the course of learning to do it as uh, a coach myself. And uh, my life literally is completely different because I've I've released all of those. It's amazing. And uh, you know all about limiting beliefs already because Free told you, so I don't have to go into that. No, I mean, yes, everybody. So the, so a lot of the panel today, it's all been intertwined, Matina, all yeah. been intertwined in how we can pull out. And, you know, as we work with other entrepreneurs and executives and things of that nature, you know, some of the most highest profile, powerful, wealthiest, financially wealthiest people you know, you get to a point, and I think Ali mentioned this, you know, you can have the perfect company, everything's working out smoothly, things are going well, but you're lonely, you're sad, Yeah. you know, yes. so it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you still have that, as you said, that hole, that space that needs to be filled, and sometimes it's going back into that past trauma to pull that out and as you said it's the subconscious mind sometimes because you don't realize it you're just going 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 every day and you don't you want to avoid it because you don't want to deal with it but then eventually it does catch up to you if you don't resolve the issue it will come up in the weirdest ways either in an illness physical illness or it'll affect your judgment call we were talking earlier about how emotions can really mess up a decision 
it just enhances a lot more things when you do not have the five areas of wealth healthy. Yes. And that's exactly why I like the summit so much, because these five areas, they interconnect and you can live a truly happy life only if you've got all of them. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. And that's why we're here. It's it's just amazing what you can do with the subconscious mind and how you've learned how to do that to help others. So you work to heal yourself under all the stigma of it. And now you help other executives and people get to their legacy in whatever it is. It's the most important thing. It was one of my things years ago. I was afraid to make the the change. Just like you, you know, you found your way. We all find our way. And I had to remove those limiting beliefs and get jump out of that fear and take that risk because I knew that I needed to, I knew there was more for me. And that sometimes is something too that you have to learn for yourself is knowing where you're meant to be, where you're going, and then circle, and then the people around you. Once you're around for any executive or any person, once you're around, and you probably say this too, Matina, once you're around the alignment of people that empower you, you know you found your, you know you found your tribe. And that's how I, I put it. And I just thank you uh, uh, so much for, for this. This is a very powerful, uh, a powerful thing for you and to tell us your story. Does anyone have any questions for Matina? Please unmute, you, unmute yourself. That is perfectly fine. And since, uh, since there's no questions at the moment, uh, please feel free to hop in. Uh, there is one thing I would like to say. It doesn't matter at all what you do, um, what method you use to uh, get rid of limiting beliefs that you have. Um, everybody has limiting beliefs. Uh, some are really bad, some are not so bad. And it, uh, again, that glass, very full or pretty empty. Um, it depends on how much impact those limiting beliefs have on your life. And there are piles and piles of ways to get rid of them or to handle them better or to reduce their impact. Um, Free told you a lot about tapping and that is an awesome way, a very easy and uh, financially uh, low cost way because you can do a lot yourself. A lot can be done with hypnotherapy. I have also seen a gentleman do it uh, simply talking to someone and then uh, he, fig he figures out what uh, pretty much the limiting belief is. And all he does is um, he connects energetically and this is woo woo stuff, but I have found this to be real. And he says, um, are you willing to step out of feeling such and such or believing this and that and uh when the people person he's talking to says yes i'm ready to do that um he starts coughing because the energy release is um causes that in him or there are people there's uh, there's the body code my uh, body code emotion code belief code um by dr forget the name, but um, if you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, that is also based on energy work and a practitioner who who does the belief code can literally hop on Zoom or they can even do it. If you've got previous um, uh, contact with them and they can get into your energy and get rid of stuff. They, uh, um, Whether you believe it or not, someone has actually done that for my dog. So, uh, and that's definitely, he has definitely changed his behavior. And that wasn't around me who knew about this um, work being done, but be, uh, around friends while I was uh, traveling to the United States. I left him with friends and he behaved differently with them uh, compared to previous visits he had at their place uh, when I was away just for a day. 
and he behaved very differently. And that was uh, done through um, energy work. So it, it I mean, I, it really works. There are many ways. Hypnotherapy is another one. And uh, there are there are ways uh, like you can write down a belief and it, it feels right. Then you can just uh, like if you write down, I am useless and uh, you, you try to feel into that belief. And if it feels like, holy shit, that's so true, then you've got that limiting belief. If if it doesn't feel true, well, don't try to make it true. Right. Um, just. Be happy you haven't got that one. But if you do, what you can do, you can scribble it out. You can scratch it out. You can rip the piece of paper to pieces and let out all a lot of feeling, a lot of energy, a lot of anger. Just let it out and uh, destroy that paper as well as you can and flush it down the toilet or burn it up, whatever feels right. Um, that can get rid of a limiting belief. And when you do, when you do get rid of one, try to install something good instead, because there's a, there's an empty spot in your subconscious. Then, just you can install a good one by coming up with something really nice, writing it up, make it really pretty, make it beautiful, um, say it, sing it, dance it, dance your name if you feel like it. I'm kidding. Um, but dance, dancing helps. Um, just be happy. Put energy into that. Hang it up on your bathroom mirror or whatever and believe it. What doesn't work in my experience is simply just putting an affirmation there and just telling yourself, I'm, I'm, I don't know, uh, just giving yourself an affirmation without doing the re removal stuff first. Mm -hmm. Kim, um, yeah, Kim raised her hand. Go ahead, Kim. I just want to say I'm going to do that now because I I still have a few things with my identity and I'm going to and the limiting that's limiting beliefs. I think it's really good advice to practice this, like leave and everyone practice it in their own way. Whatever limiting belief, like a little one and mine is so little and it just hangs there nagging. It's not like a gigantic thing that's making me sunk, but it's just this little teeny thing. You have to lower, lower my hand now. So I'm not up there, but um, yeah, I'm going to practice it. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that technique. That's going to be very helpful. You can, yeah, definitely. Anybody else have any other good insight on anybody you may have experienced? Lisa, go ahead. Um, Matina, I'm just wondering, I know there's a lot of, uh, stigma around depression, but is there a way, I, I work a lot with younger, you know, children in, in grade school and up to high mm -hmm. school. And is there a way to approach the topic that's not offensive to the person who maybe has depression that can be a way to see them and offer uh, that there's a way through? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I'll have to think about that, actually, Lisa Louise. Oh, I know um, the PDF uh, that you gave has an enormous amount of, of uh, like, amazing information. I definitely look oh. at that and always definitely follow up with, with Tina because yeah. you're right. It's so dynamic and different. And the stigma, and she's got so much information on books and your free offer is on, your offer is on there too, Matina, your offers to the clients. I, I appreciate um, uh, I've I've got I've got some information there and uh I'm I'm planning to do uh um uh like a vision kind of thing to uh to give people a workshop uh it'll probably be two or three hours uh of envisioning what you want to do with your life over the next twelve months and the next three years and uh that has not really do anything to do with uh, limiting beliefs but it um it's it's just fun and uh, something to get into contact with uh, what you really want i haven't set a date yet and i haven't worked out the details yet but if you want to get on my mailing list i don't spam people um i'll let you know thank you 
And Lisa Louise, if I come up with something, I do remember one of the books I mentioned in the PDF um, written by Matthew Johnstone, who is a depression sufferer himself. And he happens to be an artist and an author <laughs> and uh, got into a depression. And he wrote two books. Uh, actually, he wrote more than two. I have two. And they're up in here in a sec. I think there's a lot of people that um, are, oh, I was going to talk while you were. And uh, these are the German translations. Um, one where he explains what the depression does to him. And one, and this is really, this is gold. It's just a tiny little book and it's, um, It's mostly drawings, pictures, no? but that little book is gold for people who have someone with a depression in their uh, near and dear ones, because it explains what to say, what to not say. And uh, um, just these two, um, that's the kind of thing that people can read in 10 minutes each. And uh, it gives you a, a pretty good overview without going into too many um, boring details. Can you give us the English translation? <laughs> it's, it's actually original. The English one is actually the uh, original and that's in the PDF. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. I'll go. Yeah, look I'll, I literally went through all the books I've got on depression and I picked... Uh, I picked these two books and uh, another one that's pretty old, but it is just one book and it keeps you busy for months. <laughs> it's it's both educational and it's kind of a workbook. It uh, is based on schema therapy, which one of the authors developed. And that goes very much into um, the pictures or, or images impressions of yourself that you have and uh, it speak they don't speak about limiting beliefs but it's it's a very similar area and, Kim, and i struck gold when i read into that uh, that was really impressive Kim, Kim, we're gonna add. I was gonna, yeah i was gonna say matina did a session with me or for me and it was amazing she, um, so I, I had written, a, I collabed a, a chapter with these people and I didn't know that I had depression. This was like 20 years ago. And I was writing the story about being in this black hole. I didn't know that. Right. I didn't know it at the time. And so what I was going to say, say when Matina was getting her book was there are a lot of people that don't even know that they're in it or even get served through it. And a lot of people serve through it. Like I actually, for six months, I went, my husband didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was going on and I worked through it and I got through it, but you know, um, Matina did, she really does have a gift it, and I saw all these amazing colors when it was, a, it was a, a longer, I was like, wow, she just, you know, it's a long session for me. Cause I'm not used to that, but it was just beautiful in the end. So. Thank you. <laughs> she, she does. She, she, uh, she is amazing. Uh, she did this thing with me when we were in Las Vegas about grabbing my arm. And it's a lot of what uh, Savan was talking about earlier in how it all connects and how you were trying to tap into my subconscious to get my thoughts from, was it from my brain to my belly or my belly to my brain? <laughs> that's uh, that's actually a trick from Aikido. It's, it's in it, the English word is one point. I can't remember the original anymore. Uh, you basically put your thinking mind behind your uh, belly button and the solar plexus area. Um, and um, when you practice with that with someone and they actually manage to 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 do that, to put, I mean, it sounds impossible, but it is, it, it is possible. You stand there and you just concentrate on thinking from your belly. And uh, of course, warn them first, but if you push before, then they will go like this, you know? And then once they've actually put their mind in their belly and, and successfully put it in their belly, you push, they don't move. 
I mean, they're literally, they're, they're like stone hard. And what that also does, and that's why I wanted to tell other speakers is uh, it calms you down. It calms you down so much. Do when you when you walk get on a stage and you're nervous, um, just put your mind into your belly. Breathe deeply. The nervous witness goes. And I have uh, just a couple of days ago learned from a lot, another lady. Um, I might send you uh, her details. Um, she says doing that, um, she didn't come from Aikido or uh, calming down. She came from stage presence. And she says when you put your mind down in your belly, um, it gives you a lot more presence and it changes the voice as well, I've noticed. And she did that and she had us guess, this was in a webinar, she had us guess at which time she had her mind in her head and versus her belly and we could tell. Wow. And that is amazing. I'm not doing that yet. I intend to learn it. Um, but right now, I, I it would be too much of different things going on in my thinking mind at the same time, putting it there and uh, doing something else. But I, I fully intend on learning that. And it does calm you down. I know that. Yeah, it's very, very interesting um, how you can do that and changing. I think the statistic is less than 5% of people uh, can actually be on stage the stage fright is just the number is enormous it's like well over a little five yeah. percent so just imagine how how is that fear so high what is it that that brings it up i had this conversation a, a few weeks ago with my friend and it's just amazing how that fear of stage fright is one of the highest possible mm. to overcome how do, you, how do you get taught about poems in great school do you learn them and then you recite them in front of the class? Or tell stories or, yeah. Oh, yeah, that happens for us too. Or the teacher, um, when I grew up, uh, the teacher would call us uh, to the front of the room and we had to do something in front of everyone. So nobody could tell us things, you know. Um, they would make a little... Um, they would grade us and you'd stand in front of everyone. And for me, uh, by the time I was in high school, whenever I got called out to go to the front, my mind just went, right, I'm gone. I'm not here anymore. So obviously those were always bad grades, which reinforces stage fright. So I think it's the school system, truly. I think it's the school system, not just in Germany. In the U.S., I went to school in the U.S. for a while. It was similar. I I don't know of anywhere where they don't do that. And that Fs it up. That's an F word for you, Tina. Not finances <laughs> uh, for kids um, to learn to speak in front of others. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing like where that it's got to be definitely a deep seated unknown a uh, trauma episode that cause it, causes that at such a young age, but we don't realize it. And then we grow up and to have less than 5% of people could actually stand on the stage and deliver a speech confidently. And that's amazing that the statistic is that low. Yeah. But it's easy to, to um, get rid of actually. Um, I don't have uh, experience myself, but I'm in, uh, or I was in a hypnotherapy course that Paul McKenna ran, the UK hypnotherapist. He's uh, he's really good and he's so funny. He has he is so much fun, and uh, that's actually where I got the one point exercise from. He uses that, and um, stage fright is one of the uh, it's it's a phobia, it's a slight phobia, um, but it is one of those that can be uh, are among the best healable through hypnotherapy is that a sentence anyway um hypnotherapy is an excellent way of getting rid of stage fright and it's it's quick wow. and you'll probably take two or three sessions and you're healed i mean literally and you do that 
not yet. No, I don't feel confident enough yet. I will eventually. But I know people who can. I know people who are good at it. So <laughs> let me know. I'll put you in contact with someone. <laughs> I mean, just imagine the amount of people that would be serviced under that. And it's not just like stage right as in getting up. It's just a lot of things, getting in front of people, being confident. You could be the most confident person behind the curtain, but to get you in front of five people, 10 people, 5,000 people, that changes you from that moment yeah. to that stage. So you can have all the confidence in the world in the shower singing, thinking you sound like the best singer or talking to your friends. Yes. But when you're out there, you know, getting on stage yeah. and having to talk, it's definitely, yeah, a phobia, a major fear. Well, yeah, I appreciate everything. you joining us so late in your evening. Thank you. Well, thank you so I loved much. I <laughs> So thank you for sharing your story, being vulnerable with us and sharing your inspiration and how you've pulled yourself out of this and now sharing that service call to others and making them become the best version of themselves. I, I applaud you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much, Tina, for putting the summit together. And uh, because um, a happy life doesn't happen if you don't have all of those ingredients. And uh, so you really enabled everyone by pulling all these specialists together and uh, providing uh, a well-rounded diet today. Yeah, exactly. And that's going to make us to be the best people, the best version of ourselves ever. And that's what the, the goal is. So we can continue to serve and prosperity. So thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank I'm the you. lucky. Thank you, Matina. <laughs> I'm the lucky victim next. Woo! I get to end the show. Everybody wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> I'm going to kick off uh, in, in reference to what Janet was talking about earlier. Janet works a lot with the smaller businesses. My career path was in some smaller businesses, but I focus a lot on the mid-sized businesses, the bigger corporations, and you'll see my geeky side as to why <laughs> in a little bit. So let me share my screen. And I will say I did not have enough time to do all my little bells and whistles. So y'all get like just the version without all the animation. Uh, so I'm not as good. I, I didn't get a chance to do all that stuff that Janet had, but I will do my best for y'all. All right. Can everybody see that screen? Okay, perfect. All right. So cash flow, yo. That's what it's about. Cash flow, yo. That's what we're looking for. We're going to play the cash flow challenge game. Spin the wheel, right? There we go. We spin the wheel. Five areas of wealth. I call myself the financial prosperity expert because my goal is to make you money. I have an, a terrible, terrible sickness or obsession in making money. I. It, it's going to be an interesting on how this happened. Uh, cause that was not my overall intention. <laughs> so here we go. Let's go down to the path of where I started. So who am I? Many of you know me, uh, you know, know me from talking to me, but I was born and raised in the badlands of Philadelphia. I had a single mom and a twin brother. I moved to North Carolina with my one-year-old son in 1994. And I went to technical business school, some college and things like that throughout my career path. A lot of my learning was people taught me, trained me on the job training, some courses here and there. And you heard my story about being bullied for 16 years. I work personally and professionally helping others with all types of problems for 35 years. I just didn't know that was not normal back in those days. Uh, my first problem solved was learning how to French braid Jenny's hair at the age of four. This girl had hair so long past her butt and her mom could not French braid her hair. And she said, Teen, could you figure out how to French braid my hair? And I said, yeah. So I went in and I said to my mom, how do you French braid? My mom looked at me like I was crazy. Where'd you hear that word? I said, Jenny Shirk. She said, I don't know how to teach you that. So my godmother happens to come and she showed me with my Barbie dolls. I practiced on my Barbie dolls for hours. When I get hooked onto something, time does not exist. 
I learned it and Jenny was hair was French braid up until I left Philadelphia. <laughs> so I did learn that. That's one of the things I did. I trained in junior high on the violin at a professional level in three months. Had nothing to do with me. I was determined to play with the Philadelphia Orchestra for the Holloway holiday concert. That was my goal. Learn this violin professionally and I can play with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And that's what I did. That was the most momentum part of my life. I wish I had it on recording, but I do not. But I will tell you, it was great. I got to do the violin for the entire year in school and it was the greatest. Um, I was a spelling bee geek. Nope, not because I knew English. English is my worst subject. I had a photographic memory. <laughs> so that's how I learned all the words. <laughs> asked me the definitions of the words and I didn't care about them. I just wanted to win because I was challenging myself. I have that terrible addiction of challenging myself. I use analogies and comedy as I explained a couple times in all of my training since I was younger. I actually grew up in a very poor neighborhood, um, less education. The parents had less education. So I was act people actually thought I was smarter than them. And it wasn't that I just was a bookworm. And so I had to learn, even talking to my own mom or my brother, to downplay some of the words I was using. So I started using analogies and simplistic, simplistic explanation of things because I was and then because of that, I um, just never got into the English language and math and science were my strong suits. Of course, I didn't realize that. I just was like, I can't speak like that. I couldn't believe they thought I was intelligent. Um, so that is what I do. I, I realize that the type of training that I've done in my 35 year career is I've, the goal was to engage them and be relatable. That's it. I didn't know that was a technique, but I knew that was what I needed to do. So I'm here now as a consultant leaving corporate world, as you guys know, because I wanted to make a bigger impact in the economy we're in. I was I was in property management during covid I saw how bad it was with the rental industry. The investors were suffering. The people were being told not to pay their rent. It was really bad, you guys may remember, but to actually be on the front lines, I was in the war. I was in the war. I didn't even, I stopped watching TV January 2021 and still haven't watched it. I don't watch the news or anything of that nature, but here's my goal. I said, you know what? I got to help these people because I know that when this is over, they're going to be out the door. Is this government really going to pay for this rent for this long for these people? So I had a foresight. I got on the phone as early as 6.30 in the morning, as late as 1130. And I brought in over $750,000 in seven, in seven months for these investors and to keep these residents in their home for when that moratorium lifted. And I was successful with that. So that is something that that's just what I did. I learned to solve problems. It did not matter what the problem was. I always found a way to solve it, whatever it took. So that is how that part was for me. Now, the method to my madness, that's one of the things people say, because I can't explain things when I'm trying to talk to someone about how we can fix something. I'm like, just trust the process and watch the method to the madness. Once it's all done, you'll understand. And it be, it's a lot of that is because I don't articulate well verbally, but I have that scientific mathematic brain, computer brain, right? So my mind is, is a lot like that. And I programmed a memory writer typewriter at the age of 18. I was in the insurance company in human resources. Well, people said, why'd you do that? Well, this lady that I was covering for had a baby and she would spend all types of overtime hours and she didn't get paid overtime. She would take some of this stuff home, do it from home, stay late at work. But I knew that when she came back, with that, and she had a baby to take care of. And I said, you know what? Let me figure this thing out. There's me. I'm like, where's the book? I read the book. Now, if y'all don't know what a memory writer, that's before computers became popular. <laughs> it was a memory writer typewriter. I pulled that book and I learned how to, how to program all of the letters. We were in human resources from every recruiter to the denial letters, new hire letters. When she came back, she was blown away. 
She said, why? She's crying. Why did you do that? Like, I know that took you so long. And I said, well, I didn't want you to have to work late and stay late because you had now, now have a newborn baby. So that is how I started this madness. I built my first custom big girl ERP system in 2004 for a convenience store. And how I got that job, because I worked with the father at the law office and quadrupled their income by learning their soft pro system and overhauled their entire uh, real estate practice. And that was a very interesting project. So after I built that, um, I was asked to be the staff accountant. Um, since I already knew the system and knew how all the data flowed, I did not have an accounting background. I did not like accounting. I was like, oh. What do I have to do? Well, here's me. Ooh, I already know the system. I can build the import export file data entry. All right, let's go. <laughs> so I had automated most of everything. So it was not hard for me. And then I had a CPA and I had an auditor and I had a lot of phenomenal training because I was willing to learn. One thing I learned in my career path, if you are eager to learn, people will teach you. And that is how I learned so much of what I did. So I did design um, in that process. I was actually in the fuel convenience industry right when the North Carolina lottery came and ethanol, <laughs> the corn with the gas. How ironic, right? I felt like Forrest Gump for a little while. Seriously, I was always placed in locations where big life changes happen. Rewind back to the insurance company I was working with in human resources I was there when uh, Family Medical Leave Act was implemented. We were one of the first pilot programs that started, and I got to learn that. So now here I am with ethanol in the North Carolina lottery. And in 2006, it was taking three of us four days to reconcile 25 convenience stores on the lottery tickets. That was insanity. I said, we cannot live like this. This is nuts. Long story, went all the way up the chain. I said, that's it. I need I need this CIA in a CSV file. They thought I was nuts. I went all the way through IT. Talk their language and everything. They said, we can only give it to you in a PDF. So I found the, the, the program called Monarch, which is a drilling program. I learned to drill mine the PDFs on what I needed, created the CSV file myself, and imported it through the template through the system. Okay. So once they finally gave me, oh, we can give you the CSV file now, months later, I said, well, I already designed the uh, standard operating procedures on how you can import this. And do you know that we caught theft within 30 seconds? The guy goes, no way. How are you doing that? Well, here's Tina solving a problem for North Carolina lottery system because they were brand new. I said, here you go. Here's how I designed it. Now you can go ahead and do what you need to do to code it. And everybody, I'm sure in North Carolina, all the retailers were given that, that document to be able to import and catch theft within seconds. And it was a beautiful process. It took, we re, were able to solve, I was able to reconcile 25 stores within 30 minutes and be able to report the theft on that. So again, solving a problem. Then the other thing is um, with one button, one button, one static field of an ERP system. It was the new pricing bubble system and the company I was working with, it changed the entire company dynamics completely. They threw out the pricing book. There was no more paper pricing book. Everything was done. Here's me. I solved the problem. That let, all I did was talk to three departments and I'm talking to the departments and I'm realizing the three of them aren't linking each other together. And I'm like, you've got this massive bubble system you designed, implement it throughout the entire company, France, China, the whole nine yards. How, why are you not doing this? So I hand it off. I designed it up, wrote it up, gave it to the IT director. And I said, can you do this? And he's like, I think so. And they programmed it. Everything went out the door. They were able to get everything instantly. A pricing for, for instance, Tina Meeks wanted to buy a piece of fabric at 1,500 yards. My pricing would be different compared to Janet's pricing. So that was the struggle because we were custom fabrics. 
right? So everything had to be customized. So it wasn't just easy breezy. This was real deep. We were all across the world. We were in global. So this made a huge difference from customer service to R&D to design, marketing, and they were able to grab everything on their laptop and phone. No more having to call constantly the pricing department, customer service. I mean, it, it was endless. The amount of added man hours that they were doing because they were doing this want this manual process and had this massive pricing system that they designed, but it wasn't working to where it needed. One change, static field. Um, so that is kind of how it is. Um, that's the short of it. I was known to read manuals, watch videos, and just watch and plug and play and learn the system. Ma mastering, my number one thing is mastering the flow of data and how the processes work in companies. The benefit of that was profitability. I was able, being in the accounting for a little while, for five and a half years, and at that point, at that one job, I was able to see that data flow. I worked hand in hand with the IT guy that wrote the SQL coding and was behind the scenes. And I learned a, a lot of information. I have a pictographic memory. So that's how I was able to stand behind him and see things and catch things and fix the templates and prevent the data from, you know, get the data going back and forth from pricing to fuel costs to everything. So it was great. I was, I loved it. I loved being able to solve the problems. And then the end result was making, making them money. So those were my methods to the madness. Now, one of the things I've learned, I've got three, it's literally 35 years and I figured out three strategies. You have an ERP system, right? That's the system you may use. How many companies are using multiple? Some are importing, exporting. I know at the, the textile company, we imported, exported out of three different systems. We used Oracle, and we had Joe Mar, and then they had another system. So they were using bigger companies to use multiple systems. Of course, riskier, right, than using one system. So this is what you do. Some people want to put a hammer to their computer, but that's what you look at every day for all of your data. Now, what's ERP? You know, as Janet was talking about earlier, companies, what ERP system? Are they actually using the correct ERP system? You wouldn't believe how many companies are not using the right ERP system. But I will tell you one thing I learned. Accounting has no say. It doesn't matter. It's all about operations and sales and marketing. When the company is looking at an ERP system, accounting is the least thing they care about. So a lot of times what happens with the accounting team and why Janet says we work 70, 70 hours a week minimum and develop ulcers is because we have to learn to work around everybody else's processes because they don't think about what we have to deal with, with their side. So it is frustrating. It's the norm though. This is why we were, this is why accounting people work so many hours because we have to design processes around each company's mod, you know, module systems and how they're doing things. The bigger the company gets, the harder it is to harness and it gets really complicated. So not about that boring stuff, but day-to-day -day processes, believe it or not, day-to-day -day processes are something that companies don't think of. How many times have you gone into a job and you've, they don't have how-to notes, you know, what they call them how-to notes, standard operating procedures, playbook guidelines, that kind of stuff. Every company labels them differently. I call them SOPs, standard operating procedures. And they're not updated. You go to sit down and train, no updated notes. I haven't been in one company that I've ever worked with in 35 years that had them. Well, guess who was the one that always started them <laughs> and kept them updated? Me. So mm -hmm. I always cross-trained in every job I was in because I always want to make sure that that job was covered and everybody was cross-trained. So the headache didn't have to happen if they were on vacation or things of that nature. So I learned to build SOPs as early as that memory typewriter. And because of that memory typewriter, I'm one of the first ones that got the um, computer in the company and was building their email templates. That's computer, y'all. Who's aging? Who's aging? <laughs> That's what it was. I was the I was the bomb. I was one of the ones that had a computer. I was so excited. I was oh boy, that was bad. It, I just remember how happy I was. And then the other thing too, a lot of people are still using handwritten notes all over the place, which is fine. But good luck on reading the chicken scratch. I can't tell you how many times I've had to deal with that, trying to understand somebody's writing. 
that was tough. Um, in, in accounting, not a good thing to have handwriting because sometimes sevens look like ones or fours, eights look like sixes, then you got the zeros, not good to, to do that. Manual processes were are another problem in, in history. You know, people, once you roll into an electronic system and everything is working, you've got people, you know, like me or IT people in IT department, but you have those people that cannot get rid of that manual process. So then they're doubling their work. They're still doing it through the system and then they're doing the manual because they have to have that paper and touch that paper. I get it, but that's also causing more work on you. So day-to-day -day processes and then the right people, the tribe, AKA employees. I always say it takes a village. No good leader is a good leader without a good tribe. And that is true. Uh, it works both ways. I couldn't be the best leader that they tell me I am if I didn't have the best tribe. You hire the best people to do the job and you should never work with a company that micromanages. If so, that's a leader problem, but I'll end there. Um, my known phrase is, phrase is, of course, it takes a village. That statement cannot be further from the truth. Right people in the right seats do matter. There is a coin. I will live for this. Uh, I heard this guy. I think he's a doctor, Dr. W. Edwards Deming. He said the greatest quality and system guru. He was the greatest. Well, he's He was the system. I wonder if he's still alive, but he was a guru in systems and processes. And he states 94% of the results we experience in the workplace are your systems and processes, the poor function. And it's not always the people. You wouldn't believe how many companies think it's the people, but you dig into their processes and it's their processes that are making people work crazy hours, long things because they haven't updated their processes or they're not utilizing the systems correctly. So that's my 35 year career in that. And that is a lot of the reasons Every company, every person I've ever walked into, that is what they're doing. So how, which one is more important in maintaining cash flow? All three. You can have the best ERP system and the best day-to-day -day processes in place, but if you don't have the right people in the seat to manage them both effectively, your profitability is going to suffer. Same thing, you can have the best tribe in the seats, the best employees, but if you don't have anyone monitoring your ERP systems and your processes for accuracy, you're going to lose, lose profitability. I know it's tough. It's one of the things in all companies that they get so big, they just cannot harness that level anymore. And then you have a company that goes from smaller to midsize, and they don't have that 13 people they need to harness this. And a lot of times they start struggling with cash flow because of all the processes that have to be done. They don't have the manpower or the money to be able to hire that person that does all of this. That's what I do. One person, 13 positions. I say a lot of what I am is because I learned. I learned everything that I could possibly learn. I don't like accounting but I like making money. I like watching system processes work. And I love to be able to fix a problem, see the problem and troubleshoot. And this is true. And Jenna can agree. 61% of small businesses struggle with harnessing cash flow. It's just you never feel like you're alone. Never. Sometimes I wonder, you know, it's the bit hardest thing for somebody to admit I'm having cash flow problems and I don't know why. Well, it goes back to like Matina said, I actually believe it's got the same stigma as depression and any mental illness. If you can't admit that there's something wrong and don't ever, it's not anything you're doing wrong. You've got to focus on the customer service, product delivery and getting the clients and things. That's your primary job. That's what you're doing as you're building your legacy business. That's stuff that you're having to do on the back end and learn the ERP system and follow up with the accounting side of it and make sure everything's flowing correctly. You're not just pushing a button. That's something you don't have time to do. And a lot of times the, the people that are doing the job don't know what to look for. Even if they're making errors or the transactions are, are wrong, they don't know that. And then all of a sudden you got good revenue because you may have increased prices, but you don't don't have the profit, and you're like, what happened? What's going on? So those are some those are some of the things. 20 percent never feel. I mean, cash flow can be harnessed, like Janet and I said. For us, it's second nature, but for others, it's not. They that's the worst thing. They don't even want to talk about it. Like I said, f that. 
F that people don't even want to talk about financials, let alone have to dig into it and figure it out. So that is the reason I am doing what I'm doing as a business, because I can make a difference. I can make a huge impact on a company's wealth, health, and reduce the stress, affect all five areas of that circle, because that's important for me. One of the things in my property management career, I was told, you will never have a work-life balance. This team will never have that in this field. It was like a trauma center. Just imagine a trauma center. And that's how it was. You never knew what was going to happen. Something was always going on with the resident, tenant. We were going to court. Something was always going on. With my processes in place, they all had work-life balance within a year and a half. Every single one of them, I was told it could never happen. And it did. And I had the best team I could possibly ever ask for. It was just the wrong industry for me. And that's the reason I decided to leave and do this on my own, because I figure if I can continue to keep doing this for each company I've ever worked for, imagine what I can do in the masses and help others with the things that are second nature for me, because you may have value that's I need. And I'm always va valued for that. Like I like working with Ali. It's going to be an amazing partnership because once I'm able to harness and get some cash flow in one, that's reducing anxiety, stress. People aren't going to be because one of the things is, is profitability. When people are afraid that the company's not profiting and that rumor mill goes very quick, like wildfire, people are already looking for jobs. The turnover is going to increase and it's just going to be insane. That's another cash flow problem. That's an expense that's going to be really expensive for a company if they have to deal with turnover on top of everything else. So 20% of them of small businesses fail within the first year and 50% of them survive past the fifth, fifth. So then you get into the mid-sized corporations and where I say is they start losing connection because now you've got a lot more employees, you've got a lot more mindsets, you've got more systems in place and that's where things kind of get crazy. And I do want to share this for mostly the small business part. Part One of the things I do, I do three strategies. But a friend of mine who's an auditor, and I said I would mention this, she said, do you know that 60% of the general population think it's okay to steal? Now, again, this comes from an auditor mind, right? <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, God, that's a high number. <laughs> I'm like, are you saying? Yes, of course, she's serious. She knows. And 22% of people will steal from their employer because they think, well, I didn't get a high enough raise. I didn't get a bonus this year. If you show any type, especially in the small business world, not once you get in the bigger business world, but when you're a small business and you're working your tail off and you start seeing some profitability and you're getting excited, right, Janet? You're getting excited. Now you got somebody that might be stealing from you. That's the last thing I look at. I evaluate every single thing before I even consider something like that. But that does have to be considered because it happens. Know your financial language. Just like Janet said, it's, an, it's not as hard as you think it is. Learn what it is. Learn what reports to look at. And just be knowledgeable. Because there's I've seen it happen more with friends and family running the books, stealing than people you hire in general. So I just, that's a very small part, but I just want to let you know, sometimes that is the reason why some people are not profitable. Know your financials. So how does that last statistic matter? It's because of this. Your systems plus your processes without the right employees or less profit. Your system minus the process, proper processes, but the great employees, less profit less profit system with the processes and the employee, that's your maximizing your profit. I've proven it over and over and over again. No matter what company I work for, no matter what person I work for, I've done it personally and professionally. And this is exactly the three strategies. Pro as I said, profit issues scare the tribe. You'll have turnover issues. That is going to kill a company, especially if they're already struggling with cash flow. So when system and processes aren't traceable, you have lost profit and or theft. Not always. I just say be knowledgeable. My first three strategies are always cash flow injection. Get me the money, honey. 
get me the money. And before you even think about touching that money, once I get it in and get you all fixed up and cleaned up and bandaged up and everything, and you're starting to celebrate and we're popping the cork. Now, we have to bring in a financial planner. We got to bring in Ali. You got to get some structure. We've got a strategy number two that I use, and we look at all your expenses. We requote everything. We look to see how long has it been since you updated your health insurance cost. When's the last time you got a quote on the auto insurance? When's the last time you looked at your workers' comp, your general liability? How much did you budget for advertising and marketing expenses? How bad do your signs look? I can go on and on and on. Your strategy, too, is the most important thing because then we want to reduce the excess that's possibly being trapped into that revenue area. And then we get your cash flow in, we look at your expenses. And then what I do in strategy three is once I get you healthy and you're doing wonderful and we're popping the, and we are popping the cork by that time, I want to monitor you throughout the year and just make sure everything is being put in its place where it needs to be. Your tax strategies, as Janet was saying, I can't get you out of full taxes, but I want to try to reduce you from Uncle Sam as much as I can, right? The more money you make, the more they take. Well, there's things tax strategies. You want to look at those. Maximize your tax strategies. One of the number one problems that companies do, and mainly when you go from a small business to a mid-sized business, one of the things that's being done is you are rushing, rushing, rushing so much. You get to the end of the year. You don't even have the energy. It's Christmas time, right? Thanksgiving, Christmas time. You're already brain dead. You don't want to deal with the receipts and all this other stuff. So you wing it, you mess stuff up, you put things in the wrong spot. Um, you put things in the wrong spot and here you are paying Uncle Sam three times more money in taxes because you didn't have anybody monitoring you throughout the year. So as I said, this is my what my processes are, cash flow injection, quoting, and st staying on top of your transactions. So my point is, Who's ready to stop the leaks, plan a vacation, and add value to your hard work? Because that's what it matters. When you get to be so successful and you are enjoying popping that cork, y'all, and holding it down and becoming the legacy business that you envision for yourself, remember, there are people like me that are out here that can do that level of work and get you to a point that you need to be to be the legacy. You don't need to hire 13, 15, 20 people. You just need to find the right people. And sometimes those right people are in one body. Sometimes they're in a few bodies. But I just wanted to share with you, my years of experience is I don't like accounting, but I love system processes, getting the right employees in the right seat and watching you profit. There is no greater feeling for me than for you. And that's exactly what I do. So I do offer a 30-minute consultation. Basically, it's just a discovery call for mid-sized to larger companies to gander at what they're dealing with and their problems that they're, they're facing for profitability. And then we go from there. I do work with smaller businesses as well. Janet and I are going to partner with a lot of that um, with getting smaller businesses on point. And what they do, and Janet is an, not only is she an amazing expert in accounting as well, she does phenomenal training courses and she teaches the simplicities. And that's exactly why I adore her. Because we don't work to make it complicated. We make it fun. We make it entertaining because the worst thing someone wants to do is talk about finances. I know. But we want to make it fun for you, make it easier for you to understand. And the golden rule is profitability. Once you're profitable, Man, so many doors will open for things that you can do in reference to investment planning. I've got all kinds of people in my pocket to bring on for you. I'm not going to just leave you there stranded. I'm I have a lot of good resource because we want to harness and keep you profitable and keep you going for the rest of your legacy business and watch you grow. I will end with one story right now. I have a client, worked with him in the corporate world for two and a half years. I said to him, George, and he said, I can say his name because he's going to give me a video test. He said, I deserve the video, not the written. <laughs> he, I said, George, when I ever, if I ever take this, if I ever start my own business, you're going to be my first client. 
He goes, I hope so. I hope you can do for me what you did for, for your other, other companies in corporate. I said, oh, definitely. I see great things for you. He said, well, I'm glad. I said, yeah, because we need to work on getting those two little girls into college, pay for their college tuition. So I started with George mid-September, analyzed everything, started bringing in the money, harnessing his collections, hired in a legal assistant, trained him, got him started. And then we got, we had to do a lot of uh, different things, got started, kept, kept, kept collecting the money, working on streamlining processes, we're starting to automate using more modules. He had an ERP system. He wasn't even using hardly any of it. He is doing so much manual work. I don't know how he ran that business all these years on his own. Now we're getting ready to automate him. And we were bringing in a second person as of Monday. And I've already projected he's going to three times his money in just three and a half months. I know by the end of this year, he's going to triple his, his revenue. Only took three and a half months to make that happen. Small changes make a big difference. Hire the people that are knowledgeable that can make it happen as fast as possible because it can, it can happen. It's just small little things. So just want to share, it's a great story. Um, I love to see, I'm, I'm so excited to see him grow. He just massively went into this, uh, updated all his social media, his website, everything, the whole whole thing has been redone. And I am just so happy to see him prosper. So I want more clients like him to have the, to get them to the legacy business because that's what matters. Thank you guys. Hope you enjoyed. And I got to give you my calendar. That would be right. That would be good, right? Let me end, stop my sharing. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> F that. <laughs> Financials, I mean, financials. Let me stop my sharing so I can share my, let me close my caption here. Did it stop sharing? Yes, it did. Okay. So I have several different ones, but I will share, um, you know, you can go on my Calendly. This is more for mid-size to bigger business. Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> Ali, I do. Did it go in there? Did my Calendly go in there? Let me see. No, it did. I do. I it's know. there. It's okay. there. I do need an F that. Well, it's got. Yeah, it's got to be E F F with three Fs. That and then I got to put the statement about. Um, I meant uh, not that F word. Financials. Because there is. <laughs> it's not copywritten, but there is a um a Spotify station that uses F that, but they have two Fs. So <laughs> I do need that, Ali. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Do you have any questions for me, please? Lisa does. I have the quickest question because I'm not in corporate. Just to close the loop, what is an ERP? It's an elect. It's the electronic reporting processing system that you use. It could be QuickBooks. It could be any system that you electronic system you're using to reporting data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It could also be the CRM. It could be anything that kind of connects everything together. It could be one talking to the other. There's the Marge. She's coming in. We have Tamar joining joining us. Mental note, Tina. Toss that at the beginning of it. <laughs> the explanation. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yes, I do need to note that is ERP. I know a lot of people use it. It's been around a long time. I actually, when I heard it, I didn't even know what it was. I was like, what is that? Here's me. I'm like, that's just a system. But I love Janet's explanation of the system. That is like perfect. Perfect, perfect explanation on that. I got to come up with the term on ERP, maybe a funny terminology. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, every one of you that uh, joined today. I am so happy that everybody was able to be here. And I'm looking forward to the recording and replay and the feedback that we get from those that get this replay. And I value every one of you and your expertise and what you do to make a difference. Yes. Got a question. You know, I, I really didn't know what you did, Tina. And so after watching this, I had this friend who actually um, he has a, a small business. Uh, what is it? The machine shop thing, right? And he was like pulling his hair out at the end of last year because he couldn't get his uh, CPA slash uh, attorney to like process his numbers and give him his tax um 
you know, help him figure out his taxes, right? And I'm thinking, oh my God, he needs you because it's his first year of business. It isn't his first year of doing this, but he, he built, he slid off and has his own company off of, his, of uh, uh, now. So anyway, I'm thinking, oh my God, I need to refer him to you because I think by being able to talk to you and probably Janet both to get him set up and get his QuickBooks set up accurately, get up his, get his systems in place because he's, he's freaking smart. It's just that he is not smart in that Hey. And so I think that you would be the ideal person. I just texted him like, hey, did you figure it out yet? <laughs> well, the other thing, too, the first thing that comes to mind is you need a difference. He needs a different CPA, too. Um, yeah. And I will tell you, a lot of the problems are they get so overwhelmed. They wing it. CPAs are not going to spend all those hours answering your 50 questions by the time you're at year end. And they will tell you over and over and over again, you need somebody that's knowledgeable that needs to be monitoring your books throughout the year because I cannot do that. That's they what they told him they were going to do for him. That's what they told him they would do for him. Monitor his so, book. But, yes. And so by September, he's asking them what's going on, what's going on, what's going on. Yeah. No, that's what they promised him. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I know. Sorry. No, that is tough. And now he's scrambling, trying to figure it all out. Well, yeah, well, that's too late. And, you know, it's like he scrambled the best he could, but at least in his second year, he could do a whole lot better. Yes. And sometimes, and, and, you know, here's my thought process, get it filed or delay it. You can, you can actually do an extension and then have someone reevaluate the 2023 because, or you can amend your return. You can amend the return. Back like two years. Yeah. The main thing is you don't want to be paying in thousands, mm -hmm. thousands of dollars and then wait to amend a return. Just try to do the extension. If you think there's somebody else that can evaluate the books and get him on a with a better CPA. And then that way he can then file when it's appropriate and not have to worry about the amendment and then get 2024 off the right off the right path. You got a sick you can tell on you. <laughs> Sorry, Gaby. I said you got a sick Tina on him. <laughs> You're right, Gaby. <laughs> She's coming to the rescue with her super gay man cape. That's right. <laughs> there it is. Exactly. I uh I I love superheroes. I am the biggest geeky superhero person. Um yeah. So I find people to go to the movies with me just to watch the superhero movies, but I actually started doing it myself and going all by myself because I don't have many people that they're like, that is so geeky. How old are you? <laughs> I love you and Ali turning up in Superman costumes. Yes. Yeah. I think that that gives us the right superpower to do what we both do and love what we both do and why we're here. So, and Laura too, with her little superhero glasses you know it's crazy how it all it all works out so I look forward to it the good thing is Ali and I are on the same same time zone and we aren't too too far from each other so it'll really value with any company that we're working with so definitely please feel free to share my calendar link with any company you may know one of the indicators you're going to know, no one's going to come up and go, hey, I got cash flow problems, man. This is driving me freaking crazy. Now, only if you know them really well. How you're going to know is they start having high turnover. They start laying off. They start cutting back. They take the water. They start cutting back the expenses that the employees love so much. Man, they took the thing. They took out our weekly allowance for our snacks in the break room. Those are things you're going to know when a company starts cutting back. They, there will be indicators if you're working, if you hear or work with anyone. I know, depending on who you are, but that's one of the other things, too, is I am certified in trust accounting. So I work with attorneys and I work with real estate property management companies and brokers and things like that. Now, that type of accounting is a whole different world, which is why I'm certified in that. I am going to NARPM. NARPM is the National Association for Real Estate Property Management. They are having the conference this year, the annual conference on the 28th and 29th of February. I am excited to be there. I will be there with my friend and my former boss, and it'll be really nice. Um, I designed a program module for the eviction management process. Again, here I am. I designed it this time. I'm not giving it away. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not giving it away. I am actually having it. It's actually been working in the company that I used to work for. The pilot part of it has worked for over two years. And now I want to put it in a core process and put it in their module system. Um, Property Wear is who I will be pitching that to. And I know that will make a massive difference to that software company in their management system because not many property management companies use the eviction module. Most of them just hire attorneys, but the attorneys don't have the best systems either. So there's a lot of broken links of communication. This will do. And the goal is for me to get it as as an import export into like Clio, for example, which is an eviction management um, that attorneys use it for eviction management. And then it'll notify the update the owners if there's any issues. Now, there's a lot of things I did in my processes, but putting it all in one system flow will make a world of difference and then automate everything. So that is in a small little nutshell of what I have built and I'm looking forward to making a difference in that company's sales and their growth because they do are a really good company. They've been very valuable for me in my career, but they do need a little bit of help. So that's my goal, make a difference. So yeah, let me uh, stop the recording and